Section 42 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills. The Exhumation. The night was fine and bright, with the lustre of a lovely moon. Even the chimneys and gables of the squalid houses of Globetown appeared to bathe their heads in that flood of silver light. The resurrection man and the buffer pursued their way towards the cemetery. For some minutes they preserved a profound silence. At length the buffer exclaimed, "'I only hope, Tony, that this business won't turn out as bad as the job with young Markham three nights ago.' "'Why should it?' demanded the resurrection man in a gruff tone. "'Well, I, I don't know why.' answered the buffer. Perhaps, after all, it was just as well that that fellow escaped as he did. We might have swung for it. <laughs> escape, muttered the resurrection man, grinding his teeth savagely. Yes, he did escape then, <laughs> but I haven't done with him yet. He shall not get off so easy another time. I wonder who those chaps was that come up so sudden, observed the buffer, after a pause. Friends of his, no doubt answered Tidkins. Most likely he suspected a trap, or thought he would be on the right side. But the night was too plaguy dark, and the whole thing was so sudden it was impossible to form an idea of who the two strangers might be. One of them was precious strong, I know, said the buffer. But for my part, I think you'd better leave the young fellow alone in future. It's no good standing the chance of getting scragged for mere vengeance. I can't understand that sort of thing. If you like to crack his crib for him and hive the swag, I'm your man. But I'll have no more of a business that's all danger and no profit. Well, well, as you like, said the resurrection man impatiently. Here we are, so look alive. They were now under the wall of the cemetery. The buffer clambered to the top of the wall, which was not very high and the resurrection man handed him the implements and tools, which he dropped cautiously upon the ground inside the enclosure. He then helped his companion up on the wall, and in another moment they stood together within the cemetery. "'Are you sure you can find the way to the right grave?' demanded the buffer in a whisper. "'Don't be afraid,' was the reply. "'I could go straight up to it blindfold.' Then they shouldered their implements, and the resurrection man led the way to the spot where Mrs. Smith's anonymous lodger had been buried. "'I'm afeard the ground's precious hard,' observed the buffer, when he and his companion had satisfied themselves by a cautious glance around that no one was watching their movements. The eyes of these men had become so habituated to the obscurity of night in consequence of the frequency with which they pursued their avocations during the darkness which cradled others to rest that they were possessed of the visual acuteness generally ascribed to the cat. "'We'll soon turn it up. Let it be as hard as it will,' said the resurrection man in answer to his comrade's remark. Then, suiting the action to the word, he began his operations in the following manner. He measured a distance of five paces from the head of the grave. At the point thus marked he took a long iron rod and drove it in an oblique direction through the ground towards one end of the coffin. So accurate were his calculations relative to the precise spot in which the coffin was embedded in the earth that the iron rod struck against it the very first time he thus sounded the soil. "'All right,' he whispered to the buffer. He then took a spade and began to break up the earth just at that spot where the end of the iron rod peeped out of the ground. "'Not so hard as you thought,' he observed. "'The fact is, the old burial place is so mixed up with human remains that the clay is too greasy to freeze very easy.' "'I suppose that's it,' said the buffer. The resurrection man worked for about ten minutes with a skill and an effort that would have astonished even Jones the gravedigger himself had he been there to see. He then resigned the spade to the buffer, who took his turn with equal ardour and ability. When his ten minutes elapsed, the resurrectionists regaled themselves each with a dram from Tidkins' flask, and this individual then applied himself once more to the work in hand. When he was wearied, the buffer relieved him, and thus did they fairly divide the toil until the excavation of the ground was completed. 
This portion of the task was finished in about forty minutes. An oblique channel about ten feet long and three feet square at the mouth, and decreasing only in length as it verged towards the head of the coffin at the bottom, was formed. The resurrection man provided himself with a stout chisel, the handle of which was covered with leather, and with a mallet, the ends of which were also protected with pieces of the same material. Thus the former instrument, when struck by the latter, emitted but little noise. He then descended into the channel, which terminated at the very head of the coffin. Breaking away the soil that lay upon that end of the coffin, he inserted the chisel into the joints of the wood, and in a very few moments knocked off the board that closed the coffin in that extremity. The woodwork at the head of the shell was also removed with ease, for Banks had purposely nailed those parts of the two cases very slightly together. The resurrection man next handed up the tools to his accomplice, who threw him down a strong cord. The end of this rope was then fastened under the armpits of the corpse as it lay in its coffin. This being done, the buffer helped the resurrection man out of the hole. "'So far, so good,' said Tidkins. "'It must be close upon one o'clock. "'We have got a quarter of an hour left, "'and it's plenty of time to do all that's yet to be done.' "'The two men then took the rope between them "'and drew the corpse gently out of its coffin "'up the slope of the channel "'and landed it safely on the ground "'at a little distance from the mouth of the excavation. The moon fell upon the pale features of the dead, those features which were still as unchanged, save in colour, as if they had never come into contact with the shroud, nor belonged to a body that had been swathed in a winding-sheet. The contrast formed by the white figure and the black soil on which it was stretched would have struck terror to the heart of any one, save a resurrectionist. Indeed, the moment the corpse was thus dragged from its grave, the resurrection man thrust his hand into its breast and felt for the gold. It was there, wrapped up as the undertaker had described. "'The blunt is all safe, Jack,' said the resurrection man, and he secured the coin about his person. They then applied themselves vigorously to shovel back the earth. But when they had filled up the excavation, a considerable quantity of the soil still remained to dispose of it being impossible, in spite of stamping down, to condense the earth into the same space from which it was originally taken. They therefore filled two sacks with the surplus soil, and proceeded to empty them in different parts of the ground. Their task was so far accomplished, when they heard the low rumble of wheels in the lane outside the cemetery. To bundle the corpse neck and heels into a sack, and gather up their implements, was the work of only a few moments. They then conveyed their burden between them to the wall overlooking the lane, where the well-known voice of Mr. Banks greeted their ears as he stood upright in his cart, peering over the barrier into the cemetery. "'Gold the blessed defunct,' said the undertaker interrogatively. "'Right and tight,' answered the buffer. "'And a tin, too. Now then, look sharp, here's the tools.' "'I've got em, returned Banks." "'Look out for the stiffen, then,' added the buffer, and, aided by the resurrection man, he shoved the body up to the undertaker, who deposited it in the bottom of his cart. The resurrection man and the buffer then mounted the wall and got into the vehicle, in which they laid themselves down, so that any person whom they might meet in the streets through which they were to pass would only see one individual in the cart, namely the driver. Otherwise, the appearance of three men at that time of night— or rather at that hour in the morning, might have excited suspicion. Banks lashed the sides of his horse, and the animal started off at a round pace. Not a word was spoken during the short drive to the surgeon's residence in the Cambridge Road. When they reached his house, the road was quiet and deserted. A light glimmered through the fanlight over the door, and the door itself was opened the moment the cart stopped. The resurrection man and the buffer sprang up, and seeing that the coast was clear, bundled the corpse out of the vehicle in an instant. Then, in less than half a minute, the blessed defunct, as the undertaker called it, was safely lodged in the passage of the surgeon's house. Mr. Banks, as soon as the body was removed from his vehicle, drove rapidly away. His portion of the night's work was done, and he knew that his accomplices would give him his regulars when they should meet again. 
the resurrection man and the buffer conveyed the body into a species of outhouse, which the surgeon, who was passionately attached to anatomical studies, devoted to purposes of dissection and physiological experiment. In the middle of this room, which was about ten feet long and six broad, stood a strong deal table, forming a slightly inclined plane. The stone pavement of the outhouse was perforated with holes in the immediate vicinity of the table, so that the fluid which poured from subjects for dissection might escape into a drain communicating with the common sewer. To the ceiling, immediately above the head of the table, was attached a pulley with a strong cord, by means of which a body might be supported in any position that was most convenient to the anatomist. The resurrection man and his companion carried the corpse into this dissecting room and placed it upon the table, the surgeon holding a candle to light their movements. "'Now, Jack,' said Tidkins to the buffer, "'do you take the stiffen out of the sink and lay him along decently on the table, ready for business, while I retire a moment to this gentleman's study and settle accounts with him?' "'Well and good,' returned the buffer. "'I'll stay here till you come back.' The surgeon lighted another candle, which he placed on the window-sill, and then withdrew, accompanied by the resurrection man. The buffer shut the door of a dissecting room, because the draught caused the candle to flicker and menaced the light with extinction. He then proceeded to obey the directions which he had received from his accomplice. The buffer removed the sack from the body, which he then stretched out at length upon the inclined table, taking care to place its head on the higher extremity and immediately beneath the pulley. "'There, old fella," he said, "'you're comfortable at any rate. What a blessing it would be to your friends, if they was ever to find out that you'd been had up again, to know into what skilful hands you'd happen to fall.' Thus musing, the buffer turned his back listlessly towards the corpse and leant against the table on which it was lying. "'Let me see,' he said to himself. "'There's thirty-one pounds that was buried along with him, and then there's ten pounds that the sawbones is paying now to Tony for the match. That makes forty-one pounds, and there's three to go shares. What does that make?' Threes into four goes one, threes into eleven goes three and two over. That's thirteen pounds apiece and two pounds to split. The buffer started abruptly round and became deadly pale. He thought he heard a slight movement of the corpse and his whole frame trembled. Almost at the same moment some object was hurled violently against the window. The glass was shivered to atoms, the candle was thrown down and extinguished, and total darkness reigned in the dissecting room. Hello, cried the buffer, turning sick at heart. What's that? Scarcely had these words escaped his lips when he felt his hand suddenly grasped by the cold fingers of the corpse. Oh, God, cried the miscreant, and he fell insensible across the body on the table. End of section 42。section 43 of the mysteries of London。volume 1 part 2。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by dave wills。the stockbroker part 1 。upon a glass door leading into offices on the ground floor in tokenhouse yard were the words james tomlinson stockbroker it was about eleven o'clock in the morning a clerk was busily employed in writing at a desk in the front office the walls of this room were covered with placards bills and prospectuses all announcing the most gigantic enterprises, and whose principal features were large figures expressing millions of money. These prospectuses were of various kinds. Some merely put forth schemes by which enormous profits were to be realised, but which had not yet arrived to that state of maturity, the point at which the popular gullibility has been laid hold of, when directors, secretaries and treasurers can be announced in a flaming list. Others denoted that the projectors had triumphed over the little difficulty of obtaining good names to form a board. 
and the upper part of this class of prospectuses was embellished with a perfect array of MPs, aldermen, and esquires. The prospectuses, one and all, set forth with George Robin's flourishes and poetico-hyperbolic flowers of rhetoric, the unparalleled and outstanding advantages to be reaped from the enterprises respectfully submitted to public consideration and to the moneyed world especially. The face of the globe was a complete paradise, according to these announcements. The interior of Africa was represented to be a perfect mine of gold by the projectors of a company to trade to those salubrious parts. The cannibals of the South Sea Islands became intelligent and interesting beings in the language of another association of speculators. The majestic scenery of the North Pole and the phenomena of the Aurora Borealis were held out by a colonizing company as inducements to families to emigrate to Spitsbergen. The originators of a scheme for forming railways in Egypt expatiated upon the delights of travelling at the rate of sixty miles an hour through a land famous for its antiquarian remains and along the banks of a river where the young alligators might be seen to be disporting in the sun and numerous other prospectuses of majestic enterprises developed their original principles and prospective benefits to the astounded reader. One would have imagined that any individual with a five-pound note in his pocket had only just to step into Mr. Tomlinson's office, take five shares in as many enterprises, pay one pound deposit upon each, and walk out again a man of vast wealth. Mr. Tomlinson himself was seated in a decently furnished room which constituted the private office. He was looking well, but somewhat careworn, and not quite so comfortable as a man who had passed through the bankruptcy court, got his certificate, and was in business once more, might be expected to look. In a word, he had a hard struggle to make his way respectably, and was compelled to meddle in many things that shocked his somewhat sensitive disposition. A short, well-dressed, good-humoured man with a small, quick eye was sitting on one side of the fire, conversing with the stockbroker. "'Well, Mr. Tomlinson,' he said, "'on those conditions I will lend my name to the Irish Railway Company proposed. But, remember, I require fifty shares, and I am not to pay a farthing for them.' "'Oh, of course!' cried Tomlinson. That is precisely the proposal I was instructed to make to you. The fact is, between you and me, the projectors are all men of straw. One came out of Whitecross Street Prison a few weeks ago, and another had been a bankrupt twice, and insolvent seven times, and so they must raise heaven and earth to get good names. "'Tis their only plan, their only plan,' answered the gentleman. "'And I flatter myself,' he added, drawing himself up, "'that the countenance of Mr. Sheriff Popkins is not to be sneezed at.' Oh, "'On the contrary, my dear Mr. Popkins,' said Tomlinson, "'your name will soon bring a host of others.' "'I should think so, Mr. Tomlinson, I should think so,' was the self-sufficient reply. "'Well, then, Mr. Popkins, shall I make an appointment for you to meet Messrs. Bubble and Jews tomorrow morning at my office?' "'If you please, my dear sir. And now I wish you to do a little matter for me. The fact is, now I have been fool enough to take thirty shares in a certain railway company, and I have been elected a director. The company is in the most flourishing condition, and so I mean to make them purchase my shares off me.' You will accordingly have the kindness to let it be known, on change, that you have my shares to sell, but you must mind and not part with them. The thing will get to the company's ears, and they will be terribly alarmed at the prospect of the injury which may be done to the enterprise by a director offering his shares for sale. They will then send and negotiate with you privately, and you can make a good bargain with them. "'I understand,' said Tomlinson. "'I shall only breathe a whisper about the shares being offered for sale in a quarter "'where I know the rumour will immediately fly to the directors of the company.' "'Good,' observed Mr. Sheriff Popkins. 
Here is the script. You can tell me what you have done when I call tomorrow morning to meet Messrs. Bubble and Chews. The worthy sheriff then withdrew, and Mr. Alderman Sniff was announced. Mr. Tomlinson, said this gentleman, I wish you to do your best for a new joint stock company which I have just founded. This is the prospectus. The stockbroker glanced over it and said, in a musing manner, Ah, very good indeed. Excellent British Marble Company. <laughs> Famous idea. Capital two hundred thousand pounds in ten thousand shares of twenty pounds each. <laughs> good again. Deposit one pound per share. Oh, that'll do. Then comes the board of directors. All good names. Uh, I see... You have made yourself managing director. Well, that's quite fair. Uh, then again, auditor, Mr. Alderman Sniff. Treasurer, Mr. Alderman Sniff. Secretary, Mr. Alderman Sniff. Oh, but who sells the quarry to the company? Oh, I see, Mr. Alderman Sniff. Well, what do you think of it? demanded the alderman. Uh, you ask me candidly, my dear sir. I wish you to do so. Then I am of opinion that you have given yourself too many situations, continued Tomlins. In the first place, you found the company, and you make yourself managing director. Well and good. But then you also sell the quarry to the company. Now, as managing director, you have to award yourself a sum for that quarry. As treasurer, you pay yourself. As secretary, you draw up the agreements. And as auditor, you confirm your own accounts. Perfectly correct, Mr. Tomlinson. Is it not a rule that joint stock companies are never to benefit anyone save the founder? Oh, no one denies that, answered the stockbroker. What I am afraid of is that the public will not bite when they see one man occupying so many situations in the company. Nonsense, my dear fellow. The name of an alderman will carry everything before it. Does not the world believe that the aldermen of the City of London are all as rich as Croesus? <laughs> Whereas, between you and me, returned Tomlinson with a sly laugh, there is scarcely one of them who has got a penny if his affairs came to be wound up. <laughs> uh, and yet we live gloriously, <laughs> chuckled Mr. Alderman Sniff. But to return to my business, what can you do for me? "'I can certainly recommend the enterprise,' answered Tomlinson. "'But where can the marble be seen?' "'At my office,' said the alderman. "'I went and bought the finest piece that was ever imported from Italy, "'and there it is in my counting-house, "'labelled British marble in letters at least half a foot high.' Uh, "'Where is the quarry situated?' inquired Tomlinson. Uh, "'I haven't quite made up my mind about that yet.' was the answer given by Mr. Alderman Sniff. The truth is, uh, I am going down into Wales this week, and I shall buy the first field I can get cheap in some rude part of the country. That is the least difficulty in the whole enterprise. Your plans are admirable, my dear sir, exclaimed Tomlinson, and I will do all I can for you. Will you take a glass of wine and a biscuit? No, I thank you. Not now, said the Alderman. I have promised a colleague to sit for him today at Guildhall Police Court. Last week I was on the rotor for attendance there, and I reminded a man who was brought up on a charge of obtaining the three and sixpence under false pretenses. Indeed, ejaculated Tomlinson, whose eyes were fixed upon the two hundred thousand pounds in the alderman's prospectus. Yes continued Mr. Sniff, and I am going to sit today because that fellow comes up again. I mean to clear the city of all such rogues and vagabonds. I shall give him a taste of the treadmill for two months. So, good morning. By the by, call as you pass my office and have a look at the marble. And mind, he added, sinking his voice, you don't let out that it came from Italy. It is pure Welsh marble, remember? <laughs> Alderman Sniff chuckled at this pleasant idea and then hastened to Guildhall, where he fully justified his character of being the most severe magistrate in the City of London. A few minutes after Mr. Alderman Sniff had taken his departure, Mr. Greenwood was announced. 
My dear Tomlinson, I'm delighted to see you, said the capitalist. Really, as an age, a week at least since I saw you, how do matters get on? I have prospects of doing an excellent business, answered Tomlinson. The numberless bubble companies that are started every day are the making of us stockbrokers. Uh, we dispose of shares or effect transfers and obtain our commission. Let the result be what it may be to the purchasers. And I hope that you have conquered those ridiculous qualms of conscience which always made a coward of you when you were in Lombard Street, said Greenwood. Needs must when the devil drives, observed Tomlinson dryly. For my part, continued Greenwood, I take advantage of this mania on the part of the English for speculation in joint stock companies and railway shares. A day of reaction will come, and the effects will be fearful. Thousands and thousands of families will be involved in irretrievable ruin. That day may not occur for one year, two years, five years, or even ten years, but come it will, and the signal for it will be when the House of Commons is inundated with railway and joint stock company business, and when it is compelled to postpone a portion of that business until the ensuing session. Then confidence will receive a shock, an interval for calm meditation will occur, and the result will be awful. Everyone will be anxious to sell shares, and there will be no buyers. Now, mark my words, Tomlinson, if you speculate on your own account, speculate accordingly. I do so. And you are not likely to go wrong, I know, said Tomlinson, but stockbrokers do not risk any money of their own. They have plenty of clients who will do that for them. Then you are really thriving? asked Greenwood. I am earning a living, and my business is increasing. But I feel hanging like a millstone round my neck. The thousand pounds which you lent me at twenty per cent. Yes, only twenty per cent. Oh, only twenty per cent, continued Tomlinson with a sigh. And I am unable to return to you more than one hundred at present, although I agreed to pay you two hundred every four months. Oh, the hundred will do, said Greenwood, and he wrote out a receipt for that amount. Tomlinson handed him over a number of notes which Greenwood counted and then consigned to his pocket. There is plenty of business to be done in the city now, said the capitalist after a pause. I contrive to snatch an hour or two now and then from the time which I am compelled to devote to the enlightened and independent body that returned me to Parliament, and I seldom come into the city on those occasions without lending a few hundreds to some poor devil who has over-bought himself in shares. I have no doubt that you thrive, Greenwood, said the stockbroker. Every man who takes advantage of the miseries of others must get on. Oh, to be sure, to be sure, cried the Member of Parliament. I hope that you will act upon that principle. I have no reason to complain of the business that I am now doing. I act as honestly as I can, and that principle deprives me of many advantageous affairs. Then I experience annoyance from constant reminiscence of that poor old man who so nobly sacrificed himself for me. The eternal cry, ejaculated Greenwood. If you are so very anxious to find him out, put an advertisement in the Times. And if he saw it, he would believe it to be a stratagem of the police to arrest him. You know that there's a warrant out against him. The official assignee took that step. Well, let him take his chance, and if he should happen to be captured, we will petition the Home Secretary to diminish the period for which he will be sentenced to transportation. Not that such a step would benefit him much, because his age— Let us drop the subject, Greenwood, said Tomlinson, evidently affected. With all my heart, I must admit that it moves one's feelings— and, and if I met the old man in the street, I should not hesitate to give him a guinea out of my own pocket. A guinea, cried Tomlinson, and a smile of contempt curled his lips. Perhaps you would recommend me to bestow a five-pound note 
upon that poor Italian nobleman whom you cheated out of his fifteen thousand pounds. Oh, you need not call him a poor nobleman, answered Greenwood. He is now worth ten thousand pounds a year. Indeed, a great change must have taken place then, and his fortunes, exclaimed Tomlinson. Well, the fact, in a few words, is this. A young lady, whom I knew well, said Greenwood, obtained letters of introduction from Count Alteroni to certain friends of his in Montoni, the capital of Castelcicala, to which state she repaired for the benefits of her health, or some such frivolous reason. She had the good fortune to captivate the Grand Duke. Miss Eliza Sidney, you mean? said Tomlinson. The same. Did you know her? Not at all, but I read in the newspapers the account of her marriage with Angelo the Third. Proceed. Well, the moment she married the Grand Duke, a pension of ten thousand a year was granted to Count Alteroni by way of indemnification. I have heard for his estates, which were confiscated after he had fled the country, in consequence of political intrigues. How did you learn all this? My valet, Filippo, happens to be a native of Montoni, and he seems well acquainted with all that passes in Castelcicala. Count Alteroni and his family have returned to the villa which they formerly inhabited at Richmond. I am delighted to hear this good news. You have taken a considerable weight off my mind. The transaction with that nobleman was always the subject of self-reproach. "'I dare say,' observed Mr. Greenwood ironically. Then, drawing his chair closer to Tomlinson's seat, he added, "'You are no doubt the most punctilious and conscientious of all city men. "'I have something to communicate to you, and must do it briefly, "'as I am compelled to return to Spring Gardens "'to meet a deputation from the Rottenborough Agricultural Society "'at one o'clock precisely.' and I never keep such people waiting more than an hour. What is considerate on your part, said the stockbroker. Don't you think it is? Uh, but I did not come here for the sole purpose of chatting. The fact is, a gentleman with whom I am acquainted wants a stockbroker for a very delicate and important business. For a business, added Greenwood, sinking his voice to a whisper, which requires a man who will be content to put five hundred pounds into his pocket for the service that will be required of him, and perform that service blindfold, as it were. "'I will do nothing to compromise my safety,' said Tomlinson. "'No, you will not be required to do so,' answered Greenwood. "'However, the gentleman I allude to will call upon you in the course of the day, I dare say, and he will then explain to you the service he has to demand at your hands.' "'What is the name of your friend?' inquired Tomlinson. Uh, "'Mr. Chichester, Arthur Chichester,' was the reply. "'Chichester, Chichester, eh?' said the stockbroker, musing. "'Surely I have heard you mention that name before.' "'Ah, no, I remember. Did you not complain to me a few days ago that he had been making mischief between you and a certain uh, Sir Rupert Harborough? "'I did,' answered Greenwood. "'And I certainly had good cause for anger against this same Arthur Chichester.' But I had become his confidant and adviser in a certain affair a few weeks before I discovered that he had acquainted Sir Rupert Harborough with circumstances which he had better have kept to himself, and I am therefore compelled to continue my assistance and counsel to him until the affair alluded to be brought to a successful termination. Besides, as Sir Rupert and I have settled our little differences, there is no use in bearing malice, especially when something is to be gained by forbearance. <laughs> I thought you would make that admission, said Tomlinson, laughing. Well, I shall see your friend, and if, with safety, I can earn five hundred pounds, certainly in my position, I cannot afford to lose such an opportunity. That is speaking like a reasonable man, observed Greenwood. Never stick at trifles. What should I be now if I had hesitated at every step I took? 
Should I possess a hundred thousand pounds in good securities? Should I be enabled to gratify every wish, caprice, or desire whose object money can accomplish? Should I be the representative of one of the most independent and intelligent constituencies in England? <laughs> ah, my dear fellow, think of me and my position when you hesitate, and always make money after the well-authorized system. Honestly, if you can, but at all events, make money. With these words, Mr. Greenwood took his departure. Yes, mused Tomlinson when he was alone once more. That man is right. Make money. Honestly, if you can, but at all events, make money. That is the burden of his song. Why should it not be the chorus of mine? When I look around me, I see everyone making money upon the same plan. Sheriff Popkins does not hesitate to lend his name to a bubble, and Alderman Sniff concocts one. <laughs> and they are men of reputation, holding important offices, appearing at court, wielding power and exercising influence. This is indeed a wide field for contemplation. Why, Greenwood, in his bold, dashing manner, gains more in a day than I, in my miserable, droning fashion, earn in a month. To be afraid to touch the gold that is thrown in one's way in this wonderful city is to be a coward, a very coward. Yes, I see it all. Greenwood is right. Make money, honestly, if you can, but at all events, make money. Mr. Thompson's soliloquy had arrived at this very pleasing conclusion just as the door of his office opened, and a clerk entered to acquaint his master that a gentleman of the name of Chichester desired to speak to him. Uh, "'Sure, Mr. Chichester in,' said Tomlinson. Mr. Chichester was dressed in his usually fashionable manner, and his gait had lost nothing of the care-nothing-for-anybody kind of swagger which characterised him when he was first introduced to the reader. Having thrown himself listlessly upon a chair, he said, "'I presume our mutual friend Greenwood has mentioned my name to you, Mr. Tomlinson.' "'He has. I was prepared for your visit.' Oh, "'But not for its object, perhaps,' said Chichester. "'I am as yet ignorant on that head,' was the reply. Uh, "'Mr. Greenwood then told you nothing?' nothing save an intimation that my services were required in a certain delicate and important matter uh, and, and that five hundred pounds would be my remuneration perfectly correct answered mr chichester are you disposed to aid me on the proposed terms i must first learn the nature of the business in which my interference is needed uh, and if you should then decline you, you shall have my solemn assurance that what you confide in me remains buried in my own bosom. That is what I call a proper understanding, exclaimed Chichester. You must know, then, that some three months ago I wooed and won a widow lady, not very ugly, certainly, but whose principal attraction consisted of the sum of sixteen thousand pounds in the three and a half per cents. She was five and twenty years of age, and possessed of her sweet little house in the neighbourhood of the Cambridge Heath Gate. I met her one evening in July or August last at a party at my father's house, when I was doing the amiable to the old gentleman in order to sound his pockets, and my father whispered to me that I ought to make up to Mrs. Higgins. Certainly the name was not very aristocratic, but then her Christian name was Viola, and I thought that Viola Chichester would be pretty enough. I accordingly flirted with the widow on that occasion, and we seemed tolerably pleased with each other. I called next day, and every now and then when I had time, but I really scarcely entertained serious thoughts of making her an offer, until one day when I was desperately hard up, and I saw my friend Habra involved in such difficulties that we could not do any good together. So I got into an omnibus on Bishopsgate Street, went down to Cambridge Heath, called upon Mrs. Higgins, and then and there offered her my heart and hand. She accepted me. We had a pleasant little chat about money matters. 
She stated that her late husband, a wealthy builder, had left her sixteen thousand pounds, and of course I could not make myself out to be a pauper. Besides, she knew that my father was tolerably well off. I assured her that I was possessed of a few thousands, and that the old gentleman allowed me three hundred a year into the bargain. She stipulated that all her own money should be settled upon herself. I demurred to this proposal, but she was obstinate, and I then discovered that Mrs. Viola Higgins had a very determined will and a very positive temper of her own. I thought to myself, here is a charming widow who throws herself into my arms and who possesses a decent fortune. <laughs> it would be madness to neglect so golden an opportunity of enriching myself. Besides, I reasoned, uh, when once we are married, it will be very easy for me to wheedle the affectionate creature out of any money that I may require. Well, I consented to the settlement of all her property upon herself, and in due course we were married. I did not mention the matter to any of my West End friends, because I did not like to invite them to the wedding. I was afraid their off-hand manners would alarm the bride and give her an unfavourable opinion with regard to myself. So the business was kept very snug and quiet, and we passed the honeymoon at my wife's sister and brother-in-law's, very decent people in their way, and dwelling at stratford le -Beau. On our return to London, I thought it time to break the ice in respect to my own pecuniary situation. The truth was that I had not a penny piece of my own, and that my father had long since withdrawn his support, in consequence of the immense drains I had made upon his purse. I was, moreover, encumbered with debts, and some of my tradesmen had found me out, and began to call at the house at Cambridge Heath. They even used menaces. My position was truly critical. I did not marry the widow merely with a view to take her out for a walk, sit by the fireside chatting, or read a book while she worked. I wanted money, money to pay my debts, money to enjoy myself with. Accordingly, I broke the ice by very candidly avowing that I had not a shilling. I, however, swore that her beauty and accomplishments had alone induced me thus to deceive her. But, oh, the vixen! She flew into such a passion that I thought she would tear my eyes out. She raved and wept and wept and raved, and then reproached and taunted, until I wished one of us at the devil, and scarcely cared which went there. The scene ended in Viola's falling into a fit of hysterics, and she was compelled to go to bed. I was most assiduous to her, and my attentions evidently softened her. In a few hours she grew calm, and then said, Arthur, you have deceived me grossly, but I can forgive you. I do not regret the loss of the wealth and income which you led me to believe were yours. I am only sorry that you should have thought it necessary to practice such a measure to induce me to marry you. Well, but let what is past be forgotten. The income derived from my property is sufficient for us, and if you will be kind and good to me, this deception shall never more trouble our happiness. End of section 43, part 1《Section 44 of the Mysteries of London》，《Mysteries London Volume London Volume 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 Volume
I assured her that I could make a better bargain with them myself. She would not believe me. I then declared point-blank that I did not mean to remain tied to her apron-strings, that she must at least settle half the property upon me, that I desired to keep a horse and cab, and introduce my friends to my wife, and that I was resolved that we should live as people of property ought to live. It was then that she showed her inveterate obstinacy and manifested the worst shades of an infamous temper. She agreed to allow me one hundred a year for my clothes and pocket money, but would not give me any control over her property. As for horses, cabs, and West End friends, she ridiculed the idea. I prayed, threatened, and reasoned by turns. She was as immovable as Mount Atlas. Several days were passed in perpetual arguments upon the subject, but the more I prayed and threatened and reasoned, the more obstinate she grew. One morning we had a desperate quarrel. I swore that I would be revenged, that I would extort from her by violence or other means what she refused to yield to argument. Nothing, however, could move her. She said that she would not ruin herself to gratify my extravagances. This was nearly a month ago. I bounced out of the house and hurried up to the west end of the town as fast as I could go to see and consult my friend Sir Rupert Harborough. But as I was on my way thither, for I actually had not even money in my pocket to pay a cab, I accidentally met Greenwood. He saw that I was annoyed and vexed and inquired the reason. I told him all. He reflected for some moments and then said, do not consult Harborough in this matter. He cannot assist you. There is only one course to adopt with such a woman as this. You must put her under restraint. I told him that nothing would please me better, but that I should have all her friends upon me if I threw her into a lunatic asylum, and that I was, moreover, without the means to take a single step. Greenwood and I went into a tavern and discussed the business over a bottle of wine. He then laid down a certain plan, made certain stipulations respecting remuneration for himself, and offered to back me in carrying the matter to the extreme. Of course I assented to all he proposed. The whole affair was managed in such a manner as— As none but Greenwood can manage it, observed Tomlinson. Exactly, returned Chichester. Indeed, he is a thorough man of business. He procured two surgeons to call at separate times at the house of Cambridge Heath, ostensibly to see me. I took care to be at home. They also saw my wife, and the result was that they granted the certificates I required. Certificates of an unsound state of mind, inquired Tomlinson. Certificates of an unsound state of mind, repeated Chichester affirmatively. Greenwood managed it all, keeping himself, however, entirely in the background. He found the surgeons, provided me with money to fee them, and then recommended to me a keeper of a lunatic asylum who is not over-particular. These proceedings occupied two or three days, during which I was on my very best behaviour with my wife, but if ever I hinted to her the propriety of acceding to my wishes in respect to the disposal of her property, she cut me short by the assurance that her decision was irrevocable. I really wished to avoid extreme measures, but with such a disobedient, self-willed, obstinate woman, leniency was an impossibility. Accordingly, I one evening allured her during a walk into the immediate vicinity of the lunatic asylum. The streets were lonely and deserted. It was already dark. The keeper of the madhouse had been prepared for the execution of the project that evening, and he was at his post. As we slowly passed by his house, he sprang forward from some recess or dark nook and fixed a plaster over my wife's mouth. Thus not a cry could escape her lips. At the same moment we seized her and conveyed her into the asylum. That was three weeks ago, inquired Tomlinson. Chichester nodded in assent. And has she not come to her senses yet? She has at length, was the answer. I received a letter yesterday from the keeper of the asylum, stating that her spirit is broken and that she is now ready to obey her husband in all things. 
The keeper wrote to me a few days ago to state that his mode of cure was producing a favourable result, and yesterday he intimated to me by another letter that the mode alluded to had proved completely successful. Uh, "'What course do you now intend to pursue?' demanded Tomlinson, who began to suspect the manner in which his services were to be made available. "'I immediately communicated the important content of the second letter to Greenwood,' continued Chichester, "'and he recommended me to apply to you to aid me in completing the business. "'And my wife now sees her folly, and is willing to devote one half of her property, "'namely eight thousand pounds, to the use and purposes of her lawful husband.' and I am generous enough to be satisfied with that sum, instead of insisting upon having the whole. I understand you, said Tomlinson. You require a stockbroker to effect the transfer of eight thousand pounds from the name of your wife into your own name. And to sell out the amount when so transferred, added Chichester. It will be necessary for me to obtain the signature of your wife to a certain paper, observed Tomlinson. "'Greenwood has told me all this. "'In one word, will you accompany me to the asylum "'where my wife is confined and obtain her signature? "'If she be willing to give it, I am willing to receive it, "'as a matter of business,' answered Tomlinson. "'But are you sure, in a word, "'what guarantee have you that she will not denounce "'the whole proceeding to the officers of justice, "'rally her friends around her, appeal to the law, "'and punish everyone concerned in the business?' Listen, the document which she agrees to sign is a general power on my behalf, over eight thousand pounds in the Bank of England. This power will be dated two months back, a month after our marriage. We must be supposed to have called at your office on a particular day, at that period on which occasion she signed the power in your presence, it being a general power of transfer. "'Would it not seem extraordinary that I did not use it until now, "'that is, two months after it was given? "'This night must she sign the deed. "'Tomorrow you must transfer and sell out the money. "'Then, tomorrow night, she shall be conveyed back to the house at Cambridge Heath. "'The two servants whom we keep are bribed to my interest. "'They are ready, in case of need, to prove the existence of those symptoms of insanity "'which justified the certificates of the surgeons and the restraints under which my wife has been placed. <laughs> "'How, then, can she do us an injury? "'If she proclaim her wrongs, as she may call them, "'you can prove that the power of transfer could not have been extorted from her in a madhouse.' "'as it was signed two months ago in your office. "'Then, if she were to speak of the mode of treatment "'adopted by the keeper of that madhouse "'to curb her haughty spirit, "'the accusation would be indignantly denied, "'and her statements would be set down "'to a disordered imagination "'and would justify further restraint. "'Be you well assured that you will never say or do anything "'that may endanger her liberty again.' "'No, the fact is simply this. "'We divide the property and separate for ever. "'She will be glad to get rid of a husband like me. "'I shall not be sorry to dissolve, as far as we can dissolve it, "'a connection with a woman of her mean, griping and avaricious disposition.' "'Thus is Greenwood's scheme throughout.' said Tomlinson. No other man living could plot such admirable combinations to effect a certain object without danger to any one. Do you consent to act in this matter on consideration of retaining for yourself five hundred pounds of the money which you will have to transfer and sell out tomorrow? I do consent, replied Tomlinson after a few moments' reflection during which he muttered to himself, "'Make money, honestly, if you can, but at all events, make money. "'Tonight at ten o'clock, will you come to me at my house in Cambridge Heath?' inquired Chichester. "'I will,' was the answer. "'But let me ask you one question. "'What excuse have you made to your wife's friends for this absence of three weeks?' "'In the first place,' said Chichester, "'her only relations consist of a sister and this sister's husband at stratford le "'and they are so immersed in the cares of business "'that they have not called once at Gainbridge Heath "'ever since our marriage. 
Secondly, my wife always lived in a very retired manner, and has very few acquaintances or friends besides my father's family. It was therefore easy to satisfy the one or two persons who did call, with the excuse that Mrs. Chichester had gone on a short visit to some relatives in the country, and you feel convinced that your precautions are so wisely taken that she will never open her lips relative to the past, said Tomlinson. I am confident that she will not breathe a word that may lead her to return to the place where she now is, answered Chichester, with a significant look and emphatic solemnity of tone. Then I will not hesitate to serve you in this business, said Tomlinson. Tonight at ten o'clock. Tonight at ten o'clock, repeated Chichester, and with these words he departed. When he was gone, Tomlinson paced his office in an agitated manner. The die is cast. I am now about to plunge into crime, he said. And yet, how could I avoid? How could I long procrastinate the step? Um, these mean tricks, these dishonourable dealings, these deceptive schemes in which we brokers are compelled to clear a path, only serving to prepare the way for more daring and more criminal pursuits. Five hundred pounds at one stroke, <laughs> That is a little fortune to a man struggling against the world like me. Four hundred will I pay to Greenwood. The other hundred will swell my little account at the bankers. For who can hope to do any extent of business in this city without a good name at his bankers? Tomlinson ceased and sat down, calm and collected. Alas, how easy is it to reason oneself into a belief of the existence of a necessity for pursuits of dishonesty or crime. The clerk entered the private office and said, Sir, there is a person who refuses to give his name waiting to speak to you. Let him come in, replied Tomlinson. The clerk ushered in a man of cadaverous countenance, bushy brows and large whiskers, and who was dressed in a suit of black. Your business, sir, said the stockbroker, who did not much like the appearance of this visitor. "'Your name's Tomlinson,' remarked the man, coolly taking a chair. "'Yes. What would you do with me?' "'James Tomlinson,' continued the man, referring to a scrap of paper which he took from his waistcoat pocket. "'Late banker in Lombard Street?' "'The same,' said Tomlinson impatiently. "'Then I took it down right. Although he did speak in such a confused manner,' observed the man, muttering rather to himself than to Mr. Tomlinson. "'What do you mean?' demanded the stockbroker. "'I mean that there's a person who wants to see you,' answered the stranger. "'I don't know that I'm exactly right in saying wants, because he is in such a state that he can neither want nor care about anything. At the same time, I think it would be as well if you was to see him.' "'Who is this person?' cried Tomlinson. "'A man that seems to know you well enough.' "'if I can understand his ravings.' "'Ravings?' repeated the stockbroker, "'already influenced by slight misgiving. "'Ravings, indeed. "'Ain't enough to make him rave. "'To be laid out as dead for four days, "'then put in a coffin, buried, "'and be had up again within ten or a dozen hours. "'If that would make a man rave, "'what the devil would?' "'Have the goodness to explain yourself.' Every word you utter is an enigma to me. But it wasn't an enigma to my poor friend when the stiffen suddenly put a cold hand upon his. However, in two words, do you know a person called Michael Martin? Michael Martin, cried the stockbroker. Speak, what has become of him? Um, he has been ill. Ill, poor old man, and I not to know it. Worse than that. He died. Died? Where? When? Died, and was buried. Trifle not with me. When did he die? Where is he buried? He died, was buried, and came to life again, said the stranger, with the most provoking coolness. Sir, exclaimed Tomlinson, advancing towards his visitor, and speaking in a firm and emphatic manner. If you have called to tell me anything concerning Michael Martin, speak without mystification. Well, sir, 
returned the stranger. The plain truth is this. An old man without a name took up his abode in a by street in Globe Town some months ago. He was taken ill and to all appearances died. He was buried. A surgeon fancied him as a subject and hired me and a friend of mine to have him up again. We resurrectionized him and took him in a cart last night to the surgeon's house. He was conveyed into the dissecting room and stretched on the table. The doctor and I went into the surgery to settle the expenses, and in the meantime my friend was left alone with the stiffen. It seems that a neighbour, suspecting that the surgeon now and then got a subject for his experiments, saw the cart stop at the door and immediately understood what was going on. He went into the garden, which joins the yard where the dissecting house stands, and seeing a light in the window of the dissecting house, he felt sure that his suspicions were well founded, although he could not see into the place because there was a dark blind drawn down over the window. However, the neighbour was resolved to clear up his doubts. So he took up a brick bat and threw it as hard as he could against the window. The glass was broken and the light extinguished. My friend, who was left alone with the stiffen, was somewhat startled at this occurrence. But how much more was he alarmed when he suddenly felt the body stretch out his hand and catch hold of one of his? Then Michael Martin is not dead? ejaculated Tomlinson, in a tone which expressed alike the tenderness of deep emotion and also the bitterness of disappointment, for, perhaps all circumstances considered, the ex-banker would rather have heard a confirmation of the death than an account of the resuscitation of his late clerk. No, the old man is not dead. The doctor and myself were in the surgery when we heard the smash of the window and the cry of the buff uh, of my friend, I mean. Of your brother resurrectionist, I suppose, continued Tomlinson, in a tone of ineffable disgust. Well, go on. We went into the dissecting room with a lamp, and there we found the light put out and my comrade insensible on the floor. But what was more extraordinary still, we saw the corpse gasping for breath. "'He's not dead!' cried the surgeon, and in a moment a lancet was stuck into his arm. The blood would not flow at first, but the surgeon chafed his temples and hands by turns, and in a few moments the blood trickled out pretty freely. Meantime I had recovered my companion and explained to him the nature of the phenomenon that had taken place. When he heard the real truth, he was no longer alarmed, because he knew very well that people are often buried in a trance. In fact, one night, about eighteen months ago, he and I went to the old St. Pancras churchyard to get up a stiffen, and when we opened the coffin, we found that the body had turned completely round on its face. It was, however, stone dead when we got it up. And never shall I forget what a countenance it had. But of that, no matter. Have the goodness to keep to your present narrative, said Tomlinson, scarcely able to conceal his disgust at the presence of a resurrectionist, an avowed body-snatcher. Well, continued the man with the cadaverous countenance, in a very few minutes uh, we completely recovered the old gentleman. I obeyed all the directions of the surgeon and ran backwards and forwards to the pharmacy for God only knows what salts and what ammonia. At last the subject gave a terrible groan, opened his eyes and exclaimed, Where am I? The surgeon assured him that he was in safety, that he had been very ill, that he was now much better, and so on. Meantime, by the surgeon's orders, I had called up his housekeeper, for he is a bachelor, and she had got a bed prepared and warmed, and some hot water ready, and everything comfortable. Well, we carried the old gentleman up to bed. The doctor gave him a little warm brandy and water, and in another half hour he was able to speak a few words in a comprehensible manner. 
but his brain seemed confused, and all we could learn was that his name was Michael Martin, and that he raved after a gentleman whom he called James Tomlinson the Banker. Ah, he said that, did he? cried Tomlinson, rising and pacing the room with agitated steps. He did, was the reply. And then we began to think that we had heard those names before, and in a few minutes I, who know everything, added the man, fixing his serpent-like eyes upon the stockbroker with a kind of fiendish leer. I, he continued, remembered that Michael Martin was the man who had been the cashier in the bank of Tomlinson and Company, Lombard Street. But did he say, did he began the stockbroker, gasping for breath. Did he? He raved. He grew delirious, and in his wanderings he said enough to prove that he was not guilty of the breach of trust imputed to him. Oh, God, thy vengeance overtakes me then at last, cried Tomlinson, sinking pale and trembling upon a chair. He said much, very much, continued the man whose revelations had thus produced so strange an effect upon James Tomlinson. But do not alarm yourself. I am not one to peach, and the doctor himself is not likely to say anything that might lead to an awkward inquiry into the circumstances that brought the old gentleman into his house. Remember, the law now punishes with transportation those who resurrectionize and those who encourage resurrectionists. Then you will not betray me, ejaculated Tomlinson, a ray of hope animating his countenance. Betray you, echoed the man, with a contemptuous curl of his lip and a ferocious leer of his eyes, which gleamed from beneath their bushy brows like those of a hyena from the shade of an overhanging break. Betray you? What good should I get by that? You know that a reward of three thousand pounds was offered to anyone who would deliver up this Michael Martin, and as a man of sense you must understand that it would not be very convenient for me to go forward and claim this reward. <laughs> At the same time, I might talk, or my friend might talk. No one could prevent that, and such like idle gossiping would lead to the detection of the old man. Now, you are the best judge whether or not it is worth while to put a seal upon our lips. We don't want to be hard upon you, but perhaps, ended the man, interrupting himself, you had better see the old gentleman first, and then you will know that I am telling you the truth. When can I see him? Where is he? demanded Tomlinson, almost bewildered by the sudden revelation which had been made to him concerning Michael Martin. Oh, yeah. You had better put off your visit till dusk, was the reply, because I should like to go with you, and a surgeon would not be very well pleased if I called upon him in the daytime. Let it be at dusk, then, said Tomlinson. Name your hour. I have an engagement between nine and ten o'clock tonight, returned the stockbroker. Yeah, so have I, said the visitor. What should you say to seven o'clock? It is as dark then as it is at ten or eleven. Seven will suit me well, answered Tomlinson. Where shall I meet you? At Bethnal Green New Church, the church that stands in the Cambridge Road and faces the Bethnal Green Road, explained the body snatcher. You can be walking up and down now a few minutes before seven. I shall not keep you waiting. I will be punctual, said Tomlinson. But once more you will not betray me. Ridiculous, was the contemptuous reply. And the surgeon, he will not be tempted by the rewards to... Do you think he would walk straight into Newgate and say, I am come to be transported for encouraging and employing resurrection men? You need not alarm yourself. Me and my comrade will settle the matter amicably with you. The body snatcher then took his departure. Tomlinson threw himself back in his chair, pressed both his hands against his heated forehead, and exclaimed in a tone of despair, I have fervently prayed that I might meet my poor old clerk again, and heaven has granted my request. 
but merely to punish me for my crimes. End of section 44「Section forty five of the Mysteries of London, Volume One, Part Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills. The Effects of a Trance. It was half past eight in the evening. By the side of a bed, in a comfortable chamber at the surgeon's house in Cambridge Road, near Bethnal Green New Church, sat James Tomlinson. The light of the candles that burnt upon the table fell on the pale and ghastly countenance of old Michael Martin, who lay in that bed, his head propped up with pillows. "'A burst was it, my good and faithful friend,' said Tomlinson, breaking the long silence which had ensued after mutual explanations. "'Burst was it that you so nobly sacrificed yourself for me. Oh, believe me, that I have never ceased to think of your generous, your unparalleled behaviour in that sad business. I know it, I know it, returned the old man in a weak and hollow voice. If you had not been a kind master to me, I should never have done all of that for you. But tell me, and tell me truly, added Michael, fixing his glassy eyes upon the stockbroker. Do you think that these persons, the surgeon, and that hideous man who— Martin ceased, and his entire frame was convulsed with horror as he remembered the appalling circumstances under which he had been recovered from his late death-like trance and restored to life. "'Compose yourself, my excellent friend,' said Tomlinson, who fully comprehended what was passing in his mind. Fear alone will seal these people's lips, even if no other motive were powerful enough to ensure their silence. The surgeon seems an honest kind of man, and may be relied upon. Besides, he would seriously compromise himself were he to breathe a word of the strange occurrence. As for the other person who came to tell me what had taken place and brought me hither this evening, I have agreed to purchase his silence and that of a comrade who, it appears, was engaged with him in the business. I know you cannot afford to do any such thing, said old Michael, speaking with somewhat of that bluntness or even gruffness of manner which had characterised him in past times. And I won't have you get yourself into difficulties on my account. Believe me, I can afford it, returned Tomlinson. You can't. You told me just now that you were struggling against many difficulties. How much are you going to give these scoundrels? A mere trifle. No, nothing beyond my means. How much? demanded old Michael imperatively. Two hundred pounds. Two hundred pounds. It can't and shan't be done, Mr. Tomlinson. You have not got two hundred pounds. I know you have not. I am to receive five hundred this evening for certain professional services to be rendered, said Tomlinson, and I can readily spare a portion to ensure a silence which is necessary not only to your safety but to mine. True, your safety, muttered old Michael, whose thoughts seemed ever fixed upon the welfare of his late employer. Well, well, I suppose it must be done. Do it, then. Another long pause ensued. Suddenly, Martin turned towards Tomlinson and said in a sharp, querulous tone, "'You told me that you were going to receive five hundred pounds this evening.' "'Such is my hope,' answered the stockbroker, averting his glances from the old man. Uh, "'You can't look me in the face,' exclaimed Michael, almost savagely. "'Where are you going to get that money from?' Uh, "'From a client uh, for whom I am to do business of a certain nature,' faltered Tomlinson. "'Certain nature, indeed. What is it?' Uh, "'Merely professional, Michael,' was the answer. "'Professional business in one evening that will produce five hundred pounds,' said the old man, dwelling emphatically upon every word. Then, after a pause, he added abruptly, "'I don't believe it.' "'I declare most solemnly that I am telling you the truth,' cried Tomlinson, somewhat hurt by Michael's manner and observations. "'So much the worse for you, then,' rejoined the old man laconically. "'The business you are to perform for that sum is not honest.' Tomlinson was about to make some excuse to put an end to the topic by evasive reply, 
when Michael Martin raised himself to a sitting posture in the bed, and fixing his eyes upon his late master, exclaimed with strange emphasis of manner, "'Have you not seen enough, experienced enough, and suffered enough to render you timorous in re-embarking upon the great ocean of chicanery, duplicity, and crime? Be you well assured that though the currents of that ocean may float you prosperously along for a season, they will sooner or later dash you against a sunken rock and shipwreck you beyond redemption.' Oh, he continued, his ghastly countenance becoming animated with the ruddy tinge of excitement, and fire once more sparkling from his glassy eyes. Oh, if you had only passed through all that I have within these last few days, you would not neglect so terrible a warning. Do you know, and his utterance became rapid and eloquent, do you know that I have passed the limits of the tomb, I have wandered in the worlds beyond? Do you know that I have learned the grand, the sublime, the supernal secret of eternity? Yes, when the breath left this mortal clay, my soul winged its light into the regions of infinite space with the rapidity of a whirlwind. I was hurried away from the earth, and although I was nothing but a spirit and could not touch myself, yet I had ears to hear and eyes to see and organs to receive sensations. I was permitted to wander amidst the regions of eternal bliss and to penetrate into the mysteries of hell. Oh, God, I tasted the joys of the former and was equally compelled to submit to the torments of the latter, each for a little space. Ah, sir, can you not divine wherefore the Almighty from time to time plunges mortals into a trance, submits them to the dominion of death for a season? It is that he may snatch away their souls to lead them into the celestial mansions and precipitate them into the depths of Satan's kingdom, so that, when restored to their mortal clay, they may teach their fellow creatures the grand truths of eternity. They may announce to them that there is a heaven to reward and a hell to punish, and the Almighty made choice of me. I say, to become the means through which his warning voice might speak to you and others. What the pleasures of heaven are, or what the torments of hell consist, I dare not say. Suffice it for you to know that there is a heaven and there is an hell, and the former exceeds all idea which man can conceive of bliss, while the latter surpasses everything he can imagine of horror. Be warned, then, by me, James Tomlinson, be warned by one who, for four days, was snatched away from earth, and during that period was initiated in the mighty secrets of eternity. The old man fell back in the bed, exhausted. Tomlinson had, at first, listened to him with sorrow and alarm. He trembled, lest the delirium of a fever had suddenly overtaken him, lest his brain was faltering but as it proceeded in a style of galvanic force and eloquence of which the listener, who had known him for so many years, deemed him incapable, in a manner so inconsistent with all his former habits, so strangely at variance with his nature, his character, and his disposition, the stockbroker became afraid, for it seemed to him as if those burning, searching, searing, scorching words were indeed an emanation from a source belonging to the mysteries of other worlds. An awful pause ensued when Michael Martin ceased to speak. For some moments Tomlinson sat, riveted in speechless terror, to his chair, stunned, bewildered, astounded, appalled by all he had just heard. That dread silence was at length interrupted by the entrance of the surgeon. "'How gets on, my patient, now?' he said, approaching the couch. "'I fear, I'm afraid, uh, that, that, that is, I, I think his head wanders,' faltered the stockbroker, scarcely knowing what he said. Uh, "'We must expect that such will be the case for some days to come,' returned the surgeon, with the coolness of a professional man who saw nothing extraordinary in such results following so strange a resuscitation from a death-like trance. "'You think, then,' asked Tomlinson, "'that it is possible for this poor old man to reave about things of a very extraordinary nature?' 
people when delirious burst forth into the most wild and fanciful ravings, answered the surgeon, as he felt Michael's pulse. Uh, and he may then rave of heaven and hell, and things relating to— He may rave of any nonsense, said the surgeon abruptly, but that is no reason why we should allow ourselves to be affected by it, as I see you are. Uh, it was indeed very foolish on my part, observed Tomlinson, now acquiring confidence, and endeavouring to divest himself of the strange sensations of horror and dread which the eloquence of the old man had excited within him. Uh, you had better retire for the present, said the surgeon. He is in a uh, high fever, produced perhaps by this interview with you, under such circumstances. Do not think of seeing him again this evening. Tomorrow evening he will be better and more composed. And you will take every possible care of him, exclaimed the stockbroker. Remember that no expense must be spared to make him comfortable, to ensure his recovery. I will remunerate you handsomely, sir. Well, well, said the surgeon impatiently. We will talk about that another time. Good evening. You may return tomorrow at the same hour. Good evening, answered Tomlinson, and he slowly took his departure. End of section 45 Section 46 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills. A scene in Mr. Chichester's house. It was about half past nine on the same evening that the above incidents occurred, when a double knock at the front door echoed through Mr. Chichester's dwelling in the immediate vicinity of the Cambridge Heath Gate. Mr. Chichester himself was seated in an elegantly furnished parlour, sipping a glass of excellent Madeira, and pondering upon the best means of enjoying himself when he should have fingered the cash, to obtain which she had perpetrated so diabolical an outrage against the confiding woman who had bestowed upon him her hand, and made him a partner in the enjoyment, if not the actual possession, of her fortune. The room was not large, but very comfortable, and at one end a pair of ample folding doors, now closed, afforded admission into a back parlour. A few moments after the echo of the double knock, above mentioned, through the house, a female servant entered and announced Mr. Tomlinson. Having requested the stockbroker to be seated, Mr. Chichester followed the servant into the hall and said to her in a low whisper, when the other person comes, show him into the back parlour, as I may require to have some conversation with this gentleman before I introduce them to each other. This command being given, Mr. Chichester returned to the room where he had left Mr. Tomlinson. You are before your time, said Chichester, pushing the decanter and a glass towards the stockbroker. That looks like business. I accidentally had an appointment upon some business in this neighbourhood, was the reply, and when that matter was disposed of, I came straight hither. We cannot repair to the lunatic asylum until ten or half past, said Chichester, because, as a precaution, the keeper has promised to call upon me presently and report whether my wife continues in the same docile mood as when she wrote to me yesterday afternoon. I should be delighted to hear that you could settle this unpleasant, very unpleasant affair in some amicable way, returned Tomlinson, whose mind was still painfully excited by the interview which had taken place between him and his late cashier. Impossible, my dear sir, ejaculated Chichester. There is no way save the one chalked out. And I hope that you do not hesitate to fulfil the agreement into which you entered with me. The truth is, Mr. Chichester, said Tomlinson, there is no man in London to whom a few hundreds of pounds would prove as welcome as to me, especially as to-morrow I have to pay two hundred to men who will not be very well pleased to experience a disappointment. <laughs> it is true that I possess such a sum at my bankers, but I dare not draw out every shilling. My credit would be ruined. So much the better reason for doing as I require of you, said Chichester, filling the glasses with Madeira. True, observed Tomlinson, but on the other hand, I tremble to take a false step. I fear to jeopardize myself by connivance at a direct conspiracy. Pooh, cried Chichester. 
what is the use of compunction on the part of a man who stands in so much need of money as yourself? Tomlinson was about to reply when a low knock at the front door fell upon his ears. It is no one of any consequence, said Chichester. Then, as he refilled the glasses, he muttered to himself, uh, There is no use in introducing these men to each other, unless this milk-and-water fool is quite agreeable to act. Uh, did you make an observation? inquired the stockbroker. I was observing that it was no one of any consequence, only some person for the servants, most probably. But let me now ask you seriously, Mr. Tomlinson, whether you feel disposed to proceed further in this matter or not. Well, candidly speaking, I would rather not, was the reply. Then you are wrong to give me false hope of your aid, and allow so much valuable time to elapse, during which I might have found a broker less punctilious than you. I regret that I should have caused this inconvenience, answered Tomlinson, but I had resolved to perform my promise until about an hour ago, and I have even brought the necessary documents for the purpose. Something very remarkable must have intervened to change your resolutions, said Chichester contemptuously. I am not superstitious, observed Tomlinson, but I believe that a providential warning was conveyed to me. A providential fiddlestick. Remember, Mr. Tomlinson, that by your unpardonable vacillation in this matter, you will only prolong the incarceration of my wife. And pray, who is responsible for that deed? We will not discuss this point, returned Chichester. I did not ask you to become my mentor. At the same time, he added, sinking his voice, every moment is important, for my wife is going mad in reality. Then, in the name of God, release her at once, ejaculated Thompson. Never until she signs the deed. Release her, continued Tomlinson, and then bring her with you to my office, where she can make the transfer. Are you mad yourself? Do you suppose that you would ever put pen to paper if she were once liberated in that manner? I am surprised at your ignorance, vexed at your cowardice. You have not acted like a man of business, nor as a man of the world. It was for you to accept or decline my proposal, not to deceive me by these changes and shiftings of inclination. Come, sir, once for all, pluck up your courage. Remember the two hundred pounds which you say must be paid tomorrow to two men who will not be put off, and the settlement of which debt will so materially embarrass your finances. My mind is made up, Mr. Chichester, answered Tomlinson firmly. And what is your decision? I shall beg to withdraw from the transaction. And Tomlinson rose to depart. But at the same moment, the folding doors communicating with the inner room were thrown open, and a man with a cadaverous countenance stood forward. You shall not forfeit your word in this respect, exclaimed the individual, who Tomlinson immediately recognized to be the body snatcher engaged in the affair of Michael Martin. What does this man do here? asked Tomlinson in a faint voice of Chichester. "'What do I do here? What do I do everywhere?' <laughs> "'Cried the man with a diabolical laugh. "'Tell me the secret plot, the cunning intrigue, the scheme of villainy, "'to which Antony Tidkins, surnamed the Resurrection Man, is a stranger. "'But little did I think when I called upon you this morning, "'little did I imagine when I met you again this evening "'that you were the person enlisted by Mr. Chichester "'in the affair which we have now in hand.' <laughs> "'It would appear, then, that you are acquainted with each other,' "'said Chichester, laughing heartily "'at the confusion manifested by the stockbroker "'in the presence of the Resurrection Man. "'Why, what devilry was it that brought you two together? "'Whether I keep Mr. Tomlinson's secret, "'or whether I proclaim it to you and everyone else whom I know "'until the whole town rings with the circumstance, "'is a matter for him to decide,' said the Resurrection Man, "'and with admirable coolness he helped himself to a bumper of Madeira. "'If I pay you two hundred pounds as agreed,' exclaimed Tomlinson, "'what more would you require of me?' "'I require that you remain faithful to your promise to Mr. Chichester. "'I require that you fulfil the service which you have undertaken to perform in his behalf, 
was the absolute reply. And in what way does that business regard you? You who acknowledge yourself to be... A resurrectionist. <laughs> Certainly I am, and the most skilful in London. No other excepted. <laughs> Exclaimed Tidkins with a satanic chuckle. But that does not prevent me from turning madhouse keeper or anything else when opportunity offers. What? You are the keeper of the asylum in which this gentleman's wife is imprisoned? exclaimed the stockbroker in a tone of the most profound astonishment. Yes, he is indeed, said Chichester, and a better keeper could not have been found. Sure, now you know all about that point. And Mr. Tomlinson will be good enough to accompany me to my house, observed the resurrection man. You, Mr. Chichester, can follow us at a little distance. It looks suspicious for free people to walk together. I really must decline, began Tomlinson, trembling from head to foot, as the warning voice of Michael Martin seemed to ring in his ears. One word more, Mr. Tomlinson, said the resurrection man. I am a person of determined spirit and resolution. I never stick at trifles myself, and I don't choose others with whom I am connected to balk me in my designs when I can prevent them. Now, either come with me and do what is required of you, or, as sure there is breath in your body, I will deliver up a certain person to the police and stand the consequences myself. I beg of you. I implore you. Fah! cried Chichester. This is child's play. Child's play, indeed, thundered the resurrection man in a terrible voice. But I will put an end to it. Come, sir, as it takes another minute, and that old man is lost. I will accompany you, answered the stockbroker. Then, in an undertone, he added, But God knows how unwillingly. The resurrection man seized him by the arm and conducted him out of the house. Five minutes afterwards, Chichester followed in the same direction. End of section 46 Section 47 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills Viola. The resurrection man and the stockbroker pursued their way in silence to the very entrance to the alley leading to the side door of the dwelling of the former. There they halted, the resurrection man observing that they must wait for Mr. Chichester. Tomlinson took advantage of the interval to implore the resurrection man not to communicate to Chichester the secret relating to Michael Martin. Do not be afraid, was the answer. I am as close as Nougat door when people conduct themselves as they ought to do. One individual for whom I do business never knows what I am engaged in for another, unless his own bad behaviour forces me to blab. So make yourself quite easy upon that score. Chichester now made his appearance, and the resurrection man led the way up the alley. Having opened the door of the house, he admitted his two companions into the back room on the ground floor, and then struck a light. The appearance of the place was precisely the same as when we described it on the first occasion of the Rattlesnake's visit to that department of the building. Tomlinson shuddered as he cast his eyes around the naked and gloomy walls. Hello, ejaculated Chichester, taking up the mask which lay on the table in his hands. I suppose that this is... Hush, said the resurrection man, glancing towards Tomlinson, as much as to desire Chichester not to allow the stockbroker to know more of the secrets connected with the treatment of the prisoner than was possible. For Titkins, who possessed a profound knowledge of human nature, was well aware that certain compunctious feelings still floated in the mind of Tomlinson, and that he was, after all, but a very coward in the ways of crime. Chichester covered the mask with a cloak, while the stockbroker was engaged in scanning the appearance of the chamber. When Tomlinson had completed his survey, and while he was still wondering where the means of communication with the apartment of the alleged lunatic could be, he happened to turn in the direction of the chimney-piece, 
when, to his surprise, he perceived the hearthstone raised, and the resurrection man half down the subterranean staircase, which that strangely contrived trapdoor had disclosed to view. Tomlinson shuddered, and hesitated whether he should proceed further in the matter. But his scruples vanished when he heard the voice of the resurrection man desiring, or rather commanding him, to follow him down that flight of stone steps. Guided by Titkins, who carried the candle, which was fixed in one of the large tin shades before described, Tomlinson descended the stairs and found himself in a vaulted passage, about twenty feet long and four broad. There were four strong doors, studded with thick iron nails on each side. Monsieur, this house was built for a lunatic asylum many years ago, when treatment wasn't quite so humane as it is now whispered the resurrection man to Tomlinson, but it hadn't been used as such for the last thirty years, uh, till the other day. And did you hire the establishment for the purpose of restoring it to its original uses? demanded Tomlinson, shuddering as he glanced around on the damp walls on which the strong light of the candle fell. Not I, indeed, answered Tidkins abruptly. Chichester had now descended into the subterranean passage. "'This is the cell,' said the Resurrection Man, and approaching one of the doors he placed a key in the lock. During the few seconds that intervened until the door was thrown open, Tomlinson experienced a perfect age of mental agony. He felt as if he were about to perpetrate some hideous crime, a murder of the blackest dye. The perspiration poured off his forehead, and he trembled from head to foot. His brain felt oppressed, and there was a weight upon the pit of his stomach. His eyeballs throbbed. Yes, he was a very coward in guilt. The door flew open. The resurrection man entered first, and advanced into the middle of a small arched cell, a stone tomb built to immure the living. A decent bed, a table, a chair, a wash-hand stand and a lamp, which was lighted, together with a few other necessities, composed the furniture of that dungeon, and stretched upon the bed, with her clothes on, lay the victim of this cruel persecution. The glare of the resurrection man's candle fell upon a pale but not unpleasing countenance. The long chestnut hair spread dishevelled over the arm that supported the head. The sleep of that lady was deep but uneasy, such a slumber as might be supposed to fall upon the eyes of the criminal the night before his execution. Her bosom heaved convulsively, and from her lips escaped a stifled sob as the three men entered the cell. Chichester was about to place his hand upon her shoulder in order to arouse her when she opened her eyes and started up to a sitting posture on the bed. "'Villains!' she exclaimed. "'Would you murder me?' "'No such thing, my dear,' said Chichester. "'We have merely come to terminate this unpleasant business "'in the way proposed by Mr. Tidkins.' "'The wretch!' cried Viola, "'casting a glance of doubt and uncertainty "'at both Tomlinson and the Resurrection Man. "'Ah, I dare say I am, ma'am, in your estimation,' said Tidkins coolly. Oh, "'You needn't look at me in that way, ma'am. I will acknowledge that I am your keeper in this establishment, and that it's me who has been good enough to bring you food every night. The rich! again cried the unhappy lady, while a profound shudder seemed to convulse her whole frame as she surveyed the resurrection man from head to foot. It is you, then, she continued, leaping from the bed and confronting the miscreant. "'It is you who have dared to practice upon my fears "'in a manner the most diabolical, the most cowardly. "'You who have chosen the solemn hour of midnight for your visits, "'and who have come in a guise calculated to fill my mind "'with the most horrible imaginings.' "'Remember our agreement, ma'am,' said Tidkins sternly. "'You pledged yourself uh, to forget the past upon certain conditions.' We are here to fulfil these conditions. Do you mean to keep your word, or must we leave you to your solitude? Who is this gentleman? demanded Viola, casting a penetrating glance upon Tomlinson. The stockbroker, my dear, 
answered Chichester, the person who will receive your signature to a certain little paper. Then, sir, interrupted the lady, addressing herself to James Tomlinson, as you who exercise an honourable profession, prove yourself an honourable man in this respect. You see before you a powerless female who was weak enough to bestow her hand upon a villain, a villain that has immured her by the aid of another villain of even a deeper dye than himself in this horrible vault. Perhaps they have told you that I am mad, sir, but do I speak like one whose reason has abandoned her senses? Or would you receive the signature of a person who knew not what she signed? Oh, no, sir, you cannot believe that I am in mental darkness. You must perceive the full extent of the villainy that has been practised against me for the purpose of plundering me of that property which I received from my former husband. Oh, if you be a man possessing one spark of honour, as I must suppose that you are. Come, a truce to all this, said Mr. Chichester. The gentleman to whom you are addressing yourself knows the whole affair, and will act with and for me. "'Is this true, sir?' asked the unhappy lady, casting a glance of mingled terror and supplication upon the stockbroker. "'Can this be true? Is it possible that a person exercising an honourable profession can league with wretches of their stamp?' and she pointed disdainfully towards the resurrection man and Chichester. "'Oh, no, it cannot be! At least hear me! I married that man!' "'Don't I tell you that Mr. Tomlinson knows all?' cried Chichester impatiently. "'We did not come to debate upon the past, but to settle for the future. You have come, then, to plunder a weak, helpless, persecuted female,' continued Viola. "'But do you know, sir, the terrible means that have been adopted "'to wring from me a consent to part with half the property "'which was bequeathed to me by a man that loved me? "'A man who toiled for years and years to amass the fortune "'that must now be devoted to the extravagances of a spendthrift? "'Would you believe to what extent the cruelty and cowardice of that man?' and she pointed to Tidkins, has been carried to terrify me into compliance with the demands of his employer. Sir, for three weeks and three days have I been a prisoner in this dungeon, and every night, without fail, has that miscreant visited me in a disguise which, in such a place and at such an hour, would make the stoutest heart palpitate with horror a disguise of such a nature that this is the first time that i have seen his face for on that fatal evening when i was seized and brought to this dungeon everything was involved in utter obscurity and then when the door opened again and a light gleamed in upon me oh god it was carried by a person dressed in a dark cloak and a white mask like a being of another world "'Surely you did not go to such extremes as this!' exclaimed Tomlinson, turning sharply round upon the resurrection man. "'Whatever I did or did not is nothing to the present business,' replied Tidkins brutally. "'If anything is going to be done, let it be done at once. If not, the lady will remain here until she chooses to consent to the terms proposed to her.' Tomlinson glanced with a look of deep sympathy towards the lady who stood in an attitude of supplication and despair before him. Her dishevelled hair hung loosely over her shoulders. Her countenance, though not beautiful, was naturally interesting and was now rendered more so by its extreme pallor and by the expression of profound melancholy which it wore and her mild blue eyes were raised towards him as if to implore his aid, his compassion. "'No, what is to be done?' demanded Chichester. "'It is for this gentleman to decide,' said the lady, still gazing upon Tomlinson's countenance. "'You may well suppose that I am desirous to recover the liberty which has been infamously violated. But if you, sir, possess one germ of generous feeling, one spark of honour, one gleam of humanity in your soul, do not, do not lend yourself to this infamy. Command these men to restore me to freedom.' They cannot refuse to obey you. 
Oh, sir, hear me. Do not avert your head. Hear me, hear me. I implore you. This is quite enough of folly for one time, ejaculated the resurrection man. I have been an idiot myself to listen to it so long. Mr. Tomlinson, are you prepared to receive the signature of this lady to the deed that will transfer to her husband a certain portion of her property? Then, approaching his lips to the stockbroker's ear, he murmured in a low whisper, "'Hesitate, and I denounce your late clerk within an hour.' These words operated like magic upon the weak-minded and timid James Tomlinson. He no longer beheld the supplicating woman before him. He saw only his own danger. Accordingly, he advanced towards the table, drew forth a document from his pocket, and said in a cold tone, "'I am ready to receive that lady's signature.' The resurrection man produced an ink bottle and pens, with which he had purposely provided himself beforehand from his pocket, and placed them upon the table. Tomlinson seated himself in the chair, and proceeded to fill up the paper. "'And whose favour is the transfer to be made?' he demanded. "'Then, sir, you are determined to league with my oppressors?' said Viola, in a tone expressive of concentrated feelings of indignation and despair. "'Madam, I am unfortunately compelled.' "'Say no more, sir,' interrupted the lady, with a contemptuous curl of the lip. "'If you came hither a villain, I must be mad indeed to hope to make you an honest man by any reasoning of mine.' "'Madam, you wrong me, by heavens!' ejaculated Tomlinson, throwing down the pen. But at the same moment his wrist was seized with a grasp of iron, and a well-known voice whispered in his ear— "'Hesitate another moment, and I denounce you and your cashier together.' Tomlinson became docile as a child, resumed the pen, and said, "'In whose favour is this transfer to be made?' "'In that of Mr. Arthur Chichester,' answered Viola firmly. "'What is the amount to be so transferred?' Eight thousand pounds, being part of a sum, now standing in my name in the three and a half per cents, replied the injured woman, still with an outward composure which was not, however, the redaction of her inward feelings. Tomlinson filled up the paper according to the instructions which he received. Then, addressing himself to Viola, but without turning his eyes towards her, he said, You are aware, madam, that this document is antedated by two months. I am, sir. Nothing now remains, then, madam, save for you to sign it. Viola advanced slowly towards the table, took up the pen, and seemed about to affix her signature to the deed, when, as if suddenly recollecting herself, she turned towards the stockbroker and exclaimed, What guarantee have I that my freedom is to follow this concession on my part? "'Tomorrow evening at dusk you shall be conveyed home,' exclaimed Chichester, seeing that Tomlinson gave no answer. "'And why not this evening, now, the moment that document is signed?' "'Because I should prefer laying my hand on the money first, was the reply. "'Mr. Tomlinson,' cried the lady, "'I have more confidence in you than in either of these men.' i am willing even to believe that some circumstance unknown to me compels you unwillingly to become their instrument on this occasion by heavens you speak the truth madam ejaculated tomlinson warmly i believe you now sir promise me on your most solemn word of honour by everything you consider sacred that to-morrow evening at nine o'clock i shall be released from this dungeon "'I promise, I swear that you shall be conveyed home to-morrow evening at nine o'clock,' answered Tomlinson. "'But, in return, madam, will you pledge yourself as solemnly that your lips shall ever remain closed with regard to this proceeding?' "'Oh, yes, I do, I do,' answered the poor creature, clasping her hands together, for she could even feel grateful to the man while leagued with the others against her, yet pledged himself to her release from that horrible cell. "'Secrecy on all sides is one of the conditions of the present arrangement,' said Chichester. 
"'And if the lady breaks that condition,' added the resurrection man, "'she would repent it, for let her be surrounded by friends, "'let her be protected by a regiment of soldiers, "'let her take refuge in the Queen's palace, "'I should still find means to tear her away "'and bring her back to this dungeon.' Tomlinson and the lady both cast a glance of mingled horror and surprise at the formidable individual who thus spoke so confidently of his power and resolution. There was a moment's pause. Viola then took up the pen, and with a firm hand affixed her signature to the document. "'I am now at your mercy,' she said, in a tone rather of supplication than of menace or mistrust. Oh, "'You need not be afraid that we shall deceive you, my dear.' observed Chichester with a smile. A reply rose to the lips of his injured wife, but she suppressed it, though with difficulty. She was no doubt afraid to irritate the man in whose power she still found herself by giving utterance to her thoughts. "'No, nah, there's nothing to be afraid of,' said the resurrection man. "'The lady has fulfilled her part at a bargain, and we will perform ours.' As for her keeping this little business dark, I feel confident about that. She would not like to stand a chance of coming to you again, and as for making disturbance merely to get back the money, that would be useless, when once it had found its way into the pockets of her husband. Having concluded this brutal speech, the resurrection man desired his companions to await his return for a moment, while he proceeded to fetch the lady her provisions for the next four and twenty hours. He accordingly hastened up the steps to the little back room, whence he speedily returned with his basket in his hand. "'You see that I expected how all this would end,' he observed with a hideous smile, "'and so I prepared a little treat for the lady. "'Here's a prime fowl. "'That brown paper contains ham. "'Here's a new loaf, and this is a bottle of as excellent sherry as one need drink.' "'The resurrection man placed the articles, as he enumerated them, upon the table.' and viola was pleased as she contemplated them because she perceived in this indulgence an earnest that the promise of her persecutors would be fulfilled with respect to her restoration to liberty um, we must now take leave of mrs chichester said tidkins to-morrow evening ma'am at nine precisely you shall be free the three men then left the dungeon but ere the door closed upon the inmate once more, she moved forward, caught Tomlinson by the hand, and said in an emphatic tone, "'Remember your solemn promise. Do not be alarmed, madam. There can be no interest to detain you here beyond to-morrow.' Viola retreated into the dungeon, and the door was shut. She heard the three persons who had just left her retire from the subterranean prison. The closing of the trap-door also fell upon her ears. Clasping her hands together, she exclaimed, "'God, grant me that they may not deceive me!' And then a vague terror stole upon her, a horrible and absorbing dread, lest those men intended to immure her for life in that solitary cell, or else restore her to liberty only when they should have extorted from her the remainder of her fortune. "'Oh, fool that I was to sign that paper!' she exclaimed in a paroxysm of despair. "'Will men who are capable of such villainy, such atrocity as this that they have practised towards me, will they remain satisfied with a portion of the gold that has allured them to violate every principle of honour and humanity? Oh, no, no! And perhaps to conceal their crime the more effectively, they would not hesitate to imbrue their hands in my blood!' Overpowered by this idea, the unhappy woman threw herself upon the bed and wept bitterly. The torrent of tears relieved her, and in a few minutes she grew somewhat composed. Then came reflections of a less painful nature. Still, there was something honest in the appearance of that stockbroker. There was something feeling in his words. He was performing a task against which his soul revolted. He commiserated my condition. Oh, yes, he sympathised with me. In him is my hope, my only hope. Oh, I need not quite despair. 
she thus reasoned herself into a state of comparative calmness, and then a feeling of weakness came over her. She grew faint, and her head swam round. She rose and walked up and down the cell to dispel the sensation that had thus suppressed her, and suddenly she recollected that many hours had elapsed since she had eaten anything. Her eyes fell upon the victuals which the resurrection man had placed on the table, and she hastened to break her long fast. When she had partaken of a morsel of food, she poured some wine into a glass and drank it. Scarcely, however, had she swallowed the liquor when she felt herself overpowered by a deep drowsiness. The glass dropped from her hands. She rose from the chair, advanced a few paces, and then fell upon the bed in a state of insensibility. End of section 47 Section 48 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills The Lovers The morning which succeeded the night that witnessed the incidents just detailed was clear, frosty, and fine. It was one of those winter mornings when the soil is hard as iron, but on which the sun shines with grey light if not with genial heat. On such a morning we walk abroad with a consciousness that exercise benefits us. We feel the blood acquiring a more rapid circulation in our veins. We soon experience a pleasant glow pervading the frame. Our spirits become exhilarated, and we learn that even winter has its peculiar charms. Such was the feeling that animated Richard Markham, as, after alighting from a public vehicle at Richmond, he proceeded rapidly along a by-road that led through the fields at the back of Count Alteroni's mansion. His cheeks were tinged with a glow that set off his handsome features to the greatest advantage. His dark eyes sparkled with an expression of joy and hope. A smile played upon his lips, and he walked with his head erect as if he felt proud of his existence, because that existence, in spite of its vicissitude, was protected by some auspicious star. O oh, love, art thou not a star full of hope and promise, like that which guided the sages of the East to the cradle of their Redeemer? Like the welcome planet which heralds the dauntless mariner over the midnight seas? like the twinkling orb which points the right track to the Arab wanderer in the desert? Richard Markham pursued his way, his soul full of hope and love and bliss. At a distance of about a quarter of a mile on his right hand, the mansion of Count Alteroni soon met his eyes, surrounded by the evergreens that, in contrast with the withered trees elsewhere, gave to the spot where it stood the air of an oasis in the midst of a desert. Markham's heart beat quickly when that well-known dwelling met his view, and for a moment a shade of melancholy passed over his countenance, for he recalled to mind the happy hours he had once spent within its walls. But that transitory cloud vanished from his brow when his eyes caught a glimpse in another instance of a sylph-like form that was threading a leafless grove at a little distance. Richard redoubled his steps, and was led, by the circuitous winding of the path that he was pursuing, somewhere nearer to the Count's mansion. In a few minutes he reached the very spot where, in the preceding spring, he had accidentally encountered Isabella, and where she assured him of her unchanged and unchangeable love. He is now on that spot once more. He pauses, looks around, and Isabella again approaches. Richard rushes forward and clasps the beautiful Italian maiden in his arms. "'Isabella, dearest Isabella, what good angel prompted you to grant me this interview?' he exclaimed, when the first effusion of joy was over. "'Do you think me indiscreet, Richard?' asked the signora, taking his arm and glancing timidly towards his countenance. <laughs> "'Indiscreet, my sweet girl!' cried her lover. "'Oh, how can you suppose that I would entertain a harsh feeling with regard to that goodness on your part, which doubtless instigated you to afford me the happiness of this meeting?' 
"'But when we met here seven or eight months ago, Richard,' said Isabella, "'I told you that never, never would I consent to a stolen interview. "'And now you may imagine. "'I imagine that you love me, Isabella, love me as I love you,' exclaimed Markham. "'And what other idea can occupy my thoughts when that one is present? "'Oh, you know not the ineffable joy, the unequalled pleasure "'which I experienced when your letter reached me yesterday.' I recognized your handwriting immediately, and I seized the letter with the avidity when it was brought to me in my study. And then, Isabella, will you believe me when I tell you that I tremble to open it? I laid it upon the table. My hand refused to break the seal. Pardon me, forgive me, if for a moment I feared that I had forgotten my vows, my plighted affection, faltered Isabella reproachfully. "'Again, I say, pardon, forgive me, dearest girl, "'but, oh, I have been so very unfortunate.' "'Think not of the past, Richard,' said Isabella tenderly. "'The past? Oh, how can I cease to ponder upon the past "'when it has nearly bereaved me of all hope for the future?' "'exclaimed Markham in an impassioned tone. "'Not all hope,' murmured Isabella, "'since hope still remains to me.' "'Angel that thou art!' cried Richard, pressing the maiden's hand fondly. "'How weak I am, since it is from thee that moral courage ever is imparted!' "'You were speaking of my letter,' said Isabella, with a smile. "'True, but so many emotions, joy and hope, sorrowful reminiscences and brighter prospects, bewilder me. "'I will, however, try to talk calmly.' When your letter came, I feared to open it for some moments. I, I dreaded a new calamity. But at length I called all my firmness to my aid, and a terrible weight was taken from my soul, when my eyes glanced at the first lines of that letter, which suddenly became as dear and welcome as a reprieve to the condemned criminal. Then, when I saw that my beloved Isabella still thought of me, still loved me, oh, I did not tell you in my letter, exclaimed Isabella with a smile of bewitching archness. No, but I divined it. I gathered it from the words which you conveyed to me, your desire to see me. From the manner in which you said that at eleven o'clock this morning you should walk in the very place where we had met accidentally once before. Oh, I suddenly became a new being. Never has my heart been so light. "'And yet I said in my letter, Richard, that I wished to see you upon a matter of business. "'Ah, Isabella, destroy not the charm which makes me happy. "'Let no cold thought of worldly things chill the heavenly further of our affection. "'Were it not for that love which reciprocally exists between us, "'how should I have supported the misfortunes that have multiplied upon me? "'Again, I say, Richard, allude not to the past.' Alas, bitter, bitter were the tears that I wept on that fatal night when, when I was publicly disgraced at the theatre, in the midst of a triumph. Yes, Isabella, you were there, there where my shame was consummated. Accident had led us to the theatre that evening, answered Isabella. My father had heard that a new tragedy, of which grand hopes were entertained, was to be produced, and he insisted that I should accompany him and my mother. I was compelled to assent to his desire, although I prefer retirement and tranquillity to society and gaiety. You may conceive our astonishment. You may imagine my surprise and my joy when you came forward to acknowledge the congratulations offered for a triumph so brilliantly achieved. And then, uh, but let us leave that subject. My blood turns cold when I think of it. Oh, "'Go on, speak of it, speak of it!' exclaimed Markham enthusiastically. "'For although the reminiscence of that fearful scene "'be like pouring molten lead upon an open wound, "'still it is sweet, it is sweet, Isabella, "'to receive sympathy from such lips as yours. "'Alas, I have little more to say, "'except the sudden intervention of that terrible man "'seemed to strike me as the arrow of death, "'and I became insensible.' Then, Richard, then, continued Isabella in a low and tremulous tone, my mother suspected my secret, or rather received a confirmation of the suspicion which she had long entertained. And she shuddered at the mere idea, 
exclaimed Markham interrogatively. No, Richard, my mother is kind and good, and you know was always well disposed towards you. I have told you that much before. She said little, and of that no matter. But my father, my father, he discovered our secret also, exclaimed Richard. Oh, did he not curse me? He was cool and calm, when, on the following morning, he spoke to me upon the subject. I answered him frankly. I admitted my attachment for you. What did he say, Isabella? Tell me. Everything. Suppress not a word. Oh, heavens, he made me very miserable, returned Isabella, tears trickling down her countenance. But wherefore distress both yourself and me with a recapitulation of what ensued? Suffice it to say that I collected all the arguments in my memory, and there were not a few, and I presented to him that paper, the confession of Talbot, which proved your innocence. Dearest girl, exclaimed Markham rapturously. He did not refuse to read it, added Isabella, and at length, when I saw that I had made a profound impression upon him, I turned the conversation upon the momentary reverse of fortune which had plunged him into a debtor's prison. Isabella! cried Markham in surprise. And then I boldly declared my conviction that the unknown friend who had released him, the anonymous individual who had thrown open to him the gate leading to liberty, the nameless person that had done so generous a deed and accomplished it in a manner as delicate as it was noble, was none other than Richard Markham. The tone of the Italian maiden had become more and more impassioned as she proceeded, and when she uttered the last words of the foregoing sentence, she turned upon him on whose arm she leant, a countenance glowing with animation, and radiant with gratitude and love. "'Oh, Isabella, you told your father that,' cried Markham, "'and yet you knew not.' "'My suspicion amounted almost to a certainty,' interrupted Isabella, "'and now I doubt no longer.' Oh, Richard, if ever for one moment I had wavered in my love for you, if ever an instant of coldness arising from worldly reflections had intervened to make me repent my solemn vows to you, that one deed of yours, that noble sacrifice of your property, made to release my revered parent from a jail, that, that alone would have rendered my heart unalterably thine. "'Beloved girl, this moment is the happiest of my life!' exclaimed Markham, and tears of joy filled his eyes as he pressed the maiden once more to his heart. "'Yes, Richard,' continued Isabella, after a long pause, and now her splendid countenance was lighted up with an expression of dignity and generous pride, and the timid, bashful maiden seemed changed into a lady whose brow was encircled with a diadem. "'Yes, Richard,' if ever i felt that no deed nor act of mine shall separate us eternally if ever i rejoiced in the prospect of possessing wealth and receiving lustre from my father's princely rank isabella exclaimed richard dropping the arm on which the italian lady was leaning and stepping back in the most profound astonishment isabella what mean you i mean continued the signora casting upon him a glance of deep tenderness and noble pride I mean that henceforth, Richard, I can have no secret from you, that I must now disclose what has often before trembled upon my tongue, a secret which my father would not, however, as yet, have revealed to the English public generally, the secret of his rank, for he whom the world knows as Count Alteroni is Alberto, Prince of Castelcicala. Strange was the effect that this revelation produced upon the young man. He felt as if when, in a burning heat, a mighty volume of icy water had suddenly been dashed over him. His head appeared to swim round, his sight grew dim, he staggered, and would have fallen had not Isabella rushed towards him, exclaiming, "'Richard, oh dear Richard, do you not believe how much I love you?' These words produced an instantaneous change within him. Those sweet syllables, uttered in the silvery tones of a lovely woman's tenderness, recalled him to himself. "'Ah, Isabella!' he exclaimed mournfully. "'How insuperable is the barrier which divides us now! And if that barrier to which you allude ever existed, was it less formidable when you were ignorant of the secret than it is at present?' asked Isabella tenderly. 
"'It seems so to me,' replied Richard. Uh, "'Are you not placed on an eminence to which I can never hope to reach? "'Have I not dared to lift my ambitious eyes towards a princess, "'the daughter of one who will some day wear a sovereign crown? "'Oh, now the delusion is gone. "'I am awakened from a long dream. "'But say, did your highness make this revelation today "'in order to extinguish my adventurous aspirations at once?' and for ever richard you wrong me cruelly wrong me exclaimed isabella bursting into tears forgive me forgive me sweetest girl cried markham i was mad i raved i knew not what i said richard when we met here once before you doubted my affection and then you asked me to forgive you how often will you put my feelings to so cruel a test how often will you renew those unjust suspicions Oh, God, what have I done? That I should thus call tears to your eyes, Isabella? Forgive me. Again, I say, forgive me. On my knees, I implore. No, no, I think no more of what you said, exclaimed Isabella. Calm yourself for my sake. And she gazed so tenderly up into his countenance that he was reassured, and all his doubts and fears vanished in a moment. Yes, Isabella, he said, I am now calm. And you, you are an angel. A mere terrestrial one, Richard, I'm afraid, returned the princess with a smile. And now let me speak to you upon the little matter of business to which I alluded in my note. After I had informed my father that you were the generous unknown who had been the means of his release from prison, he exclaimed, Excellent-hearted young man! How I have wronged him by my injurious suspicions concerning that night when the burglary was attempted at our house. You see that I tell you his very words. Yes, tell me everything, dear Isabella, and thus your father no longer believes. How can he believe that any one would attempt to rob him one day and pay nearly two thousand pounds for him another? exclaimed Isabella. Oh, no, he is disabused upon that point. "'Would that he were unprejudiced on others.' "'I understand you,' said Markham mournfully. "'The prince cannot consent to renew his acquaintance "'with one who has been subjected to an infamous punishment "'and who aspires to the hand of his daughter. "'Alas, you have divined but too truly,' "'returned Isabella, wiping away a tear. "'Nevertheless, may we not hope? "'Already is one great point gained. "'My father believes that you may have been unfortunate and not guilty. "'Oh, that is a great obstacle removed. "'And in my mother, Richard, you have a warm friend, "'although her prejudices of rank and family.' "'I can well comprehend the sentiments of Her Highness,' answered Markham. "'And it is all that which now makes me fear, lest fear not, but hope everything,' said Isabella, who, however a poor girl, spoke in a more flattering manner than her secret thoughts would have warranted had she consulted them. But she saw her lover oppressed and weighed down by the revelation of that secret which she had considered it unkind to retain any longer, and she did all she could to console him. "'Yes, I will hope for both our sakes,' said Richard." "'And now let me conclude my little narrative,' continued Isabella. "'My father resolved to repay you the money you had so generously advanced the moment he was enabled, and as the Grand Duke of Castelcicala has settled upon him an income of ten thousand a year, besides an immediate grant of forty thousand pounds, boons which my father had only accepted because no political condition was attached to them, and because they are alleged to be an indemnification for his estates which have been confiscated, he only awaited the arrival of his first remittance to acquit himself of that debt of honour. The day before yesterday he gave this letter, added Isabella, taking a small sealed packet from her reticule, to one of our servants to convey to the post at Richmond. I demanded it back again privately of the servant, with the view of placing it myself in your hands, and taking the opportunity to reveal to you a secret which I did not think it right to keep from you any longer. I receive this packet, then, Isabella, with its contents, said Markham, pressing her hand as he took it. "'because your father is happily in a position "'to repay me the trifle which I was enabled "'to disperse for his benefit. "'But ten thousand times more valuable is this sum to me "'since its payment prompted you to grant me this interview. 
"'I had so much to tell you, Richard,' answered the lady, with a deep blush, "'that I could not commit it all to paper. "'I therefore adopted this plan, which perhaps is indiscreet. "'Use not that epithet again, dear Isabella,' interrupted Markham. "'You assure me that you love me. "'Can you then regret that you have made me happy "'by allowing me to see you, to talk to you, to embrace you once again?' and yet in the midst of that happiness the sad thought intrudes upon me when shall i see thee again accidents may throw us together soon as it has done now murmured isabella accident or rather providence does so much for us poor mortals but with your mother's prejudices in favour of rank and birth and with your father's high destinies what hope can exist for so humble an individual as myself how can I dare aspire to the hand of a princess of a powerful, independent state? Did not Miss Eliza Sidney espouse the Grand Duke of Castelcicala, and she, she also— Oh, I remember, exclaimed Markham, seeing that Isabella hesitated, I remember that she also was unfortunate, as I was, and she also endured a weary imprisonment of two years. Yes, I accept the omen. It is an auspicious one and Richard's handsome countenance was once more animated with a glow of hope and joy. Then, in an access of enthusiasm, he exclaimed, Oh, if ever this fond aspiration should be realised, if ever the humble and obscure Englishman were united to the high-born and brilliant Italian princess, how sweet, how sweet would it be for him to owe rank and fortune to the woman whom he loved so fondly, and whom he would ever love until the hand of death should beckon him to the tomb. For myself I pant not for the honours and glories of this life, for hadst thou, Isabella, been the daughter of the lowest peasants, I had loved thee all the same, and had been far, far more contented, because the obstacles which now oppose our happiness might then have ceased to exist. "'Believe me, Richard,' answered Isabella, in a tone of witching tenderness, "'believe me that the happiest day of my life will be that when I can prove to you the extent of that affection with which you have inspired me. And again I repeat that if ever I rejoiced in the prospect of that fortune which, whether my father eventually succeed to the ducal throne or not, he will be enabled to leave me, and if ever I felt proud of that high station which my family enjoys, or indulged in the hope that my parents may one day attain to sovereign rank, that joy, that pride, that hope are all experienced on account of you. For like you, I care not for the grandeur and ostentation of palaces. But it will be a thrice happy day for me when I can say to thee, Richard, my fortune is all thine, and thou shalt share my rank. Because in Castelcicala, unlike the usages of your native land, he who espouses a princess becomes a prince. And when you shall be thus exalted, Richard, who will dare to remind you of the misfortunes of your past life? That is why I rejoice in my present rank and future prospects, a joy that is experienced solely on account of you. "'Noble-hearted girl! What kindness, what attention, what devoted love on my part can ever repay thee for these generous feelings, these endearing proofs of the tenderest attachment? "'Do you think that I should love you, Richard, as I do?' returned Isabella. "'If I did not know the generosity of your soul, if I did not appreciate all your virtues, I am well aware that unfortunately you are not rich, and yet you sacrificed, nobly sacrificed your property to release my parent from a jail. Oh, how can I ever forget that conduct of yours? You speak of repaying me for my affection. How much do I not owe to you? There was a pause in the conversation, during which the lovers walked up and down along the edge of the leafless grove, each enjoying reflections of a pleasurable nature. Isabella leant with charming confidence upon the arm of that handsome and generous-hearted young man, in whose love she gloried as if he were the prince and she were the obscure individual, and he felt his heart expand with ineffable bliss as he contemplated the brilliant prospects which that lovely girl, the proudly born princess, bred before the eyes of him the obscure individual. More than an hour and a half 
had already passed, and Isabella at length remembered that she must return home. She intimated to her lover the necessity of separating, and with fond embraces and renewed vows they parted. Richard watched her receding form until she entered the grove of evergreens surrounding her father's mansion. He then retraced his steps towards Richmond, and never was his heart so light as now. End of section 48《Section 49 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Contents of the Packet Alberto of Castelcicala, to conceal his princely rank when he arrived in England, an exile from his native shores, had adopted the style of Count Alteroni, this title being the name of an estate which he had possessed in Italy but which, together with the remainder of his vast property, had been confiscated by order of the Grand Duke, his uncle. The government of Castelcicala was an absolute despotism, and it was because the prince, with a view to ameliorate the condition of the people whom he might one day be called upon to govern, had placed himself at the head and openly avowed himself as the patron of a political party in the state whose object was to obtain a constitution. He had been proscribed by the Grand Duke and the old aristocracy of the country. His party advised him to have recourse to arms, and meetings in favour of the enlightened principles which he advocated were held at the time throughout the country. But the prince was resolved never to plunge his native land into the horrors of the civil war. He preferred exile and obscurity to such an alternative. His was, indeed, a lofty and patriotic soul that knew how to sacrifice his dearest interests to the popular tranquillity. Accordingly, on his arrival in London, he had adopted a rank comparably humble in respect to the exalted station which he, in reality, occupied, and to this mode of conduct he was instigated by the same disinterested motives that had led him to fly from his country rather than raise the standard of civil strife. He knew that if he settled in London under his proper title, he could not avoid receiving those patriotic exiles who had fled from Castelcicala to avoid the consequences of their liberal opinions. He was averse to the idea of allowing his dwelling to be made the point of reunion for those who advocated the enforcement of the popular cause by means of arms. He would not for a moment consent to permit a nucleus of open rebellion against the reigning sovereign of Castelcicala to be formed under his auspices. He had, therefore, intimated to his friends and adherents that he intended to retire into private life until circumstances might place him in a position to confer upon his native land the charter of liberties which he believed to be its natural right. The few English persons who were acquainted with his secret religiously kept it, the Tremordians, Armstrong and the Earl of Warrington, whom he numbered amongst his best friends, respected the incognito which his highness thought fit to preserve. Thus Armstrong had not even communicated the fact to Richard Markham when he introduced him to the prince's dwelling, and the reader may now understand the reasons which led the haughtiest of English peers, the Earl of Warrington, on the occasion of his visit to the mansion near Richmond, to solicit letters of introduction for Eliza Sidney, to bend his head with such profound respect in the presence of the heir presumptive to a throne. Nor need it now be made a matter of marvel if those letters of introduction proved such immediate passports for Eliza Sidney into the first society of Castelcicala. But little did he who gave them, or he who solicited them, little did they think that their ulterior effect would be to open the way for the lady to such an eminence as the one which she had attained. We have before explained, a point indeed which the intelligent reader could not fail to comprehend, that the chance of Alberto to the Castelcicalan throne now depended upon the contingency of the marriage of Angelo III producing offspring or not. Scarcely, however, had that marriage been consummated when the Minister of Foreign Affairs wrote to the Castelcicalan envoy at the court of Queen Victoria to communicate to Prince Alberto the intention of the government, sanctioned by the Grand Duke, 
to allow him a handsome income and supply him with an immediate grant by way of indemnification for the loss of his estates. No political condition of any kind being attached to this concession, the prince did not hesitate to accept it, and it was even mentioned in a Montoni newspaper that the influence of the Grand Duchess, aided by the friendly feelings of some of the new ministers towards the prince, had procured this act of justice at the hands of Angelo III. These few observations may not be deemed superfluous inasmuch as they tend to explain the real position of the Prince of Castelcicala, the father of our charming heroine. We said it was with a light heart that Richard Markham retraced his steps to Richmond, after having parted with the Princess Isabella. He was, moreover, desirous to examine the contents of the packet which she had placed in his hands, not because he cared for the money, which was thus returned to him, but because he was anxious to ascertain whether any note from her father accompanied it. He, however, restrained his curiosity until he reached Richmond, where he entered an hotel, ordered a private room, bespoke some refreshment, and then proceeded to break the seal of the envelope. Yes, there was a letter containing a cheque. The cheque fell unheeded on the carpet. The letter was immediately perused with avidity. I cannot sufficiently express my admiration of your noble and generous conduct in having liquidated the debts for which I was detained in the Queen's Bench Prison. I now repay with unfeigned and heartfelt gratitude that sum which you advanced for my necessities, in a manner so honourable to your own nature and so eminently useful to me at that period. I need not say how deeply I regret the injurious suspicions which I entertained concerning you on a certain occasion, but circumstances were too powerfully combined against you to admit of any other impression. You will forgive me, for I ask your pardon. I sincerely apologise for all I may have said or done on that occasion. And now, my dear Mr. Markham, I am compelled to touch upon a subject which, though painful, demands some observations. But you have been unfortunate. I know that you were never guilty. I am now well convinced. I have read a document which proves this. But you have inspired my daughter with an affection which I understand is reciprocal, and which can never end otherwise than in disappointment to you both. Crush, then, this sentiment in your breast, and for the peace of mind of her who is my only child, and who never, never can become your wife, I implore you not to see her more. Avoid her, as I shall instruct her to avoid you. My only motive being based on certain circumstances unknown to you, which render your union an impossibility. I address you as a friend. As a father, I write to you. Your generous heart will teach you how to respect my wishes. One more subject must not be forgotten. I am well aware that you are not as wealthy as you once were. Thank God my pecuniary means have ceased to be a subject of anxiety to me. You aided me when I was in need and in distress. Allow me to offer you a trifling assistance towards enabling you to build up your fortunes. This is an object which, with your great talents, you cannot fail to accomplish. Remember, I do not offer this small aid as an acquittal of my deep obligation towards you. No, my gratitude is intense, and the circumstances under which you befriended me leaves me ever your debtor. But as a friend, I offer you the use of my purse. As a friend, I place in your hands a sum of money which you can use during your pleasure and return to me at your convenience. Should that sum be insufficient to forward your views, hesitate not to apply to me for more. And now, farewell, at least for the present, and believe that no one will be more delighted to hear of your success in life than your very sincere friend, Alteroni. Markham picked up the cheque. It was for five thousand pounds. We must endeavour to explain the nature of the feelings which the contents of the prince's letter created within him. He saw with delight that the illustrious exile once more addressed him as a friend, and that all suspicions of his guilt had been extirpated from the mind of that nobleman. But, on the other hand, 
the barrier between himself and Isabella seemed to be rendered insuperable by the positive terms in which the prince bade him eradicate his passion from his bosom. That barrier was no doubt twofold. The father of Isabella never could consent to the union of his daughter with one whom the world had stamped with ignominy, although innocent, and chiefly the Italian prince, the probable heir to a throne, might aspire to a far higher connection for his child. Then Richard's thoughts were directed to the handsome sum of money which the prince had placed at his disposal, and he could not do otherwise than admire the delicate manner in which it was preferred a manner that scarcely admitted of a refusal. And yet Richard was resolved to return the surplus above the amount which he had dispersed to procure the prince's liberation from prison. Thus was it, with mingled feelings of joy and melancholy, that Markham reviewed the contents of that letter. Still he clung to hope, for Isabella had bade him hope, and he thought that the same good providence which had thus far reconciled him to the father of his beloved might in time accomplish more striking miracles in his favour. But alas, it must indeed be a miracle that could link his fate with the high destinies of the ducal house of Castelcicala. Isabella, instead of being the daughter of an obscure count, was the only child of one who, if he were not to become himself the sovereign of the most powerful petty state in Europe, would at all events occupy a station next only to the sovereign whenever circumstances should allow him to return to his native land. But on the other hand, Isabella was faithful and true, and what might not be expected from woman's love. In a word, Markham was rather inclined to hope than to despair, and the incidents of that morning imparted to his soul a solace which was recompense for much, very much, of past suffering. Having partaken of some refreshment, Richard returned to London and repaired to the bank where the cheque was made payable. He only drew for the amount actually due to him, and desired that the surplus might be retained in behalf of Count Alteroni, under which name the prince was known at the banker's establishment. On his return home, Richard addressed the following letter to the Italian nobleman. A thousand thanks, my dear lord, for your most kind and courteous letter. To find that you have at length become convinced that I was unfortunate and never guilty is a source of happiness the extent of which I cannot describe. Your wishes in respect to the attachment which I certainly entertain for the Signora Isabella shall be so far complied with that I will not venture to present myself at your abode. As for extinguishing that affection which burns in my heart, mortal power cannot accomplish the task. It was with unfeigned delight that I understood from your lordship's letter that your position not only enabled you to return the trifle which I once ventured to use on your behalf, but also most generously to offer me the means of building up my fallen fortunes. My lord, I am unable to profit by your kindness. The stigma under which I lie, and with tears I write these words, is a bar to any legitimate speculation with a hope of success. Moreover, I have sufficient for my wants, and am, therefore, in one sense rich. Excuse me if I have not availed myself of your noble offer, an offer that scarcely admits of refusal in consequence of the delicacy and kindness with which it was made. Nevertheless, I am bound to decline it with the most sincere gratitude, at the same time observing that should need ever press me, I shall not hesitate to have recourse to the friendship with which you honour me, in the earnest hope that happiness and health may attend upon yourself and amiable family. I remain, my dear Lord, your most grateful and faithful servant, Richard Markham. It will be seen that the tone of this letter was somewhat constrained, but although Richard endeavoured to write with apparent ease, as if ignorant of his correspondent's real rank, he could not forget that he was addressing himself to the Prince of Castelcicala. End of section 49this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treasure 
a new idea. Alas, that we should be compelled to turn from such bright scenes as woman's love and lover's hope to deeds of infamy and crime. But so goes the world, and no faithful historian can venture to deviate from the rule. Sad and dismal and dark are many of the phases which this narrative has yet to show, but we can also promise our reader that there will not be wanting bright and cheering scenes to afford relief to his eye. Checkered indeed are the ways of life, varied and diversified are all its paths. And though let him who is wearied with the load of existence, while wending through the rough and craggy places of the world, and when rudely jostled by the world's unfeeling crowd, let him remember that there is another sphere beyond, where the ways are smooth and pleasant, and where the voice of lamentation is never heard. A sphere where angels alone shall be the guides of the elect, and where the sound of grateful harmony shall never cease. A sphere whose name is heaven. Again we say, alas, that we should be compelled to divert the attention of our reader from scenes of mundane bliss and the contemplation of the purest love to deeds of iniquity and hatred. But to our task. It was about five o'clock in the evening of the day that witnessed the incidents of the two preceding chapters, and that had succeeded the night on which the unhappy Viola had signed a deed surrendering up half her property to her unprincipled husband, that the resurrection man returned home to his dwelling in Globetown. But before he ascended to the apartments inhabited by himself and his mistress with a fearful name, he entered the lower part of the building and having lighted a candle, descended to the subterranean vaults. In the first place he went into a cell opposite to that which was still tenanted by Viola, who, it will be remembered, had received a solemn promise to be restored to her own abode that evening at nine o'clock. The resurrection man entered the cell to which we have alluded, and which was empty. He raised a stone from the floor, and drew from the hole of about a foot deep a large leather bag, the contents of which sent forth the welcome metallic sound of gold as he took it in his hand. The miscreant seated himself upon the cold floor of the cell and poured forth into his hat the glittering contents of the bag. His eyes sparkled with delight as he surveyed the treasure. He took a few of the coins up in his hand and let them drop one by one back again into his hat. His glances greedily fixed upon the gold as he thus toyed with it. Two hundred good sterling sovereigns here already, he mused within himself. Two hundred pounds, earned with toil, trouble, daring, and danger. Two hundred pounds are a decent provision for any man in my line of life. And now, he continued, taking a smaller canvas bag from his pocket, there is more to add to swell the treasury. Here is a hundred pounds. My half of the sum paid by Tomlinson this afternoon for keeping the secret about his old clerk. The buffer has got his share, but I warrant he will hoard none of it as I do. Thank my stars, within the last year I have learnt to be economical and saving. I mean to have something for my old age, unless... And his countenance suddenly assumed an expression perfectly hideous, as he reflected upon the probability of his career being cut short by the hand of the law. But in another moment he grew composed, that is to say, desperately hardened, and he then proceeded with his occupation and his musings. Well, here is my share of the two hundred pounds that the chicken-hearted, contemptible, cowardly Tomlinson paid for a secret, which, a little calm reflection, might have told him that I dared not reveal. That's a hundred pounds to add to my sinking fund. And here the miscreant smiled. Now, he continued, comes the grand swag. Three hundred pounds from Chichester, and not too much for the trouble I have had in his affair. Two hundred before, Tomlinson's hundred, and Chichester's three hundred, that makes six hundred pounds of good sterling gold, the property of Mr. Antony Titkins. <laughs> 
It was a horrible chuckle, the triumph of a miscreant of a most atrocious nature. But he was happy, happy after his own fashion, happy in counting and contemplating the produce of his turpitude. While he was consigning his wealth to the larger bag and gloating over the gold as he passed it through his hand, he was suddenly alarmed by a slight sound in the passage. It seemed like a low footstep. He listened, but it was not repeated. For nearly a minute did he remain motionless and almost breathless in a state of painful attention, but not another sound met his ear. Then, recovering from the state of uneasy suspense into which that incident had thrown him, he rose from the floor and hurried into the passage which divided the two rows of cells. All was quiet. Ashamed of himself for his childish alarm, and stuttering a curse at his folly for having given way to that fear, he returned into the cell, buried his treasure, and covered the place with a stone. He then carefully locked the door of the dungeon. He crossed the passage and proceeded gently to open the door leading into the cell occupied by Viola. When he entered this vault he found the lamp extinguished, but by the glare of his candle he perceived the unhappy woman stretched in a profound slumber upon the bed. All right, he muttered to himself, and just as I expected. Uh, she will sleep some hours yet, for well, the wine was well drugged, and thus we can convey her back again to her house in a state of insensibility. When she awakes in her own bed, her servants will assure her that all she has passed through was a mere dream, <laughs> and by this plan she will be so bewildered that she will actually fancy she had been delirious, <laughs> and that her brain has wandered. This was Chichester's suggestion, and I must give him credit for it. True, she will sooner or later discover that the departure of half her property is no dream, but then the first burst of passion will have gone by, and she will consider it prudent to hold her tongue. Well, let her sleep. At nine o'clock Chichester and Tomlinson will come, and then she shall be removed. At that instant an idea struck the resurrection man. Hitherto he had worked as Chichester's agent, and by Chichester's direction, in this affair. What if he were to turn the business to some good account for himself? The lady had only parted with half her property. She had eight thousand pounds left. Might not all, or a decent portion of this sum thus remaining, pass into the hands of the resurrection man? His mode of treatment had excited the first concession. Some additional horrors might extort a further grant. The idea was excellent, fool that he was for not having thought of it before. Thus reasoned Antony Tidkins. The more he thought of the new plot which had just entered his head, the more he grew enamoured of it. He was well aware that neither Chichester nor Tomlinson would dare to adopt measures to resist his will and with a grin of savage delight he exclaimed aloud, By God, it shall be done! He then removed the bottle of wine from the cell, so that when Viola awoke she might not repeat her dose, supposing that she should be ignorant of the cause of her long lethargic slumber, for the resurrection man was not aware of the sudden effect which it had produced upon her, but imagined that the drug liquid was only powerful enough to operate gradually. He next replenished the lamp with oil from a bottle which stood in one corner of the cell, and having lighted the lamp, withdrew, carefully bolting and locking the door behind him. He ascended from the subterranean prison, replaced the stone trap door, and issued from the ground floor of the house. He observed that the door leading into the alley was locked as he had left it when he entered, and this circumstance reassured him relative to the little incidents which had temporarily disturbed him when counting his money in the cell. Many circumstances combined to put the resurrection man into an excellent humour. He had, that day, added four hundred pounds to his hidden treasure. He saw business of all kinds a multiplying upon his hands and promising a golden harvest, and he had hit upon a scheme which he had no doubt would produce him a larger sum than he had ever yet realised even in his dreams. It was, therefore, with a smiling countenance that he entered the upstairs room where the rattlesnake was busily employed in spreading the contents of her cupboard upon the table. "'Well, mate, you see, I am home before my time!' he exclaimed. 
I don't want any dinner. I took some at a chop house in town, as I had to wait on business. But leave the lush, I am in a humour for a glass of grog, and you and I, Meg, will sit down and have a cosy chat together. So we will, Tony, returned the woman, with a manner even more wheedling and fawning than she had ever before used towards her terrible paramour. You seem in excellent spirits, Tony. Yes, Meg, excellent. I have done a good day's work, and now I will enjoy myself till nine o'clock, when I have got to go and meet two gentlemen close by here on another little matter. Oh, you seldom tell me what you're doing, Tony, said the rattlesnake. No, no, I don't like trusting women a bit farther than I can see them. Such things as getting up a body or so are well and good. But serious things, Meg, serious things, never. Well, just as you like, returned Margaret Flathers, affecting a smile as if she were quite satisfied. But as she turned to replace the meat in the cupboard, her countenance involuntarily assumed an expression of mysterious triumph. Come now, sit down, said the resurrection man. Give me a pipe and brew me my lush. There, that's a good girl. Tidkins lighted his pipe and smoked for some moments in silence. "'I'll tell you what, Meg,' he exclaimed after a pause. "'You shall sing me a song. "'I feel in such an uncommon good humour this evening, in such excellent spirits. "'Now, I won't have a song. "'I tell you what you shall do.' "'What?' said Margaret as she mixed two glasses of gin and water. "'You shall tell me all about the coal mines. "'You know, your own history.' "'You told it me once before, but then I wasn't in a humour to hear you. "'I missed half, and then forgot t'other half. "'So now, come, let's have the life and adventures of Miss Margaret Flathers.' "'The Resurrection Man laughed at this joke, as he considered it and meant it to be, "'and the Rattlesnake, who never dared to thwart him in anything, "'and who apparently had some additional motive to humour him on this occasion, "'hastened to comply with his request, or rather command. She accordingly related her history, the phraseology of which we have taken the liberty materially to correct and amend in the following manner. End of section 50section 51 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills. THE RATTLESNAKE'S HISTORY PART One. In case the reader should doubt the accuracy of any of the statements relative to the employment of the youth of both sexes in the English coal-mines which he may find in this chapter, we beg to refer him to the report and appendix to the report of the Children's Employment Commission, presented to both Houses of Parliament by command of Her Majesty in 1842. I was born in a coal-mine in Staffordshire. My father was a married man, with five or six children by his wife. My mother was a single woman who worked for him in the pit. I was, therefore, illegitimate. But this circumstance was neither considered disgraceful to my mother nor to myself, morality being on so low a scale amongst the mining population generally as almost to amount to promiscuous intercourse. My mother was only eighteen when I was born. She worked in the pit up to the very hour of my birth, and when she found the labour pains coming on, she threw off the belt and chain with which she had been dragging a heavy corf or wicker basket full of coal up a slanting road, retired to a damp cave in a narrow passage leading to the foot of the shaft, and there gave birth to her child. That child was myself. She wrapped me up in her petticoat, which was all the clothing she had on at the time, and crawled with me along the passage, which was about two feet and a half high, to the bottom of the shaft. There she got into the basket, and was drawn up a height of about two hundred and thirty feet, holding the rope with her right hand and supporting me on her left arm. She often told me those particulars, and said how she thought she would faint as she was ascending in the rickety vehicle, and how difficult she found it to maintain her hold of the rope, weak and enfeebled as she was. 
She, however, reached the top in safety and hastened home to her miserable hovel, for she was an orphan and lived by herself. In a week she was up again and back to her work in the pit, and she hired a bit of a girl, about seven or eight years old, to take care of me. How my infancy passed, I, of course, can only form an idea by the mode of treatment generally adopted towards babies in the mining districts, and under such circumstances as those connected with my birth. My mother would perhaps come up from the pit once in the middle of the day to give me my natural nourishment, and when I screamed during her absence, the little girl who acted as my nurse most probably thrust a teaspoonful of some strong opiate down my throat to make me sleep and keep me quiet. Many children are killed by this treatment, but the reason of death in such cases is seldom known, because the coroner's assistance is seldom required in the mining districts. When I was seven years old, my mother one day told me that it was now high time for me to go down with her into the pit and earn some money by my own labour. My father, who now and then called to see me of a Sunday and brought me a cake or a toy, also declared that I was old enough to help my mother. So it was decided that I should go down into the pit. I remember that I was very much frightened at the idea, and cried very bitterly when the dreaded day came. It was a cold winter's morning. I recollect that well, and the snow was very thick upon the ground. I shivered with chilliness and terror as my mother led me to the pit. She gave me a good scolding because I whimpered, and then a good beating because I cried lustily. But everything combined to make me afraid. It was as early as five on that cold, wintry morning that I was proceeding to a scene of labour which I knew to be far, far under the earth. The dense darkness of the hour was not even relieved by the white snow upon the ground, but over the country were seen blazing fires on every side, fires which appeared to me to be issuing from the very bowels of the earth, but which were in reality burning upon the surface for the purpose of converting coke into coal, and there were also blazing fields of bituminous shale, and all the tall chimneys of the great towers of the iron furnaces vomited forth flames, the whole scene thus forming a picture well calculated to appall and startle an infant mind. I remember at this moment what my feelings were then, as well as if the incident I am relating had only occurred yesterday. During the daylight I had seen the lofty chimneys giving vent to columns of dense smoke, the furnaces putting forth torrents of lurid flame, and the coke fires burning upon the ground. But that was the first time I had ever beheld those meteors blazing amongst utter darkness, and I was afraid. I was afraid. The shaft was perfectly round, and not more than four feet in diameter. The mode of ascent and descent was precisely that of a well, with this difference, that instead of a bucket there was a stout iron bar, about three feet long, attached in the middle, and suspended horizontally, to the end of the rope. From each end of this bar hung chains with hooks, to draw up the baskets of coal. This apparatus was called the clatch harness. Two people ascended or descended at a time by these means. They had to sit cross-legged, as it were, upon the transverse bar and cling to the rope. Thus, the person who got on first sat upon the bar, and the other person sat a straddle on the first one's thighs. An old woman presided at the wheel which wound up or lowered the rope sustaining the clutch harness, and as she was by no means adverse to a dram, the lives of the persons employed in the mine were constantly at the mercy of that old drunken harridan. Moreover, there seemed to me to be a great danger in the way in which the miners got on and off the clutch harness. One moment's giddiness, a missing of the hold of the rope, and down to the bottom of the shaft headlong. When the clutch harness was drawn up to the top, the old woman made the handle fast by a bolt drawn out from the upright post, and then, grasping a hand of both persons on the harness at the same time, brought them by main force to land. A false step on the part of that old woman, the failure of the bolt which stopped the rotary motion of the roller on which the rope was wound, or the slipping of the hands which she grasped in hers, and a terrible accident must have ensued. 
but to return to my first descent into the pit. My mother, who was dressed in a loose jacket open in front, and trousers, which besides her shoes were the only articles of clothing on her, she wearing neither underwear nor stockings, leapt upon the clutch iron as nimbly as a sailor in the rigging of his ship. She then received me from the outstretched arm of the old woman, and made me sit in the easiest and safest posture she could imagine. But when I found myself being gradually lowered down in a depth as black as night, I felt too terror-struck even to cry out, and had not my mother held me tight with one hand, I should have fallen precipitately into that hideous dark profundity. At length we reached the bottom, where my mother lifted me, half dead with giddiness and fright, from the clutch iron. I felt the soil, cold, damp, and muddy under my feet. A lamp was burning in a shade, suspended in a little recess in the side of the shaft, and my mother lighted a bit of candle which she had brought with her, and which she stuck into a piece of clay to hold it. Then I perceived a long dark passage, about two feet and a half high, branching off from the foot of the shaft. My mother went on her hands and knees and told me to creep along with her. The passage was nearly six feet wide, and thus there was plenty of room for me to keep abreast of her. Had not this been the case, I am sure that I never should have had the courage either to proceed or follow her, for nothing could be more hideous to my infantile imagination than that low, yawning, black-mouthed cavern running into the very bowels of the earth, and leading I knew not whither. Indeed, as I walked in a painfully stooping posture along by my mother's side, my fancy conjured up all kinds of horrors. I trembled lest some invisible hand should suddenly push forth from the side of the passage and clutch me in its grasp. I dreaded lest every step I took might precipitate me into some tremendous abyss or deep well. I thought that the echoes which I heard afar off, and which were the sounds of the miner's pickaxe or the rolling corves on the rails, were terrific warnings that the earth was falling in and would bury us alive. Then, when the light of my mother's candle suddenly fell upon some human being groping his or her way along in darkness, I shuddered at the idea of encountering some ferocious monster or hideous spectre. In a word, my feelings as I toiled along that subterranean passage were of so terrific a nature that they produced upon my memory an impression which never can be effaced and which makes me turn cold all over as I contemplate those feelings now. You must remember that I had been reared in a complete state of mental darkness, and that no enlightened instruction had dispelled the clouds of superstition which naturally obscure the juvenile mind. I could not read. I had not even been taught my alphabet. I had not heard of such a name as Jesus Christ, and all the mention of God that had ever met my ears was in the curses and execrations which fell from the lips of my father, my mother, her acquaintances, and even the little girl who had nursed me. You cannot wonder, then, if I was appalled when I first found myself in that strange and terrifying place. At length we reached the end of the passage and struck into another, which echoed with the noise of pickaxes. In a few moments I saw the undergoers, or miners, lying on their sides, and with their pickaxes breaking away the coal. They did not work to a greater height than two feet, for fear, as I subsequently learnt, that they should endanger the security of the roof of the passage, the seam of coal not being a thick one. I well remember my infantile alarm and horror when I perceived that these men were naked, stark naked but my mother did not seem to be the least abashed or dismayed. On the contrary, she laughed and exchanged a joke with each one as we passed. In fact, I afterwards discovered that Bet Flathers was a great favourite with the miners. Well, we went on until we suddenly came upon a scene that astonished me not a little. The passage abruptly opened into a large room, an immense cave hollowed out of the coal in a seam that I since learnt to be twenty feet in thickness. This cave was lighted by a great number of candles, and at a table sat about twenty individuals, men, women, and children, all at breakfast. There they were, as black as negroes, eating, laughing, chattering, and drinking. But to my surprise and disgust, I saw that the women and young girls were all naked from the waist upwards, and many of the men completely so. 
and yet there was no shame, no embarrassment. But the language that soon met my ears, I could not comprehend half of it, but what I did understand made me afraid. My mother caught me by the hand and led me to the table, where I found my father. He gave us some breakfast, and in a short time the party broke up, the men, women and children separating to their respective places of labour. My mother and myself accompanied one of the men, for my mother had ceased to work for my father since she had borne a child to him, and as his wife had insisted upon their separation in respect to labour in the mine. The name of the man for whom my mother worked was Phil Blossom. He was married, but had no children. His wife was a cripple, having met with some accident in the mine, and could not work. He was therefore obliged to employ someone to carry his coal from the place where he waned to the cart that conveyed it to the foot of the shaft. Until I went down the mine, my mother had carried the coal for him, and also hurried or dragged the cart but she now made me fill one cart while she hurried another. Thus, at seven years old, I had to carry about fifty-six pounds of coal in a wooden bucket. When the passage was high enough, I carried it on my back, but when it was too low, I had to drag or push it along as best I could. Some parts of the passages were only twenty-two inches in height. This was where the workings were in very narrow seams, and the difficulty of dragging such a weight at such an age can be better understood than explained. I can well recollect that when I commenced that terrible labour, the perspiration, co-mingling with my tears, poured down my face. Phil Blossom worked in a complete state of nudity, and my mother stripped herself to the waist to perform her task. She had to drag a cart holding seven hundred weight, a distance of at least two hundred yards, for ours was a very extensive pit, and had numerous workings and cuttings running a considerable way underground. The person who does this duty is called a hurrier. The process itself is termed tramming, and the cart is denominated a ship. The work was certainly harder than that of slaves in the West Indies or convicts in Norfolk Island. My mother had a girdle round her waist, and to that girdle was fastened a chain, which passed between her legs and was attached to the skip. She then had to go down on her hands and knees, with a candle fastened to a strap on her forehead, and drag the skip through the low passages, or else to maintain a curved or stooping posture in the high ones. Phil Blossom was what was called a getter. He first made a long straight cut with a pickaxe underneath the part of the seam where he was working. This was called holing, and as it was commenced low down, the getter was obliged to lie flat on his back or on his side and work for a long time in that uneasy manner. I did as well as I could with the labour allotted to me, but it was dreadful work. I was constantly knocking my head against the low roofs of the passages or against the rough places of the sides. At other times I fell flat on my face with the masses of coal upon me, or else I got knocked down by a cart or by some collier in the dark. As I toiled along the passages, my eyes blinded with my tears or with the dust of the mine. Many, many weeks passed away, and at length I grew quite hardened in respect to those sights and that language which had at first disgusted me. I became familiar with the constant presence of naked men and half-naked women, and the most terrible oaths and filthy expressions ceased to startle me. I walked boldly into the great cavern which I have before described, and which served as a meeting-place for those who took their meals in the mine. I associated with the boys and girls that worked in the pit, and learned to laugh at an obscene joke, or to practice petty thefts of candles, food, or even drink which the colliers left in the cavern, or at their places of work. The mere fact of the boys and girls in mines all meeting together, without any control, without anyone to look after them, is calculated to corrupt all those who may well be disposed. I remained as a carrier of coal along the passages till I was ten years old. I was then ordered to convey my load, which by this time amounted to a hundredweight on each occasion, up a ladder to a passage over where I had hitherto worked. This load was strapped by a leather round my forehead, and as the ladder was very rudely formed, and the steps were nearly two feet apart, 
it was with great difficulty that I could keep my balance. I have seen terrible accidents happen to young girls working in that way. Sometimes the strap or tag round one person's forehead has broken, and the whole load has fallen on the girl climbing up behind. Then the latter has been precipitated to the bottom of the dike, the great masses of coal falling on top of her. On other occasions I have seen the girls lose their balance and fall off the ladder, their burden of coals, as in the other case, showering upon them or their companions behind. The work was indeed most horrible. A slave ship could not have been worse. If I did not do exactly as Phil Blossom told me, the treatment I received from him was horrible, and my mother did not dare interfere, or he would serve her in the same manner. He thrashed me with his fist or with a stick until I was bruised all over. My flesh was often marked with deep wheels for weeks together. One day he nipped me with his nails until he actually cut quite through my ear. He often pulled my hair till it literally gave way in his hand, and sometimes he would pelt me with coals. He thought nothing of giving me a kick that would send me with great violence across the passage, or dash me against the opposite side. On one occasion he was in such a rage, because I had accidentally put out the candle which he had to light him at his work, that he struck a random blow at me with his pickaxe in the dark, and cut a great gash in my head. All the miners in pits baste and bray, that is, beat and flog their helpers. You would be surprised if I was to tell you how many people in the pit were either killed or severely injured by accidents every year. But there are so many dangers to which the poor miners are exposed, falling down the shaft, the rope sustaining the clutch harness breaking, being drawn over the roller, the falls of coals out of the corves in their ascent, drowning in the mines from the sudden breaking in of water from old workings, explosions of gas, choke damp. Author's note. Explosions of carbonated hydrogen gas, which is usually called by the miners sulphur, sometimes prove very destructive, not only by scorching to death, but by the suffocation of foul air after the explosion is over, and also by the violence by which persons are driven before it, or are smothered by the ruins thrown down upon them. Appendix to First Report End of Author's Note Falling in of the roofs or passages the breaking of ladders or well staircases, being run over by the tram wagons or carts dragged by horses, the explosion of gunpowder used in breaking away huge masses of coal and several other minor accidents are all perpetually menacing the life or limbs of those poor creatures who supply the mineral that cheers so many thousands of firesides. Deaths from accidents of this nature were seldom, if ever, brought under the notice of the coroner. Indeed, to save time, it was usual to bury the poor victims within twenty-four or thirty-six hours after their decease. I earned three shillings a week when I was ten years old, and my mother eleven. You may imagine, then, that we ought to have been pretty comfortable, but our household was just as wretched as any other in the mining districts. Filth and poverty are the characteristics of the Collier population. Nothing can be more wretched, nothing more miserable than their dwellings. The huts in which they live are generally from ten to twelve feet square, each consisting only of one room. I have seen a man and his wife and eight or ten children all huddling together in that one room, and yet they might have earned by their joint labour thirty shillings or more a week. Perhaps a pig, a jackass, or fowls form part of the family. And then the furniture. Not a comfort, scarcely a necessity. And yet this absence of even such articles as bedsteads is upon principle. The colliers do not like to be encumbered with household goods because they are often obliged to flit. That is, to leave one place of work and seek for another. Such a thing as drainage is almost completely unknown in these districts, and all the filth is permitted to accumulate before the door. The colliers are a dirty set of people, but, poor creatures, how can they well be otherwise? They descend into the mines at a very early hour in the morning. They return home at a very late hour in the evening, and then they are too tired to attend to habits of cleanliness. 
Besides, it is so natural for them to say, Why should we wash ourselves tonight, since tomorrow we must come back black and dirty again? Or, Why should we wash ourselves just for the sake of sleeping with a clean skin? As for the boys and girls, they are often so worn out, so thoroughly exhausted, that they go to rest without their suppers. They cannot keep themselves awake when they get home. I know that this was often and often my case, and I have preferred, indeed, I have been compelled by sheer fatigue to go to bed before my mother could prepare anything to eat. Again, how can the collier's home possibly be comfortable? He makes his wife and children toil with him in the mine. He married a woman from the mine, and neither she nor her daughters know anything of housekeeping. How can disorder be prevented from creeping into the collier's dwelling when no one is there in the daytime to attend to it? Then all the money which they can save from the tommy shop, of which I shall speak presently, goes for whisky. Husband and wife, sons and daughters, all look after the whisky. The habits of the colliers are hereditarily depraved. They are perpetuated from father to son, from mother to daughter, None is better nor worse than his parents were before him. Rags and filth, squalor and dissipation, crushing toil and hideous want, ignorance and immorality, these are the features of the collier's home and the characteristics of the collier's life. Our home was not a whit better than that of any of our fellow labourers, nor was my mother less attached to whisky than her neighbours. But... The chief source of poverty and frequent want, amounting at times almost to starvation, amongst persons earning a sufficiency of wages, is the truck system. This atrociously oppressive method consists of paying the collier's wages in goods or partly in goods through the medium of the tommy shop. The proprietor of a tommy shop has an understanding with the owners of the mines in his district and the owners agreed to pay the persons in their employment once a month or once a fortnight. The consequence is that the miners require credit during the interval, and they are compelled to go to the tommy shop, where they eat, obtain their bread, bacon, cheese, meat, groceries, potatoes, chandlery, and even clothes. The proprietor of the tommy shop sends his book to the clerk of the owner of the mine the day before the wages are paid and thus the clerk knows how much to stop from the wages of each individual, for the benefit of the shopkeeper. If the miners and their wives do not go to the tommy shop for their domestic articles, they instantly lose their employment to the mine, in consequence of the understanding between their employer and the shopkeeper. Perhaps this would not be so bad if the tommy shops were honest because it is very handy for a collier to go to a store which contains every article that he may require. But the tommy shop charges 25 or 30 per cent dearer than any other tradesman, so that if a collier and his family can earn between them 30 shillings a week, he loses 7 or 8 shillings out of that amount. In the course of a year, about 20 pounds out of his 75 go to the tommy shop for nothing but interest on the credit afforded. That interest is divided between the tommy shopkeeper and the coal mine proprietor. In the district where my mother and I lived, there was no such thing at all as payment of wages in the current money of the kingdom. The tommy shopkeeper paid the wages for the proprietors once a month. And how do you think he settled them? In ticket money. This coinage consisted of pewter medals or markers with the sum that they represented and the name of the tommy shop on them. Thus there were half-crowns, shillings, sixpences and half-pence. But this money could only be passed at the tommy shop from which it was issued, and there it must be taken out in goods. So you see that what with the truck system and the tommy shop, the poor miners are regularly swindled out of at least one-fourth part of their fair earnings. The wages in my time were subject to great changes. I have known men earn 25 shillings a week at one time and 12 or 15 at another, and out of that they were obliged to supply their own candles and grease for the wheels of the carts or trams. The cost of this was about three pence a day. Then again the fines were frequent and vexatious. 
it was calculated that they amounted to a penny a day per head. These sums all went into the coffers of the coal owners. Such was the state of superstitious ignorance which prevailed in the mines that every one believed in ghosts and spirits. Even old men were often afraid to work in isolated places, and the spots where deaths from accident arose were particularly avoided. It was stated that the spectres of the deceased haunted the scenes of their violent departures from this world. End of section 51section fifty two of the mysteries of london volume one part two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dave wills the rattlesnake's history part two by the time i was twelve years old i was as wild a young she-devil as any in the mines like the other females i worked with only a pair of trousers on but I would not consent to hurry the trams and skips. I saw that my mother had got a great bald place on her head, where she pushed the tram forward up sloping passages, and as I was told that even amidst the black and filth with which I was encrusted I was a good-looking wench, I determined not to injure my hair. I may as well observe that a stranger visiting a mine and seeing the boys and girls all huddling together, half naked, in the caves or obscure nooks, could not possibly tell one sex from the other. I must say that I think, with regard to bad language and licentious conduct, the girls were far, far worse than the boys. It is true that in the neighbourhood of the pits Sunday schools were established, but very few parents availed themselves of these means of obtaining a gratuitous education for their children. When I was twelve years old, I did not know how to read or write. I was unaware that there was such a book as the Bible, and all I knew of God and Jesus Christ was through the oaths and imprecations of the miners. It was at that period, I mean when I was twelve years old, that I determined to abandon the horrible life to which my mother had devoted me. I had up to that point preserved my health, and had escaped those maladies and cutaneous eruptions to which miners are liable. But I knew that my turn must come, sooner or later, to undergo all those afflictions. I saw nine out of ten of my fellow labourers fading away. Some were covered with disgusting boils caused by the constant dripping of water upon their naked flesh in the pit. I saw young persons of my own age literally growing old in their early youth, stooping, asthmatic, consumptive, and enfeebled. When they were washed on Sundays, they were the pictures of ill health and premature decay. Many actually grew deformed in stature, and all were of a stunted growth. It is true that their muscles were singularly developed, but they were otherwise skin and bone. Author's Note Amongst the children and young persons I remarked that some of the muscles were developed to a degree amounting to a deformity. For example, the muscles of the back and loins stood from the body and appeared almost like a rope passing under the skin. Report End of author's note The young children were, for the most part, of contracted features, which, added to their wasted forms, gave them a strange appearance of ghastliness when cleansed from the filth of the mine. The holers or excavators were bow-legged and crooked, the burners and trammers knock-kneed and high-shouldered. Many, very many, of the miners were affected with diseases of the heart. Then, whoever saw a person employed in the pits live to an advanced age? A miner of fifty-five was a curiosity. The poor creatures generally drooped at five-and-thirty and died off by forty. They invariably seemed oppressed with care and anxiety. Jollity was unknown amongst them. I have seen jolly-looking butchers, blacksmiths, carpenters, ploughmen, porters, and so on, but I never beheld a jolly-looking miner. The entire population that labours in the pits appears to belong to a race that is accursed. I pondered seriously upon all this and every scene around me tended to strengthen my resolution to quit an employment worse than that of a galley-slave. 
I saw my mother wasting all her best energies in that terrible labour, and yet remaining poor, beggared, scarcely enough for the present, not a hope for the future. Sometimes I wept when I contemplated her. Although she had but little claims on my sympathy or affection, nevertheless, when I saw her bald head, her scalp thickened, inflamed, and sometimes so swollen that it was like a bulb filled with spongy matter, and so painful that she could not bear to touch it, when I heard her complain of the dreadful labour of pushing the heavy curves and trains with her sore head, when I perceived her spine actually distorted with severe work, her stomach growing so weak that she frequently vomited her food as soon as it was eaten, her heart so seriously affected that the intervals of violent palpitation frequently made her faint, her lungs performing their functions with difficulty, her chest torn with a sharp hacking cough, accompanied by the expectoration of a large quantity of matter of a deep black colour, called by colliers the black spit. When I saw her thus overwhelmed with a complication of maladies, dying before my eyes at the age of thirty-three, when I looked around and beheld nine out of ten of all the persons employed in the pits, whether male or female, similarly affected, I shuddered at the bare idea of devoting my youth to that horrible toil, and then passing to the grave while yet in the prime of life. I thought of running away and seeking my fortune elsewhere. I knew that it was no use to acquaint my mother with my distaste for the life to which she had devoted me. She would only have answered my objections by means of blows. But while I was still wavering what course to pursue, a circumstance occurred which I must not forget to relate. One morning my candle had accidentally gone out and I was creeping along the dark passage to the spot where Phil Blossom was working to obtain a light from his candle, when I heard him and my mother conversing together in a low tone, but with great earnestness of manner. Curiosity prompted me to stop and listen. "'Are you sure that is the case?' said Phil. "'Certain,' replied my mother. "'I shall be confined in about five months.' "'Well,' observed Phil, "'I don't know what's to be done.' my old woman will kick up the devil's delight when she hears of it. I wish she was out of the way. I would marry you if she was. Then there was a profound silence for some minutes. It was broken by the man who said, yes, if the old woman was out of the way, you and I might get married, and then we should live so comfortable together. I'm sure no man can be cursed with a wife of worse temper than mine. Yes, returned my mother, she is horrible for that. Do you think there would be much harm in pushing her down a shaft or shoving her head under the wheel of your tram, Bet? asked Phil, after a pause. There would be no harm, said my mother, if so be we weren't found out. That's exactly what I mean, observed Phil. But then, continued my mother, if she didn't happen to die at once, she might peach and get us both into a scrape. So she might, said Phil. I'll tell you what we might do, exclaimed my mother in a joyful tone. "'Doesn't your wife come down at one to bring you your dinner?' "'Yes,' replied Phil Blossom. "'That's all the old cripple is good for.' "'Well, then,' pursued my mother, "'I'll tell you how we can manage this business.' Then they began to whisper, and I could not gather another word that fell from their lips. I was so frightened at what I had heard that I crept quickly but cautiously back again to my place of labour, and sat down on the lower steps of the ladder, in the dark, determined to wait till someone should come by, rather than go and ask Phil Blossom for a light. I had suddenly acquired a perfect horror of that man. I had understood that my mother was with child by him, and I had heard them coolly plotting the death of the woman who was an obstacle to their marriage. At my age such an idea was calculated to inspire me with terror. I think I sat for nearly an hour in the dark, my mind filled with thoughts of a nature which may well be understood. At length a young woman, bearing a cough, came with a light, and I was no longer left in obscurity. I then plucked up my courage, took my basket, and went to Phil Blossom for a load of coal. My mother was not there, and he was working with his pickaxe as coolly as possible. He asked me what had made me so long in returning for a load. 
and I told him I had fallen down a few steps of the ladder and hurt myself. He said no more on the subject, and I was delighted to escape without a braying or basting. While I was loading my corf, he asked me if I should like to have him for a father-in-law. I said yes, through fear, for I was always afraid of his knees, as the colliers call their clenched fists. He seemed pleased, and after a pause said that if ever he was my father-in-law, I should always take my bait or meals with him in the cavern. I thanked him and went on with my work, but I pretty well comprehended that the removal of Phil's wife, by some means or other, had been resolved on. Shortly before one o'clock that same day, my mother came to the place where I was carrying the coals, and gave me a butter cake, as we called bread and butter, telling me that she was going up out of the mine, as she must pay a visit to the tommy shop for some candles and grease for herself, and some tobacco for Phil Blossom. I did not dare utter a word expressive of the suspicions which I entertained, but I felt convinced that this proceeding was in some way connected with the subject of the conversation which I had overheard. A strange presentiment induced me to leave my place of work and creep along the passage to the foot of the shaft in order to see whether Phil's wife would come down at the usual time with his bait. Several half-marrows and foals, as we called the young lads who pushed the trams, were at the end of the passage, just at the foot of the shaft, and we got into conversation. It is a very curious thing to look up a shaft from the very bottom. The top seems no bigger than a sugar basin. Well, the boys and I were chattering together about different things, when the click of the clutch harness at the top of the shaft fell upon my ears. I peeped up and saw someone get on the clutch. Then the creaking of the wheel and the roller was heard. "'Here comes someone's bait, I dare say,' observed one of the half-marrows. "'I wish it was mine,' said another, "'but I never get anything to eat from breakfast time till I go home at night.' Scarcely were these words spoken when a piercing scream alarmed us. There was a whirling sound. The chains of the harnesses clanked fearfully, and down came a woman with tremendous violence to the bottom of the pit the clatch rattling down immediately after her. A cry of horror burst from us all. The poor creature had fallen at our very feet. We rushed forward, but she never moved. The back part of her head was smashed against a piece of hard mineral at the bottom of the shaft. But her countenance had escaped injury, and as I cast a hasty glance upon it, I recognised the well-known face of Phil Blossom's crippled wife. One of the boys instantly hastened to acquaint him with the accident. He came to the spot where his wife lay, a mangled heap, stone dead, and he began to bewail his loss in terms which would have been moving had I not been aware of their hypocrisy. The half-marrows were, however, deceived by that well-feigned grief, and did all they could to console him. I said nothing. I was confounded. In due time the cause of the accident was ascertained. It appeared that my mother had gone up the shaft, but when she got to the top she struck her foot so forcibly against the upright post of the machinery that she lamed herself for the time. The old woman who presided over the machinery, as I have before said, very kindly offered to go to the tommy shop for her, on condition that she would remain there to work the handle for people coming up or going down. This was agreed to. The very first person who wanted to go down was Mrs. Blossom, and my mother alleged that the handle unfortunately slipped out of her hand as she was unwinding the rope. This explanation satisfied the overseer of the mine. The intervention of the coroner was not deemed necessary. My mother appeared much afflicted at the accident. Phil Blossom mourned the death of his wife with admirable hypocrisy. The corpse was interred within forty-eight hours and thus was Phil's wife removed without a suspicion being excited. I was now more than ever determined to leave the mine. I saw that my mother was capable of anything, and I trembled lest she should take it into her head to rid herself of me. One day she told me that she was going to be married to Phil Blossom. I made a remark upon the singularity of her being united to the very man whose wife had died by her means. She darted at me a look of dark suspicion and terrible ferocity, and in the next moment struck me to the ground. 
from that instant I felt convinced that I was not safe. Accordingly, one Sunday, when I was washed quite clean and had on a tolerably decent frock, I left the hovel which my mother occupied and set out on my wanderings. I had not a penny in my pocket, nor a friend on the face of the earth to whom I could apply for advice, protection, or assistance. All that stood between me and starvation that I could see was a piece of bread and some cheese which I had taken with me when I left home. I walked as far as I could without stopping, and must have been about six miles from the pit where I had worked when evening came on. It was November, and the weather was very chilly. I looked around me almost in despair to see if I could discover an asylum for the night. Far behind me the tremendous chimneys and furnaces vomited forth flames and volumes of smoke, and the horizon shone as if a whole city was on fire. But in the spot where I then found myself all was drear, dark, and lonely. I walked a little further, and to my joy espied a light. I advanced towards it, and soon perceived that it emanated from a fire burning in a species of cave overhung by a high and rugged embankment of earth, belonging to a pit that had most probably ceased to be worked. Crouching over this fire was a lad of about fifteen, clothed in rags, dirty, emaciated, and with starvation written upon his countenance. I advanced towards him and begged to be allowed to warm myself by his fire. He answered me in a kind and touching manner, and we soon made confidence of each other. I told him of my history, only suppressing my knowledge that the death of Phil Blossom's wife arose from premeditation instead of accident, as I did not wish to get my mother into a scrape, although I had no reason to have any regard for her. The lad then acquainted me with his sad tale. He was an orphan, and his earliest remembrance was experienced in a workhouse, of which it appeared he had become an inmate shortly after his birth, his parents having been killed at the same time by the explosion of fire damp in the pit in which they had worked. When the lad was eight years old, the parish authorities apprenticed him to a miner, who gave him the name of Skilligalee in consequence of his excessive leanness. This man treated him very badly, but the poor boy endured all for a period of seven years, because he had no other asylum than that afforded him by his master. At length, said the boy, a few weeks ago master got hurt upon the head by the falling in of some coal where he was working, and from that moment he acted more like a madman than a human being. He used to seize me by the hair and dash me against the side of the pit, Sometimes he flogged me with a strap till my flesh was all raw. I could stand it no longer, so about three weeks ago I ran away. Ever since then I have been living, I can scarcely tell how. I have slept in the deserted cabins on the pit's bank, or in the old pits that are done working. I have got what I could to eat, and have even been glad to devour the bits of candles that the colliers had left in the pits. All this is as true as I am here. Author's Note. See Report, page 43, section 194. End of Author's Note. Yesterday I found some matches in a pit, and that is how I have this good fire here now. But I am starving! The poor fellow then began to cry. I divided with him my bread and cheese, and when we had eaten our morsel, we began to converse upon our miserable condition. He had as much abhorrence of the mine as I had. He declared that he would sooner kill himself at once than return to labour in a pit. I shared in this resolution. In less than an hour, Skilligalee and myself became intimate friends. Varied and many were the plans which we proposed to earn a livelihood, but all proved hopeless when we remembered our penniless condition, and Skilligalee pointed to his rags. At length he exclaimed in despair, "'There is nothing left to do but to rob.' "'I am afraid that this is our only resource,' was my reply. "'Do you mean it?' he demanded. "'Yes,' I said boldly, and we exchanged glances full of meaning. "'Come with me,' said Skilligalee. "'I did not ask any questions, but followed him. "'He led the way in silence for upwards of half an hour, "'and at length lights suddenly shone between a grove of trees. "'Skilligalee leapt over a low fence and then helped me to climb it. We were then in a meadow, planted with trees, a sort of park, 
which we traversed, guided by the lights, towards a large house. We next came to a garden, and having passed through this enclosure, we reached the back part of the premises. Skilligalee went straight up to a particular window, which he opened. He then crept through and told me to wait outside. In a few minutes he returned to the window and handed me out a large bundle wrapped up in a tablecloth. He then crept forth and closed the window. We beat a retreat from the scene of our plunder and returned to the cave. The fire was still blazing, and Skilligalee fed it with more fuel, which he obtained by breaking away the wood from an old ruined cabin close by. We next proceeded to open the bundle, which I found to contain a quantity of food, six silver forks and six spoons. Skilligalee then told me that the mansion which we had just robbed was the dwelling of the owner of the mine wherein he had worked for seven years, and where he had been so cruelly treated by the pitman to whom he had been apprenticed. He said that he had sometimes been sent with messages to the proprietor from the overseer in the mine, and that the servants on those occasions had taken him into the kitchen and given him some food. He had thus obtained a knowledge of the premises. Last night, he added, I was reduced by hunger to desperation, and I went with the intention of breaking into the pantry. To my surprise, I found the window open, the spring belt being broken. My courage, however, failed me, and I returned to this cave to suffer all the pangs of hunger. Tonight you came. Companionship gave me resolution, and we have got the wherewith to obtain the means of doing something for an honest livelihood. We then partook of some of the cold meat and fine white bread which the pantry had furnished, and whilst we thus regaled ourselves, we debated what we should do with the silver forks and spoons. I said before that I was decently dressed, but my companion was in rags. It was accordingly agreed that I should go to the nearest town in the morning, dispose of the plate, purchase some clothes for Skilligalee, and then rejoin him at the cave. This matter being decided upon, we laid down and went to sleep. Next morning I washed myself at a neighbouring stream, made myself look as decent as I could, and set off. Skilligalee had told me how to proceed. In an hour I reached the town and went to a pawnbroker's shop. I said that I was a servant to a lady who was in temporary difficulty and required a loan. The pawnbroker questioned me so closely that I began to prevaricate. He called in a constable and gave me into custody. I was taken before the magistrate, but I refused to answer a single question, being determined not to betray my accomplice. The magistrate remanded me for a week, and I was sent to prison. There I herded with juvenile thieves and prostitutes, and I cared little for my incarceration, because I was tolerably, and at all events, regularly fed. When I was had up again, the owner of the mansion which I had helped to rob was there to identify his property. I, however, still persisted in my refusal to answer any questions. I was resolved not to incriminate Skilligalee, and I also felt desirous of being sent back to prison, as I was certain of there obtaining a bed and a meal. In vain did the magistrate impress upon me the necessity of giving an explanation of the manner in which the plate came into my possession, for both he and the owner of the property were inclined to believe that I was only a tool and not the original thief. I remained dumb and was remanded for another week. At the expiration of that period I was again placed before the magistrate, and to my surprise I found Skilligalee in the court. He was still clothed in his rags, and looked more wretched and famished than when I first saw him. I gave him a look, and made a sign to assure him that I would not betray him. But the moment the case was called, he stood forward and declared that he alone was guilty, that he had robbed the house, and that I was merely an instrument of whom he had made use to dispose of the proceeds of the burglary. I was overcome by this generosity on his part, and both the magistrate and the owner of the property were struck by the avowal. The latter declared that he did not wish to prosecute. The former, accordingly, inflicted a summary sentence of imprisonment for a few weeks upon Skilligalee. He then questioned me about my own condition, and I told him that I had worked in a mine, but that I had been compelled to run away from home in consequence of the ill-treatment I received at the hands of my mother. 
I expressed my determination to put an end to my life sooner than return to her, and the gentleman whose house had been robbed offered to provide for me at his own expense if the magistrate would release me. This he agreed to do, and the gentleman placed me as a boarder in a school kept in the town by two elderly widows. This school was founded for the purpose of furnishing education to the children of pitmen who were prudent and well disposed enough to pay a small stipend for that purpose, that stipend being fixed at a very low rate, as the deficiency in the amount required to maintain the establishment was supplied by voluntary contribution. There were only a few boarders, and they were all girls. The great majority of the pupils consisted of day scholars. At this school I stayed until I was sixteen, when the gentleman who had placed me there took me into his service as housemaid. During the whole of that period I had never heard of my mother or Phil Blossom. I now felt some curiosity to discover what had become of them. So, one day, having obtained a holiday for the purpose, I went over to the pit where I had myself passed so many miserable years. The same old woman who had presided at the handle of the roller that raised or lowered the clatch harness during the period of my never-to-be-forgotten apprenticeship was still there. She did not recognize me. I was so altered for the better. Clean, neatly dressed, stout and tall, I could not possibly be identified with the dirty, ragged, thin and miserable-looking creature who had once toiled in that subterranean hell. I accosted the old woman and asked her if a woman named Betsy Flathers or Blossom worked in the mine. "'Bet Blossom!' ejaculated the old woman. "'Why, she's been dead a year!' "'Dead!' I echoed. "'And how did she die?' "'By falling down the shaft, to be sure,' answered the old woman. "'Although I entertained little affection for my mother, "'absence and a knowledge of her character "'having destroyed all feelings of that kind, "'I could not bear this intelligence "'without experiencing a severe shock. "'Yes,' continued the old woman, "'it was a sort of judgment on her, I suppose, "'for she herself let a poor creature fall down "'some four or five years ago.' when she took my place at the handle here for a few minutes while I went to the tommy shop for her. She married the husband of the woman who was killed by the fall, and everybody knew well enough afterwards that there wasn't quite so much neglect in the affair as she had pretended at the time. But something more serious still. However, there was no proof, and so the thing was soon forgotten. Well, one day, about a year ago, as I said just now, Phil Blossom came up to me and asked me to run to the tommy shop to fetch him some candles. I told him to mind the wheel, and he said he would. It seems that a few minutes after I had left on his errand, his wife came up the clutch, and according to what a lad who looked up the shaft at the time says, she had just reached the top when she fell, harnessed and all, the whole pit echoing with her horrible screams. She died the moment she touched the bottom. Phil Blossom was very much cut up about it, but he swore that the handle slipped out of his hand and went whirling round and round with such force that he couldn't catch it again. I own that people did say that Phil and his second wife led a precious dog-and-cat kind of life, but the overseer thought there was no reason to make a stir about it, and there the matter ended. And what has become of Phil Blossom? I inquired. The old woman pointed down the shaft as much as to say that he was still working in the mine. "'Did they have any children?' I asked. "'Bet had one, I believe,' said the old woman, "'but it died a few days after it was born "'through having too large a dose of Godfrey's cordial "'administered to make it sleep.' I gave the old woman a shilling and turned away from the place, by no means anxious to encounter Phil Blossom, who, I clearly perceived, had rid himself of my mother by the same means which she had adopted to dispose of his first wife. As I was returning to my master's house, I had to cross a narrow bridge over a little stream. I was so occupied with the news I had just heard, I did not perceive that there was another person advancing from the opposite side until I was suddenly caught in the arms of a young man in the very middle of the bridge. I gave a dreadful scream, but he burst out into a loud laugh and exclaimed, "'Well, you needn't be so frightened at a mere joke!' I knew that voice directly, and glancing at the young man, who was tolerably well-dressed, I immediately recognised my old friend Skilligaly. It was then my turn to laugh, which I did very heartily, because he had not the least notion who I was. 
I, however, soon told him, and he was quite delighted to meet me. We walked together to the very identical cave where we had first met when boy and girl. Now he was a tall young man and had improved wonderfully. He told me that he had become acquainted with some excellent fellows when he was in prison, and that he had profited so well by their advice and example that he led a jovial life, did no work, and always had plenty of money. I asked him how he managed, and he told me, after some hesitation, that he had turned housebreaker. There was scarcely a gentleman's house within twelve miles round that he had not visited in that quality. He then proposed that I should meet him on the following Sunday evening, and take a walk together. I agreed, and we separated. I did not neglect my appointment. Skilligalee was delighted to see me again, and he proposed that I should leave service and live with him. I consented, and— End of section 52section 53 of the mysteries of london volume 1 part 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dave wills the rattlesnake here the rattlesnake abruptly broke off the resurrection man was asleep in his chair it had not been without a motive that the woman so readily complied with the desire of the resurrection man that she should amuse him with the history of her life and as she saw him gradually becoming more and more drowsy as her narrative progressed, an ill-concealed expression of joy animated her countenance. At length, when the hand of the watch over the mantelpiece pointed to eight, and the resurrection man fell back in his chair fast asleep, she could hardly suppress an ejaculation of triumph. She broke off abruptly in the midst of her narrative and listened. The nasal sounds that emanated from her companion convinced her that he slept. Not a moment was now to be lost. She knew full well that whenever Anthony Tidkins was overtaken by a nap in such a manner as the present, he invariably awoke a short time before the hour at which she had any business to transact, for that strange but fearful individual exercised a marvellous control over all his natural wants and propensities. Rising cautiously from her seat, the rattlesnake advanced towards the resurrection man and steadfastly examined his countenance. There could be no doubt that he slept profoundly. She was, however, resolved to assure herself as far as possible on that head, and she purposely agitated the fire-irons against each other. The resurrection man started slightly, but did not awake. Perfectly satisfied on this point, Margaret Flathers hastened into the adjoining room and put on her bonnet and shawl. Having provided herself with her skeleton keys and some lucifer matches, she descended the stairs and went out of the house. It was not, however, without an intense apprehension of danger that she proceeded to the execution of her scheme. Were the resurrection man to awake suddenly and entertain any suspicion on discovering her absence, she knew that her life would not be worth an hour's purchase. Still, the temptation that now lured her to dare this terrific chance was so great it was irresistible. Her hesitation when she stood in the street was only of a moment's existence, and calling all her courage to her aid, she plunged into the alley. The door in that dark passage was opened in another moment. She closed and locked it carefully, and entered the back room on the ground floor. Having obtained a light, she raised the mysterious trap-door and boldly descended the steps leading into the subterranean passage. One of her keys soon opened the door of the cell in which the resurrection man had buried his treasure. But her joy at this disappearance of the only difficulty which she had apprehended was adulterated by a sentiment of invincible terror, as she still thought of the possibility of detection by him whose desperate character inspired her with this tremendous alarm. Nevertheless, she was resolved to dare everything in the enterprise which she had undertaken. "'Fortune seemed to favour me this afternoon when I watched him,' she murmured to herself. "'And surely it will not desert me at the last moment.' Then she boldly entered the cell. To take up the stone which covered the treasure, and possess herself of the bag that contained the gold over which she had a few hours previously beheld the resurrection man gloating in so strange a manner. This was the work of only a few moments. She replaced the stone. She clutched the bag with a feeling of wild joy commingled with terrific alarm. 
and she was hurrying from the cell when something at the opposite side of the passage met her view, and for a moment riveted her to the spot. A light was streaming from beneath the door of a dungeon facing the one on the threshold of which she stood. Circumstances which, in the excitement of her present daring procedures she had forgotten, now rushed like an overwhelming torrent to her memory. The mysterious visits of the resurrection man in a mask and dark cloak to that subterranean place, the bread and water which she had seen in the cupboard upstairs, and the fearful scream that on one occasion had emanated from the depths where she now found herself. All these circumstances flashed very vividly across her mind. There was no longer any doubt. A human being, a female most probably, judging by the tone of that agonizing shriek which now seemed to ring in her ears as if its vibration had never once ceased, was immured in that dungeon whence the light streamed. This conviction dissipated the alarm into which the sudden glare of that light had plunged the rattlesnake. Urged by several motives, curiosity, a desire to obtain the reinforcement of a companion in case of the sudden appearance of the resurrection man, and, to do her justice, a feeling of compassion for a victim whom she believed to be of her own sex. Urged, we say, by these motives which all presented themselves to her mind with the rapidity of lightning, the rattlesnake hastened to open the door of that dungeon whence the light emanated. She boldly entered the cell, and at the same moment Viola awoke. Starting up from the bed, that unhappy lady glanced wildly around and exclaimed, "'Where am I?' "'Hush! Not a word!' said the rattlesnake, advancing towards her. "'I am come to save you. Follow me!' Viola did not hesitate a single moment. The manner in which the woman addressed her, and a profound sense of the certainty that no treachery was needed to draw her into a position worse than her present one, since she was so completely in the power of the terrible master of that establishment, induced her to yield instantaneous compliance with the directions of the rattlesnake. "'Fear nothing, lady,' observed the latter. "'Only be silent, and lose not a moment.' She then hastened from the cell, followed by Viola, who did not even wait to put on her bonnet and shawl. They ascended the steps leading to the back room, both hearts palpitating violently. The rattlesnake did not stop to close the mouth of the subterranean vaults, but hastened to apply the skeleton key to the door leading into the alley. Her hand trembled to such an extent that she could not turn the key. "'Oh, heavens!' she exclaimed in a tone of despair. "'If he shall come!' "'Have you the right key?' demanded Viola in a hurried tone. "'The one that has opened it before,' replied Margaret. "'But it appears that it will not turn, and, ah, my God, I hear steps approaching.' The affrighted woman fell upon her knees, as if all ready to supplicate for her life. Viola listened during half a minute of the most agonising suspense but no sound from without met her ears. "'It was a false alarm!' she exclaimed. Then, applying her hand to the key, she turned it with ease, for fear alone had prevented the rattlesnake from moving it. In another instant the door was opened. "'Thank God!' cried Margaret Flathers, starting from her suppliant posture, and clutching the bag of gold beneath her left arm. "'Come, let us not lose a moment!' said Viola, and she darted into the alley, followed by the rattlesnake. There was no one to oppose their egress, but they could scarcely believe that they were really safe, even when they found themselves in the street. And now they ran, they ran, as if that terrible individual whom they both feared so profoundly were at their heels. They ran, doubting the fact that the one that she was free and the other that she was safe. They ran, they ran, reckless of the way in which they were pursuing but each alike impressed with the conviction that it was impossible to place too great a distance between them and the dwelling of the resurrection man. Margaret Flathers carried her treasure as if it were a thing of no weight. Viola Chichester forgot that she had neither bonnet nor shawl to protect her against the bitter chill of that wintry evening, and thus together did they pursue their way, the virtuous wife and the abandoned woman the former thinking not what might be the character of her companion, the latter having now no curiosity to know the circumstances that had plunged the lady by her side into the captivity from which she had just been released. At length they reached the new church, facing the Bethnal Green Road, and there they halted, 
both completely out of breath and exhausted. "'We are now safe,' said Margaret Flavers. "'We are now safe,' echoed Viola Chichester. "'Still, this place is lonely.' "'And if that dreadful man were on our track, "'we might yet repent. "'Yes, we might yet repent our proceeding.' The minds of those two women, so distinct in other respects, were now entirely congenial in reference to one grand absorbing idea. In spite of the alarm which yet filled their imaginations, they lingered against the palings surrounding the field at the back of the new church, for they were too exhausted to continue their flight for a few moments. That interval of rest enabled them to direct their attention to other matters, besides the immense danger from which they had just escaped and the sense of which was still uppermost in their minds. "'Which way are you going, madam?' asked the rattlesnake, who saw by Viola's air, in spite of the disadvantages under which her outward appearance laboured, that she was not one of the poorer orders. "'My own house is close by,' answered Mrs. Chichester. "'But you, whither are you going? Will it not be better for you to come with me and—' "'No, lady,' replied Margaret Flathers. "'You are not aware who and what I am.' "'Oh, you would not make me that generous offer!' "'Generous!' exclaimed Viola. "'Have you not saved me from a fearful dungeon? "'It is true that my persecutors promised to release me this evening, "'but, alas, their word was not to be depended upon.' "'Ah, madam,' said Margaret, "'if you trusted to Antony Tidkins to give you your freedom, "'you would have been woefully disappointed.' unless, indeed, he had no longer any interest in keeping you a prisoner. Well, well, observed Viola, we will talk of all that hereafter. In the meantime, I insist upon you accompanying me to my home. I will see you safe to your own door, madam, returned Margaret, and there I shall leave you. And why will you refuse an asylum at my abode? demanded Viola. I dare not remain in London, answered the rattlesnake. "'Oh, you know not the perseverance, the craft, and the wickedness of the man from whose power you have just escaped. "'But there is one favour, madam, which you can grant me.' "'Name it,' exclaimed Viola. "'It is already conferred, if within my power. "'You can have no difficulty in fulfilling my request,' said the rattlesnake, "'because it is simple and consists only in forbearance.' "'I mean, madam, that you will amply reward me "'for the service I have been able to render you "'if you will promise not to take any measures "'to punish or molest Antony Tidkins. "'He has been more or less good to me, "'and I should not like to know that he was injured through me. "'Besides, his revenge would only be the more terrible "'if ever you or I again fell into his hands.' "'I give you the promise which you require,' said Viola, "'although I must confess that it is somewhat repugnant to my feelings "'to allow such a wretch to be at large with impunity. "'But for my sake, lady, for your sake, "'I give my most solemn pledge not to do aught that may injure that man "'on account of his past offences. "'A thousand thanks,' ejaculated the rattlesnake. "'Let us now proceed.' "'But, heavens, you have nothing on your head nor on your shoulders, "'and I did not notice that before. "'Take my bonnet and shawl, madam. "'I am more accustomed to the cold than you.' "'No,' said Viola. "'In five minutes I shall be at my own house. "'Come, let us proceed.' "'Mrs. Chichester and the rattlesnake hastened towards the Cambridge Heath gate. "'On reaching the door of her abode, Viola again pressed her companion to accept of her hospitality, but the rattlesnake firmly, though respectfully, refused the offer. "'In another hour, madam,' she said, "'I shall not be in London. <laughs> then only shall I consider myself safe. At least allow me to supply you with some money for your immediate purposes. And I know not whether my husband has left a single shilling in the house, but any of my tradesmen in the neighbourhood will honour my draught.' "'and if you will walk in for a few minutes. "'Thank you, ma'am. "'Thank you for your kind consideration. "'But I am well supplied.' "'And she shook the bag that she hugged beneath her arm. "'Viola heard the jingling of the gold "'and ceased to press her offer. "'At all events,' she observed, "'should you ever require a friend, "'do not hesitate to apply to Mrs. Chichester.' "'Mrs. Chichester?' ejaculated the rattlesnake. "'Surely I have heard that name before.' "'Oh, I recollect. 
I have taken to the post office letters from Tidkins to a Mr. Chichester, who I suppose must be your husband. The same, said Viola, with a profound sigh. Farewell, madam, cried the rattlesnake. I feel that I shall not breathe with freedom until I am far beyond London. Farewell. Farewell, said Mrs. Chichester, extending her hand towards her deliverer. Margaret Flathers pressed it warmly and then hurried away. Viola knocked at the door and was speedily admitted once more into her own dwelling. The servant who received her uttered an ejaculation of surprise when she beheld the condition in which her mistress had returned. "'Make fast the door with chain and bolt and bring me the key,' said Viola, taking no heed of her domestic's exclamation. "'See also that the shutters of the windows are well secured and bring me your master's pistols.' "'Mr. Chichester came this morning early, ma'am,' returned the servant, "'and took away everything belonging to him.' "'Heaven be thanked,' cried Viola. "'Perhaps he will molest me no more. "'God grant that the separation may be eternal. "'Nevertheless, secure the door and the windows. "'This house is not safe. "'Tomorrow I shall leave it and hire lodgings in the very heart of London. "'There, perhaps,' she murmured to herself, "'no violence can be offered to me.' End of section 53section 54 of the mysteries of london volume 1 part 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dave wills the two maidens on a fine frosty morning about 10 days after the incidents just related two young ladies were walking together along the road in the immediate vicinity of the dwelling of Count Alteroni, for so we had better continue to call him until he himself shall choose to throw aside his incognito. Did an artist wish to personify the Antipodes, as the ancients did their rivers, mounts and groves, upon his canvas, he could not possibly have selected for his models two maidens between whom there existed so great a physical contrast as that which was afforded to the eye by the young ladies above noticed. The one was a brunette and seemed a child of the sunny south. The other was as fair as ever a daughter of our cold northern clime could be. The one had the rich red blood mantling beneath a delicate tinge of the purest and most transparent bista. The other was pale and colourless as the whitest marble. The generous mind and elevated intellect of the one shone through eyes large, black, and impassioned. The almost infantile candour and artlessness of the other were expressed by means of orbs of azure blue. The glossy raven hair of the one was parted in two rich bands over the high and noble forehead. The flaxen tresses of the other fell in varied waves of pale auburn and gold beneath the bonnet over the shoulders. The form of the one was well-rounded but sylph-like. The symmetry of the other was delicate and slight. The appearance of the one excited the most ardent admiration, tempered with respect. That of the other inspired the most lively interest. The beauty of the one was faultless, brilliant and dazzling. That of the other ideal, fascinating and bewitching. The one, in fine, was a native of the warm Italian clime the other a daughter of Britain, a sea-girt isle. A shade of profound melancholy hung upon the countenance of Mary Anne Gregory. The sprightly, gay, joyous, innocently volatile disposition had changed to sadness and gloom. Those vermilion lips, which until lately were ever wreathed in smiles, now expressed care and sorrow. The step, though light, was no longer playfully elastic. Time had added but a few months to the sixteen years which marked the age of Mary Anne when we first introduced her to our readers, but thought and meditation and grief had given to the mind the experience of maturity. She was no longer the gay, lively, flitting, bee-like being that she was when Richard Markham became her brother's tutor. Her manner was now painfully tranquil, her air profoundly pensive her demeanour inconsistently grave when considered in relation to her years. It seemed as if there were a canker at the heart of that fair creature, 
as if the hidden worm had preyed long upon the delicate rosebud ere it expanded into the bloom of maturity and these traits and symptoms were rendered the more apparent by the contrast afforded by the rich health and youthful vigour which characterised the signora isabella the hues of the rose were seen beneath the soft brunette tint of her complexion for that complexion was clear and transparent as a stream over which the trees throw a shade beneath a summer sun and both these maidens loved but the passion of the english girl was without hope while that of the noble italian lady was nurtured by the fondest aspirations but how came those charming creatures thus acquainted with each other perhaps their conversation may elucidate this mystery we have only known each other for one short week said mary ann and yet i feel as if you were sent to me by heaven to become my friend and confidant for oh it seems to me as if my soul nourishes a secret which consumes it an accident made us acquainted and that very circumstance immediately inspired me with a deep interest in your behalf returned the signora there are occasions when two persons become more intimate in a few short days than they otherwise would in as many years you echo my own feelings signora said mary ann and your goodness makes me desire to deserve and gain your friendship your wish is already accomplished my dear miss gregory observed isabella you have my friendship and if you think me worthy of your confidence i can sympathize with your sorrows even if i cannot remove them how have you divined that the confidence i would impart is associated with grief asked mary ann hastily i will tell you replied the beautiful italian when you were riding on horseback accompanied by your father along this road a week ago i observed you from my own chamber even at that distance i perceived something about you that immediately inspired me with interest i followed you with my eyes until you were out of sight and then i still continued to think of you wondering with that idiosyncrasy of thought which often occurs during a leisure half-hour who you were at length you returned you were a few paces in front of your father and i observed that the horse you rode was a spirited one then occurred the accident the moment you were thrown so rudely off against the very gate of our shrubbery i precipitated myself down the stairs and calling for the servants as i descended hurried to your assistance you cannot remember because you were insensible that i was the first to reach the spot where your father had already raised you from the ground mr gregory was distracted he thought that you were lost to him for ever i however ascertained in a moment that you still breathed and i directed the servants to convey you to the house while you were still stretched in a state of insensibility upon my own bed i contemplated you with increasing interest then when you awoke at length and spoke and when i conversed with you it seemed as if i were irresistibly attracted towards you i was indeed delighted when my father proposed to mr gregory to allow you to remain a few days with us until you should be completely recovered from the effects of your fall your father consented and he left you with us it was not long before i perceived that you nourished a profound grief i observed the frequent abstraction of your manner i noticed your pensive mood i thought within myself is it possible that one so young and interesting should already be acquainted with sorrow from that hour i have felt deeply on your account for alas i myself have known what are the effects of grief signora said mary ann with tears in her eyes i can never repay you for this kind interest which you manifest towards me i feel that i should be happier were i to tell you all that grieves me but i tremble lest you should think me very foolish and very indiscreet foolish we may all be at times said isabella but indiscreet i am convinced you never were is it not indiscreet to nurse a sentiment whose hopes can never be realized is it not indiscreet added mary ann hanging down her head and speaking in a low tone to love one who loves another no not indiscreet answered isabella hastily for what mortal has power over the heart Signora, love is not then a stranger to your breast exclaimed marianne glancing with tearful eyes up to the countenance of the italian lady i should be unworthy of your confidence were i to withhold mine said isabella 
Yes, my troth is plighted to one than whom no living soul possesses more generous, more noble feelings, and yet, she added with a sigh, there are obstacles in the way of our union, obstacles which, alas, I sometimes think can never be overcome. Ah, lady, while I can now feel for you, feel most deeply, said Marianne, I am nevertheless rejoiced that you have thus honoured me with your confidence. It removes any hesitation, any alarm on my part, to unburden my soul to you. Speak, my dear Mary Ann, returned Isabella. You will at least be certain to receive sympathy and consolation from me. I shall then reveal my sentiments unreservedly, continued Mary Ann. I have before mentioned to you that I have two brothers who are now at college. A few months ago they were preparing for their collegiate course of study and were residing at home in Kentish Town. My father obtained for them the assistance of a tutor, a young gentleman who had once been wealthy but who had been reduced to comparative poverty. Oh, it was impossible to see that young man without feeling an interest in him. When I first heard that a tutor was engaged for my brothers, I immediately pictured to myself a confirmed pedagogue, shabby, dirty, dogmatic, and ugly. How greatly, then, was I astonished when I was introduced to an elegant and handsome young man of polished manners, agreeable conversation, entirely unassuming, courteous, and affable. There was a partial air of melancholy about him, but his eyes were lighted with the fire of intellect, and his noble forehead seemed to be adorned with that unartificial crown of aristocracy which nature bestows upon her elect. Alas, woe to me was the day when that young man first entered my father's dwelling. The interest I felt for him soon augmented to a degree that I was miserable when he was away. But when he was present, oh, then my heart seemed to bound within me like fawns upon the hills, and my happiness was of the most ravishing description. I was gay, frolicsome, and playful. No laugh of a child was so hearty, so sincere as mine. His voice was music to my ears. He taught me drawing, but I was too happy to sit still for many minutes together, too happy to sit next to him. And yet I did not understand my own feelings. In fact, I never stopped to analyse them. I was carried along by a whirlwind that left me no leisure for self-examination. When he was absent, my only thought was upon what he had said when present, and how happy I should be when he came once more. I had no more idea of the true nature of the sentiments that animated my soul than I have at this instance of what constitutes the happiness of heaven. I know that I felt happy when he was there, and I know that those feel happy who dwell above, but I was as ignorant then of what formed my felicity as I now am of the bliss experienced by those who inhabit the Almighty's kingdom. Thus a few weeks passed away, and then my father announced his intention of allowing a holiday for a short period. I remember, as well as if it were the event of yesterday, that this arrangement caused me serious displeasure, because I understood that our tutor would cease to visit us during the suspension of the studies. I expressed my annoyance in plain terms, but this ebullition on my part was most probably considered a specimen of girlish caprice or the airs of a spoiled child. And now, signora, now, call me Isabella, said the Italian lady affectionately. Now, my dear Isabella, proceeded Marianne, I come to that part of my narrative which involves an indiscretion that may appear grave in your eyes, though, God knows, I was at the time in entirely ignorant of the imprudence of the step which I was taking. I am prepared to allow every extenuation for one so young, so artless, and so inexperienced as yourself, observed Isabella. Ah, oh, how kind you are, returned Marianne, pressing her companion's hand. But let me not hesitate to reveal the indiscretion into which I was hurried by feelings of a new and powerful nature. I called upon the young tutor at his own residence. And then how nobly did he behave! How generously did he act! He explained to me, by degrees, and in the most delicate manner possible, the impropriety of the step which I had taken. He gave me an insight into those rules of feminine propriety, a breach of which can scarcely be extenuated by the pleas of guilelessness. In a word, he opened my eyes to the position in which I had placed myself. But alas! 
What did I learn at the same time? He told me that he was attached to a young lady who was very beautiful. It then struck me with lightning rapidity that I had no right to offer my friendship, for still I did not dream of love, to one on whom another heart had claims, and I left him with a sincere apology for my conduct. I admit that your indiscretion was great, said the pure-minded Isabella, but no one possessing a generous heart could hesitate to sympathise with you rather than blame. For days and days, continued Marianne, I struggle with my feelings. I still believe that all I experienced towards the object of my interest was friendship. But when he resumed his attendance, I found that it was impossible to conquer the sentiments which agitated my bosom. God knows, Isabella, how I reasoned with myself upon the state of mind in which I existed. I prayed to heaven to relieve me from the doubts, the anxieties, and the uneasiness which constantly oppress me by restoring me to that state of perfect happiness ere I knew that being who, in spite of himself, exercised so powerful an influence over me. At length my father sent me, suddenly, and without a day's warning, to pass a week with some particular friends at Twickenham. I was at first inclined to remonstrate with him at this proceeding, and then it struck me that it would be well if I were to cease to exist under the spell which the frequent presence of the tutor at the house seemed to throw around me. And all this time you were still unaware of the true nature of the feelings which animated you? inquired Isabella. Oh, yes, I was indeed, answered Marianne. But a fearful occurrence was speedily destined to open my eyes. I remained a few days with my friends at Twickenham and then returned home. I then learned that the tutor had ceased to attend at the house, as my brothers were to proceed at the commencement of January to college. I know not whether my father had some motive for the conduct which he thus then pursued in abruptly dismissing the tutor and sending me away while he adopted that step. Nor can I say whether any particular reason prompted him to do all that he could to amuse my mind on my return home. It is nevertheless certain that he exerted himself to provide amusements for me. He purchased two horses and accompanied me in frequent equestrian exercises. He took me to concerts and the theatres and supplied me with entertaining books of travel and adventure, music and pictures. But my mind was intent only upon one absorbing idea, nor could it be weaned from that feeling which it nursed in favour of the young tutor. I, however, acceded to all my father's plans of diversion, and it was one evening at the theatre that the veil fell from my eyes. I accompanied my father to witness a new drama. The action of the piece was deeply interesting. The poetry was of a nature to touch the inmost soul. There was a passage in which the heroine described her hopeless love. I listened. I drank in every word. I hung upon each syllable of that fine speech as if my own destiny were intimately linked with the scene enacting before me. As she proceeded, I was painfully surprised by the similitude existing between the feelings that she described and that I felt. At length a light dawned in upon my soul. Then did I begin to comprehend the real nature of the sentiments that filled my own soul. Then I could read my own heart. I perceived that I loved tenderly, deeply, unalterably. I heard no more of the drama. I saw nothing more of its progress. I sat absorbed in deep reflection upon the conviction that had so suddenly reached me. When I awoke from my reverie, the tragedy— A tragedy, said Isabella hastily. Yes, the tragedy was finished, and the author, holding the hand of the heroine of his piece, stood before the public. Merciful heavens, the great tragic writer who had thus suddenly burst upon the world was no other than the young tutor. The tutor? exclaimed Isabella, a strange suspicion suddenly entering her mind. Yes, he whom I had just discovered that I loved, answered Marianne. May I inquire his name? said Isabella, in a tremulous tone and with a palpitating heart. There can be no indiscretion in revealing it, returned Miss Gregory, for it is not probable that you have ever heard of Mr. Richard Markham. Unhappy girl, exclaimed Isabella, in a tone of deep sympathy, but without the least feeling of jealousy. It is now my duty to return your confidence with a reciprocal frankness. 
"'But alas, what I am about to say cannot tend to soothe your sorrows, "'since, as I fondly believe, it will only confirm you in the impression "'that the affections of him who you love are fixed elsewhere. "'You speak mysteriously, Isabella,' said Marianne. "'Pray explain yourself. I will, and without reserve.' continued the signora, a blush mantling upon her beauteous countenance. So far from Mr. Richard Markham being a stranger to me, Mary Anne, he is... He is, repeated Miss Gregory mechanically. He is the hope of my happiness, the one to whom my vow of constancy and love is pledged. You, the object of his attachment, ejaculated Mary Anne, clinging to Isabella for support. Oh, forgive me, forgive me, that I have dared to love him also. "'Alas, dear girl, I have nothing to forgive,' said Isabella affectionately. "'I deeply, deeply commiserate your lot. "'And, oh, believe me,' continued the generous Italian princess, "'believe me when I say that no feeling of petty jealousy, "'no sentiment touching the honourable affection which I bear towards Richard Markham, "'can ever impair the friendship that has commenced and shall continue between you and me.' "'Oh, how noble is your disposition, Isabella!' exclaimed Marianne. "'But your generous assurance shall not meet with an ungrateful return. "'So far from feeling jealous of you, envious I must be to some extent, "'I offer you the most sincere congratulations on your engagement "'to one who is so well worthy of your love, "'in spite of what the world may say against him, "'for that he could be guilty of the deed of which that horrible man accused him. "'He is not guilty.' answered Isabella firmly. The story is a long one, but I will tell thee all. The signora then related to her companion the narrative of the misfortunes and sufferings of Richard Markham. Mary Ann listened with profound attention, and when Isabella terminated her history, exclaimed, Oh, I knew that he was all of honourable, great, and generous that human nature could be. A profound silence then ensued between the two young ladies, and lasted for some minutes. At length it was broken by Mary Anne. "'Oh, well might he have said,' she exclaimed in a sudden ebullition of feeling as she gazed upon the countenance of the signora. "'Well might he have said that his heart was devoted to a lady who was very beautiful, and you might also have observed as good as she was lovely.' "'Nay, you must not flatter me,' returned Isabella. "'You need not hesitate to hear the truth from my lips,' said Marianne. "'God grant that I may live to see you happily united. "'I shall then die in peace.' "'It is wrong to talk of dying at your age,' observed Isabella. "'Time will mitigate that passion which has made you unhappy.' "'Oh, Isabella, do you believe that true and sincere love can ever succumb to time?' exclaimed Marianne, almost reproachfully. "'Time cannot extinguish it, but time may soften its pangs,' said the Italian lady, desirous to console her unfortunate friend. "'But time will only ripen and not eradicate the canker which gnaws at the heart,' persisted Miss Gregory. "'And mine,' she added, with a mournful pathos of tone that showed how deeply she felt the truth of what she said, "'mine has received a wound whose effects may be comparatively slow, but which is not the less mortal.' A few years, perhaps, and my earthly career must end. I shall wither like the early flowers that peep forth prematurely to greet a deceptive gleam of sunshine which they mistake for spring. I shall pass away at that age when my contemporaries are in the full enjoyment of life, vigour and happiness. Yes, I feel it here, and she pressed her hand upon her heart. "'No, my dear friend,' said Isabella, affected even to tears. "'Your prospect is not so gloomy as you would depict it. "'There is one star that burns in the same heaven which is above us all, "'and that star is hope.' "'Hope?' ejaculated Marianne bitterly. Ah, "'Where does hope exist for me? "'Is not hope extinguished in my heart for ever?' "'In the one sense hope is dead,' answered Isabella mildly. "'But hope beams not only in one sphere, "'and surely this conviction must be allied "'to hopes of tranquillity, peace, and even happiness. "'Consider, Mary Anne, you have a father "'who is still in the vigour of his years. "'You will live for him. "'You have brothers who must soon enter upon their respective careers "'in the great world. "'You must live for them.' You have friends who are devoted to you. You will live for them also. Oh, do not speak of death with levity. 
do not seem to invite its presence. We do not live for ourselves only. We live for others. To yield to those feelings which facilitate the ravages of sorrow and encourage the inroads of grief is to perpetuate a slow suicide. God and man alike require that we should war against our misfortunes. Alas, I have not that great moral courage which characterizes your soul, Isabella, answered Marianne. I am a weak and fragile plant that bends to the lightest gale. How then can I resist the terrible tempest? By exerting that fortitude with which every mind is more or less endowed, but which cannot be developed without an effort, answered Isabella. Marianne sighed, but gave no answer. The two maidens now felt wearied with the somewhat lengthy walk which they had taken, and they accordingly retraced their steps to the mansion. End of section 54「Poor Ellen. It was evening, and a cheerful fire burned in the grate of the drawing-room at Markham Place. Mr. Munro and his daughter were seated in that apartment, the former dozing in an armchair, the latter reading a novel. Richard was engaged in a literary pursuit in his library. From time to time Miss Munro laid aside her book and fell into meditation. Not that she had any particular subject for her reflections, but the events of her life, when taken together, constituted a theme from which it was impossible to avert her attention for any lengthened period. There was also a topic upon which she pondered more frequently as time passed on, she knew that in the course of nature, especially after the rude shocks which his constitution had received from mental suffering and bodily privation, her father could not live much longer. Then she was well aware that she could not continue to dwell under the same roof with Richard Markham, and her pride revolted against the idea of receiving a direct eleemosynary assistance from him in the shape of a pecuniary allowance. She had some few pounds treasured up in a savings bank, and which she had saved from her salary when engaged at the theatre. But this sum would not maintain her long. She therefore looked with occasional anxiety to the necessity of adopting some course that should obtain for her a livelihood. Of all the avocations in which she had been engaged, she preferred that of the stage, and there were times when she seriously thought of returning to the profession, even during her father's lifetime. In sooth, it was a pity that one of the brightest ornaments of female loveliness should have been lowered by circumstances from the pedestal of virtue and modesty which she would have so eminently adorned. Should her transcendent loveliness captivate the heart of any individual whose proposals were alike honourable and eligible, how could she accept the hand thus extended to her? She must either deceive him in respect to that wherein no man likes to be deceived, or she must decline the chance of settling herself advantageously for life. These were the alternatives, for in no case could she reveal her shame. Her fate was not, therefore, a happy one, and the reader need not marvel if she now and then found reflections of a disagreeable nature stealing into her soul. She was now past twenty years of age, and in spite of the severe trials which she had endured, the sweet freshness of her youthful charms was totally unimpaired. Her faultless Grecian countenance, her classically shaped head, her swan-like neck, her symmetrical form, her delicate hands and feet, all those charms which had been perpetrated in the work of so many artists. These elements of an almost superhuman beauty still combined to render her passing lovely. Oh, Ellen, the soul of the philanthropist must mourn for thee, for thou were not wrongly inclined by nature, on a purer being than thou wast, ere misery drove thee in an evil moment to an evil course, the sun never shone, and now thou hast to rue the shame which thine imperious destiny, and not thy faults, entailed upon thee. But to our tale, 
Old Mr. Munro was dozing in the armchair, and Ellen had once more turned her eyes upon her book when Marian entered the room. She perceived at a glance that Mr. Munro was asleep, and placing her finger upon her lip to enjoin silence, she put a note into Ellen's hand, saying at the same time in a low whisper, "'Mr. Wentworth's servant has just brought this, with a request that it should be immediately conveyed to you, miss.' Marian then withdrew. Ellen tore open the note and read as follows. "'I grieve to state that your little Richard has been attacked with a sudden and dangerous malady. Come to my house for an hour, if you can possibly steal away without exciting suspicion. My servant will convey this to you through our faithful confidant, David Wentworth.' Ellen flung the note frantically upon the table and rushed out of the room. She hurried upstairs, put on her bonnet and cloak, and having told Marian to sit up for her, hastened from the house, one sole idea occupying her mind, the danger of her well-beloved child. When she arrived at Mr. Wentworth's abode, she was received by that gentleman's wife, who immediately said, "'The danger is over. The crisis is past. Do not alarm yourself. My husband no longer fears for your son's life. He, however, deemed it to be his duty to send for you. "'Oh, he did well. He acted kindly and considerately,' returned Ellen. "'But let me assure myself that my boy is no longer in danger.' Mrs. Wentworth led the way to the chamber where little Richard was now sleeping tranquilly, the surgeon seated by the bedside. From his lips Ellen gathered hope that the perilous crisis had passed. She nevertheless determined to remain for some time to assure herself that any return of the spasm might not be fraught with increased danger. All other considerations were banished from her mind. She thought not of her father. She remembered not that her absence might alarm both him and Richard Markham. And when Mr. Wentworth delicately alluded to that subject, as time slipped by, she uttered some impatient remark intimating that she should not be at a loss for an excuse to account for her protracted absence. Thus the pure and holy maternal feeling was now uppermost in the mind of that young lady. The danger of her child was the all-absorbing subject of her thoughts. Bent over the bed, she tenderly gazed upon the pale countenance of her child. Oh, where can the artist find a more charming subject for his pencil? or the poet a more witching theme for his song than the young mother watching over her sleeping infant. Hour after hour passed, and when the babe awoke, Ellen nursed him in her arms. In spite of its illness, the little sufferer smiled. But when the pang of the malady seized upon him, it was Mrs. Wentworth, and not Ellen, who could pacify him. Alas, galling indeed to the young mother was this conviction that her child clung to another rather than to herself. Nevertheless, Ellen watched the babe with the most heartfelt tenderness, and it was not until near midnight when the surgeon declared that the malady had passed without the remotest fear of a relapse, that Ellen thought of returning home. She then took her departure with an intimation that she should call again in the morning. She retraced her steps towards the place, and passing up the garden was admitted through the back entrance by the faithful Marian. "'My child is saved,' whispered Ellen to the servant. "'Has my father inquired for me?' "'No, miss,' was the reply. "'He is still in the drawing-room, and Mr. Markham is with him. "'They are up late to-night,' remarked Ellen. "'But I,' she continued, "'am weary in mind and body, and shall at once repair to my own room.' Marian gave the young lady a candle and wished her a good night's rest. Ellen hastened cautiously up the stairs, and in a few minutes retired to rest. She was fatigued, as before intimated, and yet slumber refused to visit her eyes. Nevertheless, she dozed uneasily in that kind of semi-sleep which weighs down the heavy lids, and yet does not completely shut out from the mind the consciousness of what is passing around. A quarter of an hour had probably elapsed since Ellen had sought her couch, when the door slowly opened and her father entered the room, bearing a light in his hand. The countenance of the old man was ghastly pale, and there was a wildness in his eyes which bore testimony to the painful feelings that agitated him within. 
he advanced towards the bed and contemplated the countenance of his daughter for a few moments with an expression of profound sorrow. Ellen opened her eyes and started up in bed, exclaiming, "'My dear father, in the name of heaven, what is the matter?' "'Oh, God, Ellen!' cried the old man, placing the light upon a side table. "'Tell me that it's not true. Say but one word to assure me that you are the pure and spotless girl that I have always deemed you to be.' "'Father!' exclaimed the young lady, a horrible feeling taking possession of her. "'Why do you ask me that question?' "'Because a fearful suspicion racks my brain,' answered the old man. "'And I could not retire to rest until I knew the truth, uh, be that truth what it may.' "'My dear father, you alarm me cruelly,' said Ellen, her cheeks at one moment suffused with blushes, and then varying to ashy whiteness. "'In one word, Ellen,' exclaimed the old man, what is the meaning of that letter? And the almost distracted father threw the surgeon's note upon the bed. In an instant, Ellen remembered that she had left it behind her in the room where she was seated with her father when she received it. Joining her hands in a paroxysm of the most acute mental agony, she burst into tears, crying wildly, Forgive me, forgive me, my dear, dear father. Do not curse your wretched, wretched daughter. And then she bowed her head upon her bosom and seemed to await her parents' reply in a state of mind which no pen can describe. For some moments Mr. Monroe maintained a profound silence, but the quivering of his lip and the working of the veins upon his forehead betrayed the terrible nature of the conflict of feelings which was taking place within his breast. At length he also burst into tears, and covering his face with his hands, exclaimed, My God, that I had died ere I had experienced this bitter, bitter hour! These words were uttered in a tone of such intense agony that a mortal dread for her father's reason and life suddenly sprang up in Ellen's mind. Throwing herself from the bed, she fell upon her knees, crying, Forgive me, my dear father! Oh, if my child were here, I would hold it in my arms towards you, and when its innocent countenance met your eyes, you would pardon me. Ellen, Ellen, thou hast broken thy father's heart, murmured Mr. Monroe, averting his face from his suppliant daughter. Oh, heaven be thanked that thy mother has been snatched from us. But tell me, unhappy girl, who is the villain that has dishonoured thee? For... In the moment of my intense agony, when I read the fatal letter that disclosed thy dishonour and marked the name of thy child, I vilely, ungratefully accused our generous benefactor of thy ruin. What? Richard? Oh, no, no! ejaculated Ellen in a tone of ineffable anguish. And then the thought of who the father of her child really was flashed across her memory. She gave utterance to a terrible moan and sank backwards, senseless, upon the floor. "'Ellen! Ellen!' cried the old man. "'Ellen! My dearest daughter! Oh! I have killed her!' At that moment Marian, bearing a light, entered the room. "'Water! Water!' exclaimed the agonised father. "'She is insensible! She is dying!' Then, hastily filling a tumbler from a decanter of water, which stood upon the toilet table, he knelt down by the side of his daughter and bathed her temples. In a few moments Ellen partially recovered and gazed wildly around her. "'My sweet child,' murmured the old man, pressing her hand to his lips. "'Live, live for me. All shall be forgotten, all forgotten. I was harsh to thee, my Ellen, to thee who have always been so fond and so tender and so good to me.' "'Leave her, sir, for the present,' said Marian. "'Allow her to compose herself. "'This discovery has been almost too much for her.' "'I will,' returned Mr. Munro. "'You must stay with her, good Marian, "'and in the morning I will come and see her.' "'The old man then withdrew. "'End of section 55《This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Recording by Dave Wills. The Father and Daughter. 
Ellen was lying pale and tearful in her bed, by the side of which sat her father. The past night had worked a fearful change in the old man. His countenance was haggard, his look desolate and forlorn. At one moment his lips quivered, as if with concentrated rage. At another he wiped tears from his eyes. Ellen watched him with the deepest interest. "'And you persist in refusing to acquaint me with the name of him who has dishonoured you?' said the old man, in slow and measured terms. "'Oh, my dear father, why will you persist in torturing me?' exclaimed Ellen. "'Do you think that I have not suffered enough?' "'Oh, I can well believe that you have suffered, Ellen, suffered profoundly,' returned Munro. "'for you were reared in the ways of virtue, "'and you could not have fallen into those crimes without remorse. "'Suffered? "'But how have I not suffered during the last few hours? "'When I read that fearful secret, I became a madman. "'I had but two ideas. "'My daughter was a mother, and her child's name was Richard. "'What could I think?' I went straight to the room where our benefactor was sitting. I closed the door. I approached him with the rage of a demon in my breast, and I said, Villain, is my daughter's honour the price of the hospitality which you have shown towards me? He was thunderstruck, and I showed him the letter. He burst into tears, exclaiming, Could you believe me capable of such an infernal atrocity? Then we reasoned together. We conversed upon the subject, and his noble frankness of manner convinced me that I had erred, grossly erred. He implored me to allow the night to pass. Uh, I revealed to you the appalling discovery which I had made. He dreaded the effects of my excited state of mind. He thought that rest would calm me. But there was no rest for me. I retired to my room, and there, when alone, I felt that I could not endure meditation. I came to your chamber, and then, O oh God, the doubt to which I had yet so fondly clung was dissipated. My dear father, if you knew all, said Ellen, weeping, you would pity me, oh, you would pity me. Do not think that I surrendered myself to him who is the father of my child in a moment of passion. Do not imagine that the weakness was preceded by affection on my part for him who led me astray. Unhappy girl, what mean you? ejaculated Mr. Monroe. Would you rob yourself of the only plea of extenuation which a woman in such a case can offer? Speak, Ellen. I will tell you all, that is, all I know, said Ellen with a blush. You remember that when we retained to live in that horrible court in Golden Lane, the second since we were reduced to poverty, you remember what fearful privations we endured? At length our misery reached the point where it became intolerable, and one morning you set out with the determination of seeking relief from the bounty of Richard Markham. I well remember it, said Munro. Proceed. You can then call to mind the circumstance of my absence when you returned home to our miserable abode. I do, I do. Hours passed. I had gold, and you were absent, ejaculated the old man with feverish impatience. And when I returned home late, continued Ellen, her voice scarcely rising above a whisper, and her face, neck, and bosom suffused with burning blushes, did I not bring you gold also? "'Merciful heavens!' cried Munro, starting from his seat. "'Say no more, Helen, say no more, or I shall go mad. "'Oh, God! I comprehend it all. "'You went and sold yourself to some libertine for gold.' "'The old man threw himself into his daughter's arms and wept bitterly. "'Father, dear father, calm yourself,' said Ellen. I, "'I could not see you want. "'I had no faith in the success of your appeal to him "'who has since been our benefactor. "'I thought that there was but one resource left. "'But,' she added, her eyes kindling with the fire of pride, "'while her father sank back into his seat, "'I called my God to witness that I acted not thus for myself. "'Oh, no, death sooner would have been my fate.' "'But you, my dear father, you wanted bread, you were starving, and, and that was more than I could bear.' 
I sinned but once, but once, and never, never have I ceased to repent of that fateful step, for my one crime bore its fruit. Monroe was convulsed with grief. The tears trickled through the wrinkled hands with which he covered his venerable countenance. His voice was lost in agonizing sobs, and all he could utter were the words, Ellen, my daughter, it is for me to ask pardon of you. Oh, say not so, dear father, say not so, ejaculated Miss Munro, throwing her arms around him and kissing his forehead and hands. No, my dear father, it was not your fault if misery drove me to despair. But now you perceive, she added solemnly, that I was more to be pitied than to be blamed, and, and, she murmured, the falsehood at such a moment almost suffocating her, you understand why I cannot tell you who was the father of my child. There was something so terrible in the idea that a young, virtuous, and lovely girl had prostituted herself to the first unknown libertine who had bid a price for her charms. Something so appalling to a father in the thought that his only child had been urged by excess of misery and profound affection for him to such a dismal fate that Munro seemed to sink under the blow. For some time did his daughter vainly endeavour to solace him, and it was only when she herself began to rave and beat her bosom with anguish and despair that the old man was recalled to a sense of the necessity of calming his almost invincible emotions. The father and daughter were at length restored to partial tranquillity by each other's endeavours at reciprocal consolation, and were commingling their tears together when the door opened. Markham, followed by Marian, entered the room. But what was the surprise of Mr. Munro? What was the joy of Ellen when Marian advanced towards the bed and presented the child to his mother? A parent must not be separated from her offspring, said Richard. Henceforth, Ellen, that infant must be nurtured by thee. Oh, good, generous friend, my more than brother, exclaimed Ellen, with an ebullition of feeling that might almost be termed a wild paroxysm of joy and she pressed the infant to her bosom. Richard, said Mr. Munro, you possess the noblest soul that ever yet blessed or adorned a human being. Marian stooped over the bed, apparently to caress the sleeping infant, but in reality to whisper these words in Ellen's ears. Fear nothing. I was sent to fetch the child, and Mr. Wentworth will keep your secret inviolably. Ellen cast a look of profound gratitude upon Marian, for this welcome announcement assured her that the surgeon would never admit the fact of possessing any clue, direct or indirect, to the father of the babe which she held in her arms. In a few minutes, we say, she turned to her father and said, Our benefactor's goodness deserves every explanation from us. Tell him the extent of my misfortune. Reveal to him the origin and cause of my shame. Let nothing be concealed. Ellen, said Richard, I know all. Forgive me, but I reached the door of your room when you were telling your sad tale to your father, and I paused because I considered that it was improper to interrupt you at such a moment. And if I overheard that affecting narrative, it was not a mean curiosity which made me stop and listen. It was the deep interest which I now more than ever feel in your behalf. And you do not despise me, said Ellen, hanging down her head. Despise you? ejaculated Richard. I deeply sympathize with you. Oh, no, you are not criminal. You are unfortunate. Your soul is pure and spotless. But the world... What will the world think, said Ellen, when I am seen with this babe in my arms? The world has not treated you so well, Ellen, returned Markham, that its smiles should be deeply valued. Let the world say what it will. It would be unnatural, inhuman, to separate a mother from her child, unless, indeed, he added, it is your desire that the innocent should be nursed amongst strangers. Oh, no, no! But my unhappy situation shall not menace your tranquillity, nor shall the tongue of scandal gather food from the fact of the residence of an unwedded mother beneath your roof. I will retire with my father to some secluded spot. Ellen, interrupted Markham, 
Were I to permit that arrangement, it would seem as if I were not sincere in the interest and commiseration, instead of the blame which I ere now expressed concerning you. No, unless you and your father be wearied of the monotonous life which you lead with me, here will you both continue to dwell, and let the world indulge in its idle comments as it will. Your benevolence finds a reason for every good deed which you practice, said Ellen. Ah, Richard, you should have been born a prince, with a princely fortune. How many thousands would then have been benefited by your boundless philanthropy? My own misfortunes have taught me to feel for those of others, answered Richard. And if the world were more anxious than it is to substitute sympathy for vituperation, society would not be the compound of selfishness, slander, envy, and malignity that it now is. It is settled then, Richard, murmured Ellen, that my babe shall henceforth experience a mother's care. And Ellen covered her child with kisses and with tears. At that moment the infant awoke, and a smile played over its innocent countenance. Ellen pressed it more closely and more fondly to her bosom. End of section 56《セクション57 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills A Change of Fortune It was about three o'clock in the afternoon that the Earl of Warrington alighted from his horse at the door of Mrs. Arlington's residence in Dover Street. Giving his horse in charge to his mounted groom, the nobleman entered the dwelling. The enchantress received him in the drawing-room, but, to her surprise, the air of the earl was cold and formal. He seated himself in a chair at a distance from the sofa which Diana occupied, and for some moments he uttered not a word. A sentiment of pride prevented her from saying anything to elicit an explanation of his ceremonial manner, because she was not aware that she was guilty of a fault meriting such treatment. At length that silence, most embarrassing to both, was broken by the earl. Diana, he said, we must separate. You have conducted yourself in a manner that has made me the laughing-stock of all who know me. My lord, exclaimed Diana, perfectly astonished at this accusation. You must have been misinformed, or are you bantering me? Neither the one nor the other, replied the earl. You may probably conceive whether I am inclined to jest when I state that your kind consideration towards Sir Rupert Harborough has reached my ears. Indeed, my lord, cried Diana, I do not attempt to deny that I forwarded anonymously to Sir Rupert Harborough a sum of money to extricate him from a fearful embarrassment. It would be unmanly in me to do more than remind you whence came that money which you could afford to fling away upon an unprincipled profligate, said the Earl of Warrington. At the same time, you cannot suppose that it is pleasant to my feelings to learn that the world makes itself merry at my expense. Your lordship is aware that I am the last person in existence to do aught to occasion you the slightest uneasiness. Uh, perhaps I was wrong. You cannot, with your good sense, think otherwise. But let us not dispute upon the point. The thing is done and cannot be recalled. But its effect is fatal to our connection. Your lordship does not mean— I mean that we must separate Diana, interrupted the nobleman firmly. Is my fault irreparable in your eyes? asked the enchantress, tears trickling down her cheeks. No man can endure ridicule, and I am particularly sensitive in that respect. But where did you learn that such was the result of my foolish kindness? said Diana, almost bewildered by the suddenness with which this blow had come upon her. I will give you every explanation you require, as in duty bound, replied the earl. Captain Fitzharding, an officer in the Grenadier Guards, is an acquaintance of mine. He is a visitor at the house of Sir Rupert Harborough and last evening Lady Cecilia Harborough told him what she called a capital anecdote of how she had cheated her husband out of a thousand pounds. Then it appears they laughed heartily at this excellent joke, and Lady Cecilia proceeded to inform him that she had discovered 
whence the handsome subsidy emanated. She concluded in terms more galling than polite by ridiculing the Earl of Warrington, who was foolish enough to supply Mrs. Arlington so munificently with money that she was enabled to spare some for her ancient lovers. You have asked me for the plain truth, and I have told it, as Captain Fitzharding stated it to me. And thus a trivial indiscretion on my part has created all this mischief, sobbed the enchantress. You have acted most unwisely, Diana. I will not go so far as to say that you must have had some particular motive in forwarding that money to one who— Heaven knows the purity of my motive, exclaimed Diana, wiping away her tears and glancing proudly towards the nobleman. The world will scarcely admit that purity of motive in such a case was possible. Consider the inferences that must be drawn. And do you, my lord, believe that any unworthy reason of that kind led me to assist Sir Rupert Harborough? demanded the enchantress. If I may judge by your outward conduct towards me, I should give a decided negative reply to your question. But we should no longer be happy in each other's society where the least ground for unpleasant suspicion existed. We will then separate, but separate as good friends. Be it so, my lord, said Diana, the flush of injured pride dyeing her cheeks, while she conquered the emotions that rose in her bosom. The lease of this house and everything it contains are yours, continued the earl, after a moment's pause. In this pocket-book there is a cheque. No, my lord, interrupted Diana, your bounty has already done much for me, more than you seem to think I have deserved. I cannot accept another favour at your lordship's hands. The Earl of Warrington was struck by this answer, which proved that his mistress was not selfish, and for a few moments he was on the point of making overtures for a reconciliation. But the dread of ridicule, the fear of being laughed at as a man who kept a mistress for the benefit of others, the horror of being made the laughing-stock of all the rakes and demi-reps in London smothered the lenient feelings that had awoken in his breast. You refuse to accept this token of my friendship, Diana? he said. I must beg most respectfully to decline it, my lord, with fervent gratitude, nevertheless for your generosity. Again the earl wavered. He looked at that beautiful woman who had been so charming and fascinating a companion, who had advised him as a faithful friend in various matters upon which he had consulted her, and who, to all appearance, had conducted herself so well towards him, save in this one instance. He gazed upon her for a few moments, and his stern resolves melted rapidly away. Diana, he said, we— At that moment the sounds of voices in the street caused him to turn his head towards the window, and he perceived Captain Fitzharding and another gentleman riding by on horseback. They were laughing heartily and gazing towards the house. The Earl of Warrington's sensitive mind instantly suggested to him the idea that the anecdote of the thousand pounds was being again retold, and most probably accompanied by the intimation that that was the house of the complacent Earl of Warrington's mistress. The enchantress, with that keen perception that characterizes woman, had seen all that was passing in the Earl's mind, had observed him waver twice, and had felt convinced on the second occasion that he would court a reconciliation. But when these voices and that hearty laugh from the street fell upon her ears, and when she saw the blood rush to the earl's countenance as he glanced in that direction, she knew that all was over. The earl rose and said, Give me your hand, Diana. We will part, as I said, good friends, and remember that I shall always be ready to serve you. Farewell. Farewell, my lord, returned Mrs. Arlington, extending her hand which the nobleman pressed with lingering tenderness. Then, afraid of another excess of weakness, the Earl of Warrington wrung her hand formally and precipitated himself from the room. The enchantress hurried to the window, concealed herself behind the curtain, and watched him as he mounted his horse to depart. He did not glance once upwards to the window. Perhaps he knew that she was there, and yet her pride prompted her to conceal herself in that manner. When he was out of sight, she threw herself upon the sofa and wept. "'Oh, if I had but said one word when his hand pressed mine!' she exclaimed. "'I might still have retained him. He is gone. My best, my only friend!' 
but Diana was not a woman to give way to grief for any length of time. She possessed great mental fortitude, which, though subdued for a short space, soon rose predominant over this cruel affliction. Then she began to reflect her position. She had a house beautifully furnished, and she possessed a considerable sum of ready money. She had therefore no disquietude for the present, but a little apprehension for the future, for she knew that her personal beauty and mental qualifications would soon bring another lover to her feet. But she seriously thought of renouncing the species of life to which she had for some years been devoted. She longed to live independently and respectably. In this frame of mind she passed the remainder of the day, pondering upon a variety of plans in accordance with her new desire. She retired early to rest, but not feeling an inclination to sleep, she amused herself with a book. The candle stood upon a table by the side of the bed, and Diana, luxuriously propped up by the downy pillows, called the choicest flowers from Byron's miscellaneous poetic wealth. An hour elapsed, and at length she grew sleepy. The book fell from her hand, and her eyelids closed. Then she remembered no more, until she was suddenly aroused by a sensation of acute pain. She started up, and found the bed enveloped in flames. She sprang upon the floor, but her nightdress was on fire. She threw herself on the carpet, and rolled over and over in terrible agony, piercing screams issuing from her lips. Those screams were echoed by loud cries of fire from the street, and then there was a rush of footsteps upon the stairs. The door of the chamber was forced open, and Diana was caught up in the arms of a policeman who had effected an entry to the house through the ground-floor windows. She was carried in a state of insensibility down into the parlour, where a cloak was hastily thrown over her, and she was conveyed to a neighbouring hotel. Fortunately, a medical man was passing at the moment, and he tendered his aid. Meanwhile, the fire spread with astonishing rapidity. The servants were extricated from the burning pile, but little property was saved. A considerable time elapsed before the engines arrived, and when they did reach the spot, an adequate supply of water could not be procured, as the springs were ice-bound by the frost. An immense crowd collected in the street, and all was bustle or curiosity. The broad red flames shot upwards with a roar like that of a furnace. The scene for a good distance around was as light as noonday, and the heavens immediately above appeared to be on fire. At one time the neighbouring houses were endangered, but suddenly the roof of the burning tenement fell in with a terrific crash, and then the conflagration seemed smothered. But in a few minutes the flame shot upwards once more, and another hour elapsed ere it was completely subdued. The newspapers announced next morning that Mrs. Arlington's property was not insured, and that the lady herself lay in a most precarious state at the hotel to which she had been conveyed. End of section 57section fifty eight of the mysteries of london volume one part two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dave wills his child mr greenwood was sitting in his study the handsomely fitted up room which we have before described the same morning on which the babe was restored to its mother through the admirable feeling of richard markham Mr. Greenwood was studying speeches for the ensuing session of Parliament. He employed two secretaries who composed his orations. One did the dry details, and the other the declamatory and rhetorical portions. Each received thirty shillings a week, and worked from nine in the morning until nine at night, with half an hour three times a day for meals, which said meals were enjoyed at their own expense and then Mr. Greenwood hoped to reap all the honours resulting from this drudgery on the part of his clerks. The studies of the Member of Parliament were interrupted by the introduction of Mr. Arthur Chichester. "'I'm off to French tomorrow, said this gentleman, throwing himself lazily upon a sofa, "'and I called to see if I could do anything for you on that side of the water.' "'No, nothing,' answered Greenwood. "'Do you propose to make a long stay in France?' "'I shall honour Paris with my presence for about a month,' said Chichester. 
"'During which time,' added Greenwood with a smile, "'you will contrive to get rid of all the money "'which Mrs. Viola Chichester so generously supplied.' <laughs> "'Generous indeed,' said Chichester, laughing heartily. "'So far from thinking of running through the money, "'I hope to double it. "'Although the public gambling houses have been abolished in France, "'there is plenty of play at the private clubs. "'But you must not imagine that I have a perfect fortune in my possession.' The means adopted to obtain the cash cost a mint of money. There were five hundred pounds to Tomlinson for his assistance, five hundred to you for your aid, advice, and advances. <laughs> there is a splendid alliteration for you, and three hundred to poor Anthony Tidkins. Poor indeed, ejaculated Greenwood. According to what you told me, the miserable wretch must be in a blessed state of pecuniary nudity. It is perfectly true, said Chichester. When he came to me in Tomlinson on the night that Viola was to be released, in the dark alley adjoining his house, he was like a furious hyena. It seems that he had woken up ten minutes before the hour appointed for our meeting, and then discovered his loss, as I before described it to you. I should not like to have such a man as my enemy, observed Greenwood carelessly. Nor I. Bless us, how he did swear! I never heard such imprecations come from a human being's mouth before. He vowed that he would undertake no other business, nor devote himself to any other pursuit, until he had traced the woman who had robbed him, and avenged himself upon her. Flaying alive, he said, was too good for her. <laughs> well, I gave him twenty pounds, poor devil, through good nature, and Tomlinson gave him ten through fear for it appears that this Titkins exercises some extraordinary influence over that cowardly stockbroker. <laughs> said Greenwood. And so poor Titkins, he added, did not set out on his travels after the thief empty-handed? By no means, but he is a useful fellow, and one might want him again. True, said Greenwood, he is one of the necessary implements which men of the world must make use of at times to carve out their way to fortune. Have you heard anything of your beloved wife? Nothing more than what I have already told you, answered Chichester. She has given up her abode at Cambridge Heath Gate, and taken apartments at a house in the very heart of the city, and where there are plenty of other lodgers. She is determined to be secure. However, continued Chichester with a smile, so long as she holds her tongue about that little matter, which she seemed inclined to do, she need not fear any further molestation from me. I question whether you would have released her that evening had she not made her escape, said Greenwood. Oh, indeed I should, returned Chichester. I did not wish to push things too far, and I really believe that another week's confinement in that terrible place which I have described to you would have turned her mad in reality. Then again, I should have been afraid of that cowardly, snivelling fool Tomlinson, who insisted upon accompanying me to ensure her release. That man has every inclination to be a downright rogue, but he lacks the courage. Have you seen your friend Harborough lately? inquired Greenwood. To tell you the truth, he is going with me on my present expedition to Paris. His name, you know, sounds well. Sir Rupert Harborough Bart. "'Son-in-law of Lord Tremorden, eh?' "'His name must be somewhat worn out, I should imagine,' observed Greenwood, playing with his watch-chain. "'Have you seen Lady Cecilia?' "'No, she has her suite of apartments, and Sir Rupert has his. They do not interfere with each other. Sir Rupert, however, has noticed that Lady Cecilia has a great many visitors of the male sex, and, amongst others, an officer of the Grenadier Guards.' Seven feet seven inches high, including his bearskin cap. Indeed, Lady Cecilia is then becoming a confirmed demi rep, observed Greenwood, without pausing to think who had helped to make her so. There is no doubt of that, said Chichester, but you seem up to your neck in business as usual. Yes, I am busily engaged on behalf of the Tory party, answered Greenwood. The future Premier has great confidence in me. I have brought him over seven votes from the Whig side during the recess, and the moment the Tories succeed to power, I shall be rewarded with a baronetcy. You're making your way famously in the world, said Chichester, rising to leave. 
Uh, "'Pretty well, pretty well,' returned Greenwood with a complacent smile. Chichester then shook hands with his friend and departed. Half an hour elapsed, during which Mr. Greenwood pursued his studies, when he was again interrupted by the entrance of a visitor. This time it was Mr. Tomlinson, the stockbroker. After having transacted a little pecuniary business together, Greenwood said, "'What have you done with the old man? I have taken lodgings for him in an obscure street in Bethnal Green, and there he is residing,' answered Tomlinson. "'My plan was better,' observed Greenwood dogmatically. "'You should have had him locked up in one of Titkin's subterranean cells, "'and allowed three or four shillings a week for his maintenance.' "'Impossible!' cried Tomlinson indignantly. "'I could never have acted so unmanly, so ungrateful, so atrocious a part.' "'Well, just as you please,' returned the Member of Parliament. "'Of course, you know best.' Uh, "'We will not discuss that point,' said Tomlinson. That is precisely what I said some time since to a deputation from the free and independent electors of Rottenborough, when they sent to remonstrate with me on a certain portion of my parliamentary conduct, observed Mr. Greenwood. At this moment Lafleur entered, and whispered something in his master's ear. Tomlinson took his leave, and the valet proceeded to admit Marion into the presence of his master. Ah, exclaimed Mr. Greenwood, anything wrong, Marion? "'That may be according to the light in which you view the news I am come to communicate, sir,' replied the servant. "'In a word, Miss Munro's father and Mr. Markham have discovered all.' "'All? No, not all!' cried Greenwood, turning deadly pale. "'Surely Ellen could not.' "'When I said all, sir,' replied Marian, "'I was wrong. Mr. Munro and my master have discovered that Miss Ellen is a mother.' and that her child is now with her. What? At Markham Place? demanded Greenwood. Yes, sir. And is it known also who, what person, the, the father, I mean? Miss Ellen has maintained that a profound secret, sir, said Mary. Thank heaven, ejaculated Greenwood, now breathing freely. But Mr. Wentworth, the surgeon, he has also promised to remain dumb relative to what little he knows. "'You are best aware, sir, whether Miss Munro has studied your wishes "'or your interests in remaining silent herself relative to you "'and in recommending Mr Wentworth through me "'to say nothing that may prove that she is really acquainted "'with the father of her child. "'But how was the discovery made? Tell me all!' exclaimed Greenwood impatiently. "'The explanation is short.' Mr. Wentworth sent a note relative to the health of the infant last evening to Miss Munro, and she inadvertently left it upon the table in the same room where her father was sitting. And her father, and, and Richard, uh, Mr. Markham, I mean, said Greenwood, are acquainted but with the bare fact that she is a mother? That is all, sir. But, oh, if you only knew the excuse that Miss Ellen made to avoid additional explanations— continued Marian. You yourself, yes, you, sir, would be affected. What was that excuse? demanded Greenwood. I can scarcely believe for one moment that it was true, said Marian, musing rather than replying to his question. But what was it? cried the Member of Parliament impatiently. Oh, she spoke of the misery to which her father and herself had once been reduced, and she said that, prompted by despair, she had sold her virtue to one whom she knew not, whom she had never seen before nor since. Ah, she said that, murmured Greenwood. And were her father and your master satisfied? The old man wept well nigh to break his heart and Mr. Markham said that henceforth the child should stay with its mother in his house. Oh, sir, there lives not a man of nobler disposition than my master. He is all that is generous, humane, liberal and upright. Mr. Greenwood turned aside and appeared to contemplate some papers with deep interest for nearly a minute, and then he passed a handkerchief rapidly over his face. Marian thought, as she afterwards informed Ellen, that he wiped tears from his eyes. He made no reply, however, to her observations, but rang the bell for his French valet. When Lafleur entered the room, Mr. Greenwood said, "'You will proceed immediately to the abode of Mr. Wentworth at Holloway. 
you will hand him from me this banknote for fifty pounds, and you will say to him these words. As the child has been removed through an unforeseen occurrence from your care, its father sends you this as a small token of his gratitude for the kindness you have manifested towards it, and he hopes that, should you be questioned upon the subject, you will not reveal the fact that you ever had had the slightest communication from his father. Go and return quickly. Le Fleur received the banknote, bowed, and left the room. You can inform Miss Munro of the step which I have thus taken to ensure the surgeon's secrecy, said Greenwood, addressing himself to Marian. I shall not fail to do so, sir, answered the servant. She then withdrew. When the door closed behind her, Greenwood threw himself back in his chair, murmuring, My child beneath Richard's roof! End of section 58section fifty nine of the mysteries of london volume one part two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dave wills aristocratic morals it was still dark though past seven o'clock on the morning which succeeded the fire when a somewhat strange scene occurred at the house of sir rupert harborough in tavistock square the baronet, in his slippers and dressing-gown, cautiously descended the stairs, guiding himself with his left hand, placed upon the balustrade, and conducting a young female with his right. They maintained a profound silence, and stole down so carefully that it was easy to perceive that they were fearful of alarming the household. But while he was still descending the stairs, leading the young female, who was fully dressed, even to her bonnet and shawl, the following thoughts passed rapidly through the mind of the baronet. After all, it is absurd for me to take this trouble to get my new mistress secretly out of the house. Why should she not walk boldly in and out, night and day, I wonder? Upon my honour, I have a great mind that she should. But no. Whatever agreement exists between me and Lady Cecilia, a certain degree of decency must be observed before the servants, and for the sake of one's character with the neighbours. After all, prudence is perhaps the best system. His thoughts were at this moment interrupted by steps upon the stairs, which evidently were not the echoes of those of himself and his paramour. He paused and listened. Those steps were descending with great apparent caution, and yet a little more heavily than was quite consistent with entire secrecy. The baronet, leading his mistress hastily after him, crossed the hall and then drew her along with him into an obscure corner near the front door. "'Silence, Caroline, silence,' he whispered. "'It is most likely the housemaid.' The baronet and his mistress accordingly remained as quiet as mice in the corner where they were concealed. Meantime the steps gradually grew nearer and nearer, and now and then a low and suppressed whisper on the stairs met the baronet's ear. A vague suspicion that some adventure, which those who were interested in it were anxious to conduct with as much secrecy as possible, was in progress, now entered the mind of Sir Rupert Harbour. He accordingly became all attention. And now the steps ceased to echo upon the stairs, but advanced towards the front door. The hall was pitch dark, but the baronet was satisfied that two persons, a male and female, were the actors in the proceeding which now interested him, and all doubt on this head was banished from his mind when they halted within a few feet of the corner where he and his mistress were concealed. Then. The whispering between the two persons whose conduct he was watching recommenced. "'Farewell, dearest Cecilia,' said the low and subdued voice of a man. "'Farewell, beloved Fitzharding,' answered the other voice, with whose intonation, in spite of the whisper in which it was spoken, the baronet was full well acquainted. Then there was the billing murmur of kisses, which continued for some moments. "'When shall we meet again, dearest?' demanded Fitzharding, still in the same low tone. "'Tonight, at the usual hour, I will admit you,' returned Lady Cecilia. "'Sir Rupert goes to France tonight with his splendid friend, Chichester. 
"'Thank heaven for that blessing,' said the grenadier guardsman. "'And now adieu, sweet Cecilia, until this evening. "'But tell me before I depart, "'shall I always find you the same warm, "'loving, devoted, fond creature you now are? "'Always, always to you,' was the murmuring reply. "'Then kisses were exchanged again, "'and am I indeed the first whom you have ever really loved? "'Am I the only one who has ever tasted the pleasures of heaven in your arms, "'save your husband?' continued the officer, "'intoxicated with the reminiscences of the night of bliss "'which he had enjoyed with his paramour. "'Oh, tell me so once again, only once. "'You know that you alone could have tempted me to weakness, Fitzharding, answered the fair but guilty patrician lady. You alone could have induced me to forget my marriage vows. Now I shall depart happy, my beloved Cecilia, said the officer, and again he imprinted burning kisses upon the lady's lips. He then turned towards the front door and endeavoured to remove the chain but it had become entangled with the key in some way or another, and he could not detach it. "'What is the matter?' inquired Cecilia anxiously. "'This infernal chain is fast,' answered the officer, "'and, oh, and all I can do will not move it.' "'Let me try,' said the lady, but her attempt was as vain as that of her lover. "'What is to be done?' asked Fitzharding. "'God knows,' returned Cecilia, "'and it is growing late. "'In half an hour it will be daylight. "'Besides, the servants will be about presently.' "'The devil!' said the officer impatiently. "'Stay!' whispered Lady Cecilia. "'I will go to the kitchen and obtain a light. "'Do not, not move from this spot. "'I will not be a moment.' "'She then glided away, "'and the officer remained at his post "'as motionless and as silent as a statue.' for fear of alarming the inmates of the house. His thoughts were not, however, of the most pleasurable kind, and during the two minutes that Lady Cecilia was absent, his mind rapidly pictured all the probable consequences of detection, exposure, ridicule, lawsuit damages, the Queen's bench prison, the divorce of the lady, and the necessity under which he should labour of making her his own wife. This gloomy perspective was suddenly enlivened by the gleam of a candle at the farther end of the hall, and which was immediately followed by the appearance of Lady Cecilia with a light. Still, the corner in which Sir Rupert and his paramour were concealed was veiled in obscurity, while the baronet obtained a full view of the tall guardsman, dressed in plain clothes, standing within a couple of yards of his hiding-place, and also of Lady Cecilia, attired in a loose dressing-gown, as she advanced rapidly towards the place where her lover awaited her. But when Cecilia reached the immediate vicinity of the front door, the gleam of the candle fell upon that nook which had hitherto remained buried in obscurity. A scream escaped the lady's lips, and the candle fell from her hands. Fortunately, it was not extinguished. Sir Rupert rushed forward and caught it up in time to preserve the light. Then, at a single glance, these four persons became aware of each other's position. A loud laugh escaped the lips of the baronet. <laughs> Sir, said the officer, advancing towards him, for all our sakes avoid exposure, but if you require any satisfaction at my hand, you know who I am and where I reside. Satisfaction, exclaimed Lady Cecilia ironically for she had recovered her presence of mind the moment she had perceived the equivocal position in which her husband himself was placed in respect to the female who stood quivering and quaking behind him. What satisfaction can Sir Rupert Harbour require when he admits such a creature as that into his house? And she pointed, with a disdain and a disgust by no means affected, towards her husband's paramour. Creature indeed! cried the young woman, now irritated and excited in her turn. I think I am as honest as you, my lady, at all events. Rich, murmured Cecilia between her teeth, as if the sight of the creature filled her with abhorrence and loathing. Ah, haughty lady, thou could thyself sin through lust, but thou couldst not brook the sight of one who sinned for bread. 
the young woman, overawed by the air of insuperable disgust which marked the proud patrician at that moment, recoiled from her presence and burst into tears. "'Come, enough of this folly,' said Sir Rupert impatiently. "'We shall have the servants here in a moment. Perhaps you and this gentleman,' he concluded, "'will step into that room for a moment while I open the door for my little companion here.' Lady Cecilia tossed her head disdainfully, darted a look of sovereign contempt upon the abashed Caroline, and beckoned Captain Fitzharding to follow her into the adjacent parlour. Sir Rupert retained the light. He opened the door, the chain of which had only become entangled, round the key, and dismissed his paramour, who was delighted to escape from that house where the terrible looks of the lady had so disconcerted her. The baronet then repaired to the parlour, and having locked the door to prevent the intrusion of the servants, threw himself upon the sofa. Well, on my honour! <laughs> he exclaimed, bursting into a loud fit of laughter. This is one of the most pleasant adventures that I ever heard or read of, upon my honour. Have you requested me to wait here in order to contribute to your hilarity, sir? demanded Captain Fitzharding indignantly. My dear fellow, returned the baronet, let us laugh in concert. Oh, I can assure you that you need fear no lawsuits nor pistols from me. Fear, sir, ejaculated the guardsman, I do not understand the word. Well, expect then, if that will suit you better, my dear captain, continued Sir Rupert Harborough. You see that my wife and myself act as we please, independently of each other. Sir Rupert, exclaimed Cecilia, who was by no means anxious that her lover should be made acquainted with the terms of the agreement into which she and her husband had entered a short time previously, and the nature of which the reader will remember. My dear Cecilia, observed the baronet, is it not much better that your friend should be made acquainted with the grounds on which you have admitted him as your sworn knight and only love? Cease this bantering, sir, cried Captain Fitzharding. Have I not already said that I am willing to give you any satisfaction which you may require? And must I again tell you, my dear fellow, returned the baronet, with an affection of familiarity which only made his words more bitter, must I again tell you that I have no satisfaction, that I have none to ask, and you none to give? But I cannot allow you to consider me a grovelling coward. I must explain to you the grounds on which my forbearance is based. Proceed, sir, said Captain Fitzharding coolly. You will then allow me to retire to my own room, exclaimed Lady Cecilia, rising from the chair in which she had thrown herself. "'No, my dear,' said the baronet, gently forcing her back into her seat. "'You must remain to corroborate the truth of what I am about to state to this gentleman.' Lady Cecilia resumed the chair from which she had risen, and made no reply. "'In one word, Captain Fitzharding,' continued the baronet, "'there is a mutual understanding between my wife and myself "'that we shall follow our own inclinations, whims and caprices, "'without reference to the ties which bind us, "'or the vows which we pledged at a church some years ago. "'All this may seem very strange. "'It is nevertheless true. "'Therefore I have no more right to quarrel with Lady Cecilia "'on your account than she has to abuse me on account of that young person whom you saw in this house just now. Now then, my dear captain, continued the baronet, his tone again becoming bitterly ironical, you may at your ease congratulate yourself on being the only person that Lady Cecilia has ever loved, and the only one on whom she has ever bestowed her favours with the exception of her husband. Then am I to understand, sir? said the officer, perfectly astounded at the turn which the affair had taken, that you do not consider yourself offended or aggravated by the—the— the... Not of wit, ejaculated the baronet. On the contrary, I have no doubt that we shall be excellent friends in future. The captain bowed and rose to depart. Rupert unlocked and opened the door for him, and then ushered him with affected politeness out of the house. When he returned to the parlour, he found Lady Cecilia red with indignation. "'What means this scene, Sir Rupert?' she said. "'After our mutual compact, 
my dear answered the baronet calmly you treated my little friend in a most unpleasant manner and i thought myself justified in retaliating to a certain extent besides i was compelled to give an explanation to a man who would have otherwise looked upon me as a card for failing to demand satisfaction of him but did you not consider that you had rendered me contemptible in his eyes demanded lady cecilia burning with spite never fear said the baronet confiding in your sweet assurances that he alone has ever possessed your love and that he alone save your husband has ever been blessed with the proofs of that affection he will return ere long to your aunts besides am i not going to france to-night with my splendid friend chichester this is cruel sir rupert if an accident made you acquainted with the conversation which passed between us an accident indeed interrupted sir rupert harbour an accident indeed <laughs> interrupted sir rupert harbour laughing affectedly upon my honour the entire adventure is one of the drollest that ever occurred but let us say no more upon the subject adhere to the compact on your side and do not insult my friends but a prostitute in my house ejaculated lady cecilia still loathing the idea and my wife's paramour in my house cried sir rupert oh there is something refined in an amour with one's equal said lady cecilia but a wretch of that description enough of this cried the baronet the servants are already about let us each retire to our own rooms and this suggestion was immediately adopted End of section 59。section 60 of the mysteries of London。volume 1 part 2。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by dave wills。the intrigues of a demi rep。lady cecilia retired to her own chamber。locked the door。threw herself upon the bed。and burst into tears。Oh, at that moment how she hated her husband, how she hated herself. She wept not in regard of her evil ways. She poured forth tears of spite when she thought of the opinion that her new lover must form of her, after the explanation given by Sir Rupert. For Captain Fitzharding was rich and confiding, and the fair patrician had calculated upon rendering him subservient alike to her necessities and her licentiousness. But now what must he think of one who bestowed upon him those favours that were alienated from her husband by a former compact? What opinion could he entertain of a woman who sinned deliberately by virtue of an understanding with him whom she had sworn to respect and obey? It could not be supposed that the morality of Captain Fitzharding was of a very elevated nature but in the occurrence of that morning there was something calculated to shock the mind the least delicate, the least refined. Yes, Lady Cecilia wept, for she thought of all this. And then her rage against her husband knew no bounds. The wretch, the cowardly wretch, she exclaimed aloud, as she almost gnashed her teeth with rage. Was he not born to be my ruin? from the moment that i saw him first until the present hour has he not been an evil genius in my way yes oh yes he is a demon sent to torture me in this world for my faults and failings seduced by him when i was very young i might have been plunged into disgrace and infamy had not my father purchased his consent to espouse me then the large sum that was paid to save my honour was squandered in the payment of his debts, or in ministering to his extravagances. Now what is our position? What is my position? Shunned by my own father and mother, I am left dependent on him who knows not how to obtain enough for himself, or else I, I, the daughter of a peer, must sell myself to some Mr. Greenwood or Captain Fitzharding for the means to support my rank. Oh, it is atrocious! I begin to loathe myself. Would that I were the mistress of some wealthy man who would be constant and kind towards me rather than the wife of this beggared baronet! Lady Cecilia rose from the bed, advanced towards the mirror, and smoothed her hair. 
Then she perceived that her eyes were red with weeping. Absurd, she exclaimed, a contemptuous smile curling her lips. Why should I shed tears upon the past which no human power can recall? Rather let me avail myself of the present and endeavour to provide for the future. Am I not young? And does not my glass tell me that I am beautiful? Even the immaculate, the taintless, the exemplary rector of St. David's paid me a compliment to my good looks when I met him at Lady Marlborough's a few days ago. Yes, and methinks that if the most evangelical of evangelical clergymen of the established church could for a moment be moved by my smile, if that admired preacher who publicly avows that he refrains from marriage upon principle, if that holy minister, who is quoted as a pattern to his class and as an example for the whole world, if he could whisper a word savouring of a compliment in my ear, and then seem ashamed at the moment of weakness into which his admiration had betrayed him, if my charms could effect so great a miracle as this, what may they not do for me in helping me on to fortune? She paused and considered herself for some minutes in the glass opposite to her. Yes, she cried, again breaking silence. I will no longer remain in the same house with my unprincipled and heartless husband. I will no longer breathe the tainted atmosphere which he inhabits. His very name is associated in my mind with forgery and felony. I will break the shackle which yet partially binds me to him. I will emancipate myself from the restraint and thraldom wherein I now exist. Fitzharding is rich and loving. Perhaps he may still feel the influence of the silken chain which I threw around his heart. We will see. If he comes gladly back to my feet, my aim is won. If not, well... And she smiled complacently. There are others as rich and handsome and as easily enchained as he... Lady Cecilia proceeded to her desk and wrote the following note. Come to me, dearest Fitzharding, at three precisely this afternoon. I have much to say respecting the specious falsehoods which Sir Rupert uttered this morning in order to conceal the natural cowardice of his disposition. He was afraid to involve himself in a quarrel with you, and he excused his unmanly forbearance by means of assertions that reflected upon me. Come, then, to me at three. I shall be alone and at home only to you. This note was immediately conveyed to Captain Fitzharding by Lady Cecilia's maid, who was the confidant of her mistress's intrigues. Having dispatched her missive, the baronet's wife proceeded to the duties of the toilet. This employment, breakfast, the newspaper and a novel, whiled away the time until about one o'clock, when Lady Cecilia, having ascertained that her husband had gone out half an hour previously, descended to the drawing-room. She was attired in a simple and unpretending manner, but then she knew that this style became her best. She was determined to captivate that day, and certainly she had seldom appeared to greater advantage. Her rich auburn hair, of a hue as warm as the disposition which it characterized, fell in long Hyperion ringlets about her sloping shoulders. Her blue eyes were expressive of a feeling of languid voluptuousness, and her pure complexion was set off by the dark dress that she wore. The timepiece on the mantel had scarcely struck two when a loud double knock at the front door resounded through the house. Lady Cecilia started from her seat, for she had forgotten to instruct the servants that she was only at home to Captain Fitzharding. But she was too late to remedy her neglect. The summons was already answered ere she had gained the landing on which the drawing-room opened. She accordingly returned to the sofa and composed herself to receive the visitor, whoever it might be. In a few moments the servant announced the Earl of Warrington. With this nobleman, Lady Cecilia was only very slightly acquainted, she having met him on two or three occasions some years previously at her father's house. "'I must apologise, Lady Harborough, uh, for this intrusion,' said the Earl. "'But I trust to your kindness to pardon me in that respect, and to afford me a little information concerning a matter which has suddenly assumed an air of importance in my eyes.' 
no apology is necessary for the honour which your lordship confers upon me by visiting my humble abode answered lady cecilia and with regard to the subject to which your lordship alludes i shall be happy to furnish any information in my power your ladyship's courtesy encourages me to proceed continued the earl forgive me if i must direct your attention to one of those pieces of gossip i will not say scandal which so often becomes current in the sphere in which we move i allude to an anecdote relative to a certain mysterious remittance of a thousand pounds which was forwarded to sir rupert harborough and which your ladyship undertook to disburse for his advantage your lordship places the matter in as delicate a way as possible <laughs> said lady cecilia affecting to laugh heartily in order to conceal the shame which she really experienced at this reference to her unworthy action but it was only a pleasant trick which i played sir rupert the truth is sir rupert is not the most generous man towards his wife and when i found that some honourable person was repaying him a debt contracted a long time previously i thought that as the amount fell so providentially into my hands i could not do better than appropriate it to the liquidation of the arrears of pin-money due to me very just madam said the earl forcing himself to smile at the incident which lady cecilia represented in the light of a venial little advantage by a wife against her husband i believe that the amount was forwarded anonymously to tell you the candid truth my lord answered lady cecilia the whole affair was so strange and romantic that i kept as a great curiosity the letter which accompanied the bank-note if you possess any interest in the matter your ladyship knows that i am not seeking this information without some object said the earl emphatically would it be indiscreet he added in a less serious tone to request a glimpse at that great curiosity oh by no means returned lady cecilia who affected to treat the whole matter as an excellent joke then rising from her seat she hastened to her work-box and in a few moments produced the letter <laughs> it was not so scented with musk <laughs> when i received it she added laughing uh, but it was redolent of a far more grateful flavour that of this world's mammon i believe mammon is the deity whom we all of four or less adore observed the earl of warrington gallantly taking up the tone of chit-chat rather than formality which lady cecilia endeavoured to infuse into the conversation then as he received the letter from her hand he said may i be permitted to read it oh certainly my lord and if you have any curiosity in the matter you are welcome to retain it answered lady cecilia with your leave i will do so said the earl and now that i have replied to all your lordship's queries continued lady cecilia may i ask one in my turn the earl bowed and smiled who was the indiscreet eavesdropper or tale-bearer that gave your lordship the hint concerning this business asked the baronet's wife methinks that your ladyship has been at no pains to conceal the affair said the earl and what hundreds have talked about cannot well be charged against an individual tale-bearer nay my lord i mentioned it but to two persons exclaimed cecilia the first was to sir rupert harborough in a moment of pique and the other was to a a, a a particular friend i am not indiscreet enough to ask for names interrupted the earl rising and he hastened to take his leave ere lady cecilia could reiterate her question relative to the person who had communicated to him the fact of the intercepted thousand pounds it was now nearly three o'clock when lady cecilia again composed herself to receive captain fitzharding punctual to the hour the officer was introduced into the drawing-room but his manner instead of being all love and tenderness was simply polite and friendly fitzharding said the lady i perceive that you have allowed yourself to be prejudiced against me not prejudice lady cecilia answered the guardsman but i confess that i am no longer under the influence of a blind passion the conduct of your husband this morning was that of a man who was acting consistently with the circumstances which he explained and not that of an individual who was playing a part in order to disguise the innate cowardice of his disposition no cecilia your husband is not a coward whatever else he may be 
and now one word relative to myself. As long as I believed that you made to me, as a proof of love, the generous sacrifice of conjugal fidelity, so long as I believed that an affection for me alone induced you to violate your marriage vow, then the dream was sweet, though not the less criminal. But when I discovered that you'd made no sacrifice to me, that you came not to my arms warm with a love that trembled at detection, but secure in the existence of a heartless compact with your husband. Then my eyes were open, and I saw that Lady Cecilia Harborough had risked nothing of all that she had pretended to risk, sacrificed nothing of all that she had affected to sacrifice for the sake of Captain Harding. Thus the delusion was destroyed, and although our amour might be based upon more impunity than I had ever conceived, it would be the less sweet. The charm, the spell, is broken. And have you come here to tell me all this, to insult me with your moralizings? demanded Lady Cecilia, the fire of indignation and wounded pride displacing the languid voluptuousness which had at first reigned in the expression of her eyes. No, not to insult you, Cecilia, answered the officer, but to explain in an open and candid manner the motive which leads me to say, let us forget the past as it regards each other. Be it so, said Lady Cecilia, deeply humiliated, and now hating the handsome officer much more than she ever liked him. In that case, sir, we have nothing more to say to each other. Captain Fitzhardy bowed and withdrew. Lady Cecilia fell back upon the sofa, murmuring, Beaten, beaten, defeated in this hope, and tears came into her eyes. But in a few moments she exclaimed, How foolish is this grief! How useless this indignation! Sorrow and hatred are the consuming enemies of female beauty. Did I not say ere now that there were others in the world as rich, as handsome, and as confiding as Captain Fitzharding? As she uttered those words aloud, the haughty beauty wiped her eyes and composed her countenance. She rose and advanced towards the mirror to assure herself that her appearance indicated naught of those tears which she had shed, and as she contemplated her features with a very pardonable pride, the reminiscence of the compliment which the clergyman of St. David's had paid her flashed to her mind. She smiled triumphantly as she pondered upon it and that vague, shadowy, unsubstantial phrase of flattery that now formed the topic of her thoughts gradually assumed a more palpable shape in her imagination, became invested with a significant meaning, then grew into a revelation of passion, and was at length embodied into a perfect romance of love with all its enjoyments and blisses. The ardent soul of that frail woman converted the immaculate clergyman into an admirer, betrayed in an unguarded moment into a confession of love, then changed him into a suitor kneeling at her feet, and by rapid degrees carried him on through all the mystic phrases of passion, until he became a happy lover, reclining on her bosom. With a presumption which only characterizes minds of her warm temperament and loose ideas of morality, Cecilia triumphed in the half-hour's impassioned reverie which succeeded the departure of Captain Fitzharding over the ascetic virtue and self-denying integrity which public opinion ascribed to the rector of St. David's. Then, when some trifling incident aroused her from this wild and romantic dream, she did not smile at its folly. She regarded it as a species of inspiration, prompting her in which direction to play the artillery of her charms. Yes, she exclaimed, musing aloud, he once said, I never saw you look so well as you appear this evening. Those words shall be a motto to a new chapter in my life. And she smiled triumphantly, as if her daring aim were already accomplished. Thirty-six years of age, she said abruptly, resuming her musings, wealthy, handsome, unmarried, from principle, and here an erratic smile of mingled satisfaction and irony played upon her rosy lips, and yet fond of society. The Reverend Reginald Tracy must no longer be permitted to remain proof against woman's beauty. Aye, and woman's wiles. Oh, no, he shall repeat to me 
but far more tenderly the words he uttered the other evening. His passing compliment shall become a permanent expression of his sentiments. But his character, his disposition, must I not study them? If that be necessary, the task is ready to hand. She rose from the sofa, and having selected an ecclesiastical magazine from some books that stood upon a chiffonniere, returned to her seat to peruse at leisure a sketch which the work contained of the character, ministry, and popularity of the rector of St. David's. End of section 60《Section 61 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills. The Reconciliation. In the meantime, the Earl of Warrington drove to the hotel in Dover Street where Diana Arlington lay, and upon inquiry he ascertained that a nurse and the medical attendant were with her. He desired to be conducted to a private room, and then dispatched the waiter to request the professional gentleman to step thither for a few moments. "'What name shall I say, sir?' asked the servant, who was unacquainted with the Earl's person. "'It is needless to mention any name,' replied the nobleman. "'I shall not detain the gentleman five minutes.' The servant disappeared, and in a few moments returned, followed by the medical attendant. The waiter introduced him into the apartment, and then withdrew. "'I believe, sir,' said the Earl, "'that you are attending upon a lady "'who experienced so severe an accident last night. "'I was by chance passing through Dover Street "'when the flames burst forth,' was the reply, "'and I gave immediate alarm to the police. "'I remained upon the spot to ascertain "'if my professional services could be rendered available, "'and it is well that I did so. "'The lady, then, is much injured?' said the earl in a tone expressive of emotion. Seriously injured, answered the surgeon, and as I live at some distance from this neighbourhood, I considered it proper to remain with the patient all night. Indeed, I have not left her for a moment since the accident occurred. Your attention shall be nobly recompensed, sir, said the earl. Here is my card, and I am your debtor. The surgeon bowed low as his eye glanced upon the name of the individual in whose presence he stood. "'And now,' continued the nobleman, "'answer me one question, candidly and sincerely. "'Will your patient be scarred by the effects of the fire?' "'My lord, that is more than I can answer for,' returned the surgeon. "'Fortunately, medical assistance was rendered the moment after the accident occurred, "'and this circumstance should inspire great hope.' "'Then I will hope,' said the earl. "'How long an interval do you imagine must elapse ere she may be pronounced convalescent?' Or rather, I should have asked, is she in any positive danger? There is always danger, great danger, in these cases, my lord. But, should the fever subside in a few days, I should recommend the removal of the patient to some quiet neighbourhood afar from the bustle of the West End. You said that you yourself reside some distance from hence, observed the earl, after a few moments' reflection. "'My abode is in Lower Holloway, my lord,' answered the surgeon, "'and my name is Wentworth.' "'Holloway is quiet and retired,' said the earl, "'but is not the air too bleak there at this season? "'It is pure and wholesome, my lord, "'and the spot is tranquil and devoid of the bustle of crowds "'and the din of carriages. "'Wherever Mrs. Arlington may remain until her recovery,' said the earl, "'she must receive all the attentions which can be lavished upon her.' and in nothing must she be thwarted where gold can procure her the gratification of her wishes. I would offer to place my house at the lady's disposal, my lord, and the intention of Mrs. Wentworth would be unremitting, but— Name the obstacle, said the earl. Perhaps you consider that the position of the lady with regard to myself, a position the nature of which you may have divined, is somewhat too equivocal to permit your wife. No, my lord, medical men have no scruples of that kind. I hesitated because I feared that my abode would be too humble. Then let that obstacle vanish this moment, interrupted the Earl. It is my wish that Mrs. Arlington should be removed to your house as soon as the step can be taken with safety to herself. You will then devote yourself to her cure, and on you I place my reliance. I have been unjust to her, Mr. Wentworth, continued the nobleman, pressing the surgeon's hand, and speaking in a low but hurried tone. 
I have been unjust to her, but I will make her ample reparation, that is, provided you can preserve her beauty, for we are all mortal, and I confess to a weakness. But no matter. Say you will do your best. My lord, I am poor and struggling with the world, answered the surgeon. And I may say, without vanity, because I possess certificates from eminent men under whom I have studied, I am not ignorant of my profession. My lord, I have every inducement to devote all the knowledge I possess to the aim which you desire. My attention shall be unwearied and unremitting, and if I succeed, if you succeed in restoring her to me in that perfection of beauty which invested her when I took leave of her yesterday, without a mark, without a scar, your fortune shall be my care, and you will have no need to entertain anxiety relative to the future with the Earl of Warrington as your patron. At present, my lord, all I can say is I will do my best, rejoined Mr. Wentworth. And at present I can ask no more, exclaimed the Earl. Then, after a moment's pause, he said, May I be allowed to see your patient for a few moments? The surgeon hesitated. I know why you dislike this proposal, observed the nobleman. You are afraid that when I contemplate the altered countenance of that woman who was lately so beautiful, I shall despair of her complete care. Such is indeed my impression, answered Mr. Wentworth. Those symptoms and appearances which are most alarming to persons unacquainted with the medical art are frequently the least causes of alarm to the professional man. Then let me speak to her and not see her, said the Earl. I understand, your lordship. In a few minutes I will return. And the surgeon withdrew. During his absence, the Earl paced the room in an agitated and excited manner, which was quite inconsistent with the usual equanimity and even gravity of his temperament. Ten minutes had elapsed when the surgeon came back. Will your lordship follow me? Mr. Wentworth led the way to the chamber in which Diana Arlington lay. The shutters were closed and the curtains were drawn around the bed. The room was nearly dark. A few struggling gleams of light alone forcing their way through the chinks in the shutters. When the Earl entered the apartment, the surgeon remained in the passage outside. The nurse had already been directed to retire for a short time. The nobleman approached the bed, and seating himself in a chair by the side, said, Diana, can you forgive me for my cruelty of yesterday? I never entertained a feeling of resentment, my lord, and therefore have nothing to forgive, was the answer, in a low and plaintive tone. I did you a serious wrong, Diana, continued the Earl, but I am not too proud to confess my error. I trembled at the idea of ridicule, hence the hastiness of my conduct. And then there was a suspicion in my mind, a suspicion which made me uneasy, very uneasy, but which is now dispelled. I have read your letter which accompanied the banknote addressed to Sir Rupert Harborough, and I am satisfied in respect to the integrity, nay, the generosity of your motives. It was kind of you, my lord, to take the steps necessary to reinstate me in your good opinion, murmured Diana from her couch, in a tone evidently subdued by deep emotion. There was no kindness in the performance of an act of justice, returned the earl, when I read in this morning's newspapers the sad account of the terrible accident of last night, my heart smote me for my conduct towards you. Then I reflected upon all the happiness which I had enjoyed in your society, and I was moved, deeply, profoundly moved. I dispatched the servant to this hotel to inquire if you were really as seriously injured as the journals represented and he brought me back word that your life was no longer in positive danger, but, but that I shall be a hideous object all the remainder of my days, added Diana, with somewhat of bitterness in her manner. God forbid, cried the Earl energetically. Mr. Wentworth seems to promise, alas, this medical art prompts its professors to console the mind in order to heal the body but I am not foolish enough to yield to a hope so baseless. These words were uttered in a tone of the most profound melancholy. Diana, you must hope, exclaimed the Earl of Warrington. You will recover, yes, you will recover, and even if a slight trace of this accident, a slight trace, almost screamed Diana, and the Earl could hear her roll herself convulsively over her pillow. 
a slight trace, my lord. I shall be disfigured for life. Nothing can save me. My countenance will be seared as with a red-hot iron. My neck will be covered with deep scars. My arms, my entire body will be furrowed with crimson and purple marks. Oh, God, it is hard to suffer thus. And then she burst into an agonizing flood of tears. The Earl allowed her to weep without interruption. He knew that her mind would be relieved by that outpouring of feeling. And he was right. In a few minutes, she said, Pardon me, I am weak, I am foolish. And now proceed to tell me how you became possessed of that note which I sent with the money to Sir Robert Harborough. The Earl of Warrington then related the particulars of his interview with Lady Cecilia. And now that I have done an act of justice and convinced myself of the purity of the motives which induced you to act in a manner that created my displeasure, continued the Earl, let us talk of yourself. I have made arrangements with Mr. Wentworth, which, I hope, will meet your approval, and be conducive to your benefit. When you can be removed with safety, you shall be conveyed from this bustle of an hotel in a crowded thoroughfare to the tranquil requirement of Mr. Wentworth's abode at Holloway. I am induced to place reliance upon the skill and talent of that man. I scarcely know why. Oh, yes, he is no doubt very clever, said the patient, for his treatment of me speedily gave me relief without the acuteness of the agony which I at first experienced. Everything shall be done to conduce to your comfort, Diana, resumed the nobleman. My upholsterer shall send down to Mr. Wentworth's house the furniture that may be required for the rooms which you are to occupy, and my steward shall supply him with ample funds. How kind! How good you are, murmured Diana. But I shall not attempt to see you, continued the Earl, until your recovery is announced to me, your complete recovery, and then he checked himself, and there was a long silence. Suddenly the Earl arose. Farewell. Diana, my presence is not calculated to calm you, he exclaimed. I shall now leave you, but remember, I watch over you from a distance. Farewell. Farewell till we meet again, said Diana, but oh, how shall I dread that day, and if my worst fears should be confirmed, if I really become the horrible, scarred, hideous object which I dread, then, then, we shall never meet more, for I will fly from the world and bury myself in some deep solitude, whether no one who ever knew me in my bright days should trace me. You will not be forced to adopt such an alternative. Diana, believe me, you will not, exclaimed the Earl. At all events, let us hope, let us both hope. The Earl hastily withdrew. In the passage he encountered the surgeon, to whom he reiterated his instructions relative to the attention to be shown towards the patient. Mr. Wentworth, he said in an emphatic tone, remember all that I have told you. Gold shall be placed at your disposal with no niggard hand. Spare no expense. That lady's complete restoration to her pristine beauty is your care. Think of naught save that one grand aim. My lord, answered the surgeon, I can only repeat the words I used just now. I will do my best. The earl pressed his hand warmly and hurried away, more affected by the incidents of that day than he had been for many, many days. End of section 61《Section 62 of the Mysteries of London》Volume 1, Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills The Rector of St. David's It is not necessary to explain to our readers the precise locality of the splendid Chapel of Ease known by the name of St. David's. Suffice it to say that it is situate not a hundred miles from Russell or Tavistock Square, and that the clergyman attached to it at the period of which we are writing was the Reverend Reginald Tracy. It was a Sunday morning. A crowd of well-dressed persons of both sexes poured into the chapel of St. David's. The street was lined with carriages, and when each in its turn drew up at the door of the sacred edifice, the elite of the aristocracy 
might have been observed to alight and, and hasten to form part of the immense congregation assembled to hear the most popular preacher of the day. The interior of the chapel was vast and of a convenient oblong form. It was lofty and beautifully fitted up. On three sides were large and roomy galleries, amphitheatrically arranged with pews. The magnificent organ stood in the gallery over the entrance, and at the farther end was the communion table. The pulpit, with its annexed reading desk, stood a little in front of the altar and facing the organ. The pews, both of the galleries and the body of the church, were provided with soft cushions, for this was a proprietary chapel, and there was but slender accommodation for the poor. Indeed, this class occupied plain benches in the aisles, and they were compelled to enter by a small side door, so that they might not mingle with the crowd of elegantly dressed ladies and fashionable gentlemen that poured into the chapel through the grand entrance in front. A policeman maintained order at the side door, which admitted the humbler classes. But two beadles, wearing huge cocked hats and ample blue cloaks, emblazoned with broad gold lace and holding gilt wands in their hands, cleared the way for the wealthy, the great and the proud, who enjoyed the privilege of entrance by means of the front gate. "'This way, my lord. Pray, step this way, my lady,' said the polite beadles in their blandest tones. "'The pew-opener is in attendance, my lord.' My lady, here is the hymn-book which your ladyship commanded me to procure for your ladyship. My lord, take great care of the step. This door, ladies, if you please. Gentlemen, this way, if you would be so condescending. Yes, sir, certainly, sir. The pew opener will find you a seat, sir, immediately, sir. Ladies, this way is less crowded. You will find the left aisle comparatively empty. My lord, straight forward, if your lordship will be so good. Ladies, the pew opener is in attendance. This way, ladies and gentlemen. And at the side door, the policeman might be heard vociferating in somewhat like the following manner. "'Now then, you young woman, where the deuce are you pushing to? "'Want to get a good place, eh? "'What? With such a rag of shawl as that now? "'I'm afeard I can't admit you. "'Now, boy, stand back, or I'll show you the reason why. "'I say, old woman, you ain't wanted here. "'We doesn't take in women with red cloaks.' You'd better go to the dissenting chapel round a corner, you had, and that's good enough for you. Hello, what's this mean? A sweep in his Sunday toggery. Come, come, that's rather too strong, chummy. You toddle off now. Here, young woman, you may come in. You may, cause you're very pretty. That way, my dear. Hello. Here comes a fella without a nose. Oh, no, that won't do at no price. My orders is particular. No one comes here without a nose. Why, you'd frighten all the ladies out of their wits. They already complains of the riff-raff that comes to this here chapel, so we must try and keep it select, uh, just like Gibbs Vestry. <laughs> now then, who's that blackguard a talking so loud there? It's only me as can talk here at this door, cause I'm official, my am. This way, young woman, push the door, my dear. Well, if you ain't married, I'm sure you ought to be. Now then, who's that a guffawing like a rhinoceros? I'll clap a stopper on your mug, I will. Come, come, you go back, old chap. No workhouse livery here. This is the wrong shop for the workhouse people, this is. I can tell you. Well, you're a genteel couple, I don't think. Come into a propriety chapel without no gloves and fists as black as tinkers. Stand back there, boys, and let that young girl with the yellow ribbons come up. She's decent, she is. Yes, my dear, you may go in, my dear. Now then, 
stand back. No more comes in this morning. The organ's begun. With these words, the policeman thrust the poor people violently down the steps, entered the chapel, and closed the door in their faces. The interior was crowded throughout, and it was very evident that curiosity and fashion, more than devotion, had congregated in that chapel the rank, wealth, and beauty that filled the pews below and above. The solemn swell of the organ pealed through the sacred edifice, and then arose the morning hymn, sung by a select corps of choristers, and by twelve youths belonging to the school of a celebrated professor of music for the millions. A venerable clergyman, with hair as white as his own surplus, occupied the reading desk, and in a pew close by the pulpit was the cynosure that attracted all eyes, the Reverend Reginald Tracy. The tall, commanding form of this clergyman would have rendered him conspicuous amongst the congregation had no other circumstance tended to endow him with popularity. His countenance was eminently handsome. His high and open forehead was set off, but not shaded, by dark brown hair which curled naturally. His hazel eyes beamed with the fire of brilliant intellect. The Roman nose, small mouth, and well-turned chin formed a profile at once pleasing and commanding, and his large, well-curled whiskers, meeting beneath his chin, confirmed the manly beauty of that proud and imposing countenance. There was a proud but totally unassuming sense of the solemnity of the scene and of the sanctity of his profession in his manner and deportment. His voice did not join in the hymn, but his mind evidently followed the words as he, from time to time, glanced at the book which he held in his hand. Doubtless he was well aware, but nothing in his demeanour seemed to indicate this consciousness that he was the centre of all attraction. Though not servilely meek or hypocritically austere, he was still surrounded by a halo of religious fervour which commanded the most profound respect and towards him were turned hundreds of bright eyes, and the glances of the fair maids dwelt upon his countenance rather than on their books. The hymn ceased, and the service proceeded. At length the anthem succeeding the communion service filled the chapel with its solemn echoes, accompanied by the pealing of the magnificent organ. Then a simultaneous sensation pervaded the entire congregation and all eyes were directed towards the Reverend Reginald Tracy, who was now ascending the steps to the pulpit. The anthem was ended, the congregation resumed their seats, and the preacher commenced. It is not, however, our intention to treat our readers to a sermon. Suffice it to say that the eloquence and manner of the discourse which the Reverend Reginald Tracy delivered upon this occasion were well calculated to sustain his high reputation. But of the attentive audience, no individual seemed to be more deeply impressed with his sermon than Lady Cecilia Harborough, who sat in a pew near the pulpit, next indeed to the one which the clergyman himself had occupied during the former part of the service. She was alone, for on the previous day she had hired that pew for her own especial use. Whenever the eyes of the preacher were turned in the direction where she sat, she appeared to be wiping away tears from her cheeks, for the sermon was on a solemn and pathetic subject. More than once she fancied that he observed her, and her heart beat triumphantly in her bosom. When the sermon was concluded, she remained in her pew and allowed the rest of the congregation to leave the chapel ere she moved from her seat. At length the sacred edifice was deserted, save by herself and two or three officials connected with the establishment. In a few minutes the pew-opener, an elderly matron-like person, accosted her and said, If you please, ma'am, the doors will be closed almost directly. Could you oblige me with a glass of water? faltered Lady Cecilia. I feel as if I were about to faint. "'Oh, certainly, ma'am,' answered the pew-opener, and she hurried to the vestry. Presently she returned, accompanied by the Reverend Reginald Tracy himself. "'Is the lady very unwell?' inquired the clergyman of the pew-opener, as they advanced together toward Lady Cecilia's seat. "'She seems very languid, quite overcome, sir,' was the answer. "'But this is the pew.' The clergyman stepped forward and instantly recognised the fair indisposed. 
"'Lady Harborough!' he exclaimed. "'Is your ladyship unwell?' And taking the tumbler of water from the pew-opener, he handed it to the baron's wife. "'It is nothing. The heat, I suppose,' murmured Lady Cecilia, and she drank a portion of the water. "'Thank you, Mr. Tracy, for your attention. I, I, I feel much better now. "'Will your ladyship step into the vestry and sit down for a few minutes?' inquired the clergyman, really concerned at the presumed indisposition of the lady. "'If it would not be indiscreet, I should esteem it a favour," answered Cecilia, still speaking in a tremulous and faltering tone. Reginald Tracy instantly proffered his arm to the lady and conducted her to the vestry, where the venerable clergyman who had read the service was calmly discussing a glass of sherry. "'I am ashamed, perfectly ashamed, to give you all this trouble, Mr. Tracy,' said Cecilia, as she accepted the chair which was offered her. "'But the heat of the chapel, and, to tell the truth, the emotions which your beautiful discourse aroused within me, quite overcame me.' "'The chapel was, indeed, very much crowded,' answered Reginald Tracy, touched by the homage rendered to his talents, in the second case which the Lady Cecilia alleged for her indisposition. "'Nevertheless, this little incident will not in future prevent me from becoming one of the most regular of your congregation,' observed Cecilia with a smile. Mr. Tracy bowed and smiled also. Both had brilliant teeth, and it was impossible for either to fail to notice this beautiful feature in each other. "'I feel quite recovered now,' said Cecilia, after a short pause, "'and will return home. I offer you my best thanks for this kind attention on your parts. Do not mention it, Lady Harborough, but I cannot permit you to return alone, after this indisposition. Allow me to conduct you as far as your door.' I could not think of taking you out of your way. It happens that I have a call to make at Tavistock Square, and am actually going that way, interrupted Reginald Tracy. Lady Cecilia, like a well-bred person as she was, offered no further objection, but accepted the clergyman's escort to her own abode. During the short walk she rendered herself as agreeable as possible, though purposely conversing upon topics suitable to the Sabbath and to the profession of her companion. She also introduced one or two delicate and apparently unsophisticated allusions to the eloquence which had produced so deep an impression upon a crowded congregation, and the profound attention with which the sermon was received. She artfully, but with admirable assumed sincerity, questioned Mr. Tracy upon two or three passages in that discourse, and suffered him to perceive that not one word of it had been lost upon her. Mr. Reginald Tracy was mortal like any other human being, and was not exempt from any of the weaknesses of that mortality. It was impossible for him not to experience a partial sentiment of pride and satisfaction at the impression which his eloquence had evidently made upon a young and beautiful woman, and that feeling became in the least degree more tender by the fact that this young and beautiful woman was leaning upon his arm. Then how could he feel otherwise than flattered when, with her witching eyes turned upwards towards his countenance, she questioned him so meekly and so sincerely, as he thought, upon the very passages of his sermon which he himself considered to be the best, and which he had studied to render the most effective? He was flattered. He smiled and endeavoured to render himself agreeable to so charming a woman. At length they reached the door of Lady Harborough's abode. The siren invited him to walk in, as a matter of course, but Mr. Tracy was compelled to forgo that pleasure. He was really engaged elsewhere, or there is no saying but that he might have stepped in only for a few minutes. Lady Cecilia extended her hand to him at parting, and held his for just two or three minutes, while she renewed her thanks for his attention. The action was perfectly natural, and yet the gentle contact of that delicate hand produced upon Reginald Tracy a sensation which he had never before experienced. It seemed to impart a glow of warmth and pleasure to his entire frame. At length they separated, and as the rector of St. David's pursued his walk, he found his mind, from time to time, wandering away from more serious reflections and reverting to the half-hour in which he had passed so agreeably in the society of Lady Harborough. End of section 62
Section 63 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 1, Part 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Wills. Blandishments. Lady Cecilia took very great care not to appear at chapel that evening. She was well aware that common politeness, if no other motive, would induce the Reverend Reginald Tracy to call on the following day to inquire after her health. Accordingly, on the Monday, she took more than usual pain with her toilet. Sir Rupert Harborough had departed with his splendid friend, Chichester, for the continent, and she was completely her own mistress. She had no one to interfere with her plans or pursuits, for her lady's maid was entirely devoted to her interests. However, others suffered or waited in respect to pecuniary matters. Sarah, the aforesaid lady's maid or camariste, was always well and regularly paid. It was by no means an uninteresting scene to behold the attention and zeal with which Sarah seconded her mistress's determination to make the most of her charms upon the present occasion. Lady Cecilia was seated near her toilette table with a little gilt-edged oval-shaped mirror in her hands, which reposed in her lap, and Sarah was engaged in arranging the really beautiful hair of her mistress. "'What o'clock is it, Sarah?' inquired Lady Cecilia, casting a complacent glance at herself in the large looking-glass upon her toilette table. "'Must be nearly one, my lady,' was the reply. "'Then you have no time to lose, Sarah.' The ringlets are quite divine. Pray take equal pains with the back hair. Do you think that I look better in ringlets or in bands? In ringlets, my lady. And if I had my hair in bands and asked you the same question, you would reply, in bands. Your ladyship cannot think that I am so insincere, said the Camerist. Do you fancy me in this dress, Sarah? asked the lady, heedless of her domestic's observation. "'I prefer the blue-watered silk,' was the answer. "'Then why did you not recommend it in the first instance? "'Your ladyship never required my advice. "'True. Have you finished? "'No hairdresser from Bond Street or the Burlington Arcade "'could have performed this task better, my lady,' replied Sarah. "'Yes, it is very well, very well indeed,' says Cecilia, "'surveying herself in the mirror. "'I will now descend to the drawing-room.' When she reached that apartment, the artful woman spread on the table a few books on serious subjects. She then amused herself with a volume of a new novel. The clock had just struck two when a double knock was heard at the front door. Lady Cecilia thrust the novel under the cushion of the sofa and took up Sturm's reflections. The Reverend Mr. Tracy was announced. Lady Cecilia rose and received him with a charming languor of manner. I have called to satisfy myself that your ladyship has recovered from the indisposition of yesterday, said the rector. Not altogether, answered Cecilia. Indeed, after I returned home yesterday, I experienced a relapse. I observed that you were not at chapel in the evening, and I feared that such might be the case. It was with difficulty that Lady Cecilia could suppress a smile of joy and triumph as this ingenuous and unsophisticated announcement met her ears. He had thought of her. He had noticed her absence. I can assure you that nothing save indisposition could have induced me to remain away from a place where one gathers so much matter for useful and serious meditation, answered the lady. And yet the world generally forgets the doctrines which are enunciated from the pulpit an hour after their delivery, observed Reginald. Yes, when they are doled forth by ministers who have neither talent nor eloquence to make a profound impression, said Cecilia, artfully conveying a compliment without appearing to mean one at the moment. I believe that our churches would be much better frequented were the clergy less dogmatic, less obscure, and did they address themselves more to the hearts of their hearers than they do. I believe it is necessary to appeal to the heart and not be satisfied with merely reaching the ears, said the rector modestly. And whenever the pastor possesses the rare talent of moving the feelings, of exciting the mind to salutary reflection, as well as merely expounding points of doctrine, thither will the multitude flock high and low, rich and poor. Oh! 
exclaimed Cecilia, as if carried away by the enthusiasm of the subject. How grand, how noble a situation does that man occupy, who, by the magic of his voice and the power of his mind, can collect the thousands around his pulpit. I can understand how an impression may be easily made upon the half-educated or totally ignorant classes of society, but to cast a spell upon the intelligent, the well-informed, and the erudite, to congregate the aristocracy of the realm, to listen to the words that flow from his mouth, oh, great indeed must be the influence of such a man. You consider, then, uh, Lady Cecilia, that the upper classes need powerful inducements to attend the truths of religion? said Reginald, irresistibly charmed by the bewitching eloquence that had marked the language of the beautiful woman in whose society he found himself. I consider, but if I tell you my thoughts, said Cecilia, suddenly checking herself, I shall unavoidably pay up high compliment to you, and that neither let me hear your ladyship's sentiments in any case, said the clergyman, fearful of losing those honeyed words which produced upon him an impression such as he had never experienced in his life before. I believe, continued Cecilia, that the upper classes in this country are very irreligious. I, I do not say that they are infidels, no, they all cherish a profound conviction of the truth of the gospel. But their mode of life, their indolent and luxurious habits, militate against the due regard to religious ceremonials. How is it, then, that they are aroused from their apathy? They hear of some great preacher, and curiosity, in the first instance, prompts them to visit the place of his ministry. They go almost as if they would repair to see a new play. But when they listen to his words, when they drink, in spite of themselves, large draughts of the fervour which animates him, when he appeals to their hearts, then they begin to perceive that there is something more in religion than an observance of a cold ceremonial, and they go home to reflect. You believe that to be the case, said the rector, delighted at this description of an influence and an effect which he could not do otherwise than know to be associated with his own ministry. I feel convinced that such is the fact, answered Lady Cecilia. Then, lowering her tone in a mysterious manner, and leaning towards him, she added, Many of my friends have confessed that such has been the case in respect to their attendance at your chapel, and such was the case with myself. With you, Lady Cecilia, exclaimed the clergyman, vainly endeavouring to conceal the triumph which he had experienced at this announcement. "'Yes, with me,' continued the artful woman. "'For, to be candid with you, Mr. Tracy, "'I need consolation of some kind, "'and the solace of religion is the most natural and the most effective.' "'My domestic life,' she proceeded in a deeply pathetic tone, "'is far from a happy one. "'Sir Rupert thinks more of his own pleasure than he does of his wife. "'He does more than neglect me. "'He abandons me for weeks and weeks together.' She put her handkerchief to her eyes. Mr. Tracy drew his chair closer to the sofa on which she was seated. It was only a mechanical movement on his part, the movement of one who draws nearer as the conversation becomes more confidential. "'But why should I intrude my sorrows upon you?' suddenly exclaimed Cecilia. "'And yet, if it be not to the ministers of religion to whom we poor creatures must unburden our woes, where else can we seek for consolation?' "'From what other source can we hope to receive lessons of resignation and patience?' "'True,' said the rector, "'and that has often appeared to me the best and redeeming feature in the Roman Catholic world, "'where the individual places reliance upon a priest and looks to him for spiritual support and aid. "'Ah, would that our creed permitted us the same privilege,' said Lady Cecilia, with great apparent enthusiasm. I know of no rule nor law which forbids the exercise of such a privilege, said Reginald, unless, indeed, usage and custom be predominant, and will admit of no exceptions. For my part, I despise such customs and usages when they tend to the exclusion of those delightful outpourings of confidence which the individual pants to breathe into the ears of the pastor in whom implicit faith can be placed. In how many cases could the good clergyman advise his parishioners to the maintenance of their domestic comfort? 
How many heart-burnings in families would not such a minister be enabled to soothe? Oh, sir, I feel that your eloquence could teach me how to bear, unrepiningly and even cheerfully, all the sorrows of my own domestic hearth. Then look upon me as a friend, my dear Lady Cecilia, said the clergyman, drawing his chair a little closer still. Look upon me as a friend, and happy indeed shall I be if my humble agency or advice can contribute to smooth the path of life for even only one individual. Mr. Tracy, I accept your preferred friendship. I accept it as sincerely as it is offered, exclaimed Lady Cecilia, and she extended her hand towards him. He took it, it was soft and warm, and gently pressed his. He returned the pressure. Was it not the token, the pledge of friendship? He thought so, and he meant no harm. But again did the contact of that soft and warm hand awake within his breast a flame till then unknown, and his cheeks flushed, and his eyes met those of the fair, the fascinating creature who craved his friendship. Henceforth, said Cecilia, who now saw her intrigue was progressing towards a complete triumph even more rapidly than she had ever anticipated. Henceforth, you will have no votary more constant in attendance than I. But on your part, you must occasionally spare from your valuable time a single half hour wherein to impart to me the consolations I so much require. "'Be not afraid, Lady Cecilia,' said the rector, who now felt himself attracted towards that woman by a spell of irresistible influence. "'I shall not forget that you have ingenuously and frankly sought my spiritual aid, and I should be false to the holy cause which I have embarked were I to withhold it. "'I thank you deeply, sincerely thank you,' exclaimed Cecilia. But judge for yourself whether I do not seek solace in my domestic afflictions from the proper source. This is the book which I was reading when you called. Cecilia took up Sturm's reflections and opened the book at random. There, she said, it was this page I was perusing. She held the book in her hands as she reclined rather than sat upon the sofa, and the clergyman was compelled to lean over her to obtain a glimpse of the page to which she pointed. His hair touched hers. She did not move her head. Their faces were close to each other, but not an impure thought entered his soul. Still, he was again excited by that thrilling sensation which came over him whenever he touched her. She affected not to perceive that their hair commingled, but pointed to the page and expiated upon its contents. In a moment of abstraction for which he could not account, and against the influence of which he was not proof, Reginald Tracy's eyes wandered from the book to the form which reclined beneath his glance, as it were, upon the sofa. That glance swept the well-proportioned undulations of the slight but charming figure which was voluptuously stretched upon the cushions. Suddenly Cecilia left off speaking and turned her eyes upward to his countenance. Their glances met, and Reginald did not immediately avert his head. There was something in the depths of those blue orbs which fascinated him. Still he suspected not his extreme danger, and when he rose to depart it was simply because he felt like a man flushed with wine and who requires air. He took his leave, and Cecilia reminded him that she should expect to see him soon again. <laughs> Can there be doubt as to his answer? When he regarded his watch on reaching the street, he was astounded to perceive that two hours had slipped away since he entered the house, and a deep flush suddenly overspread his countenance as he beheld the viper-like eyes of a hideous old hag who was standing near the steps of the front door, fixed upon him with a leer which for an instant struck a chill to his heart by its ominous and yet dim significance. End of section 63 Section 64 of The Mysteries of London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Dave Wills. Temptation. It will come again on Wednesday, said Lady Cecilia to herself, as she heard the front door close behind the Reverend Reginald Tracy. 
This wily woman was well acquainted with the human heart. She had discovered the weak side of the rector of St. David's. She assailed him by means of his vulnerable point. She directed her way to his heart through the avenue of his vanity. Yes, Reginald Tracy was vain, as vain as a man who was admired and sought after by all classes was likely to be rendered, as vain as a spoilt child of the public could be. His life had, moreover, been so pure, so chaste, so ascetic, that the fierce passions which agitate other men were unknown to him, and as all mortals must be characterized by some failing, his was a habit of self-admiration. Venial and insignificant was this foible, so long as no advantage was taken of it by designing or worldly-minded persons. But even our lightest defects, as well as our most pleasant vices, may be made the means of our ruin. Vanity is a noxious weed, which, when nurtured by the dews of flattery, spreads its poisonous roots throughout the fertile soil of the heart, and each root springs up into a plant more venomous, more rank, more baleful than its predecessor. The life of Reginald Tracy had been singularly pure. He had even passed through the ordeal of a college career without affixing the least stain on the chastity of his soul. Yet, with all his austerity of virtue, he was characterized by no austerity of manner. He mixed freely in society, and hesitated not to frequent the ballroom, although he did not dance. He could be a pleasant companion. At the same time, he never uttered a word upon which she had to retrospect with regret. When amongst men, no obscene jest nor ribald allusion was vented in his presence, and yet he was never voted a bore. In a word, he was one of those men who possess the rare talent of maintaining a character for every virtue, and of being held up as a pattern and an example without creating a single enemy, without even being compelled to encounter the irony of the libertine and without producing a feeling of restraint or embarrassment in the society which he frequented. Such was Reginald Tracy, and it was this man who, at the age of thirty-six, could look back with complacency upon a spotless life, a life unsullied by a single fault, an existence devoid of the slightest dereliction from moral propriety. It was this good, this holy, this saint-like man whom the daring Cecilia undertook to subdue. Reginald, Reginald, the day of thy temptation has now come. Thou standest upon a pinnacle of the temple. The tempter is by thy side. Take good heed of thyself, Reginald Tracy. He will come again on Wednesday, had said Lady Cecilia. The prediction was fulfilled. The morning had been so inclement that no one would have stirred abroad unless actuated by important motives. The rain had fallen in torrents, beating violently against the windows and inundating the streets. It had, however, ceased at noon, but the sky remained covered with black clouds. And at three o'clock on that gloomy winter day it was dark and sombre as if night were at hand. But, in spite of that inauspicious weather, the Reverend Reginald Tracy knocked at Lady Cecilia Harborough's door at the hour which we have just mentioned. The designing creature received the clergyman with a smile, exclaiming at the same time, "'It is indeed kind of you to visit me on such a day as this. I have been so happy, so resigned, so possessed with the most complete mental tranquillity since you manifested sympathy and interest in my behalf.' that your presence appears to be that of a good angel. It is our duty to sustain those who droop and console those who suffer, answered the rector. Delightful task, ejaculated Cecilia. What a pure and holy satisfaction must you enjoy when you reflect upon the amount of comfort which your lessons impart to the world-wearied and sinking spirit. Believe me, many a one has entered the gates of your chapel with a weight upon his soul, almost too heavy for him to bear, and has issued forth carrying his burden of care lightly, if not cheerfully along. Do you really imagine that my humble agency can produce such good results in the cause of heaven? asked Reginald, fixing a glance of mingled tenderness and satisfaction upon the charming countenance of Cecilia. I do, I do, she answered with apparent enthusiasm. 
I can judge by the effect which your admirable discourse of last Sunday morning produced upon myself. For let me not deceive you, she continued, hanging down her head and speaking in a tremulous and tender voice. Let me not deceive you. It was not the heat of the chapel which overcame me. It was your eloquence. I dared not confess this to you at first, but now, now, that I can look upon you as a friend, I need have no secret from you. She took his hand as she uttered these words, and pressed it in a manner which he conceived to be indicative of grateful fervour, and without a thought of evil, but with an indefinable sensation of pleasure, to which, until lately, he had been all his life a stranger, he returned that pressure. Lady Cecilia did not withdraw her hand, but allowed it to linger in his, and he retained it under the influence of that sensation which caused his veins to flow with liquid fire. He was sitting on the sofa by her side, and his eyes wandered from her countenance over the outlines of her form. "'Oh, how can the man who accompanied you to the altar and there swore to love and cherish you,' he exclaimed, in an evolution of impassioned feelings such as he had never known before, "'how can that man find it in his heart to neglect, to abandon you, you who are evidently all gentleness, amiability, and candour? He has no heart, no soul for any one save himself, answered Cecilia. And now tell me, relieve my mind from a most painful suspense upon one point. Am I criminal in the eyes of heaven, because I have ceased to love one whom I vowed to love, but whose conduct has quenched all the affection that I once experienced for him? You must not harden your heart against him, said Reginald. But by your resignation, your uncomplaining patience, your meekness, and your constant devotion to his interest, you must seek to bring him back to the paths of duty and love. I might as well essay to teach the hyena gratitude, answered Cecilia. You speak too bitterly, rejoined the rector of St. David's, and yet he was not altogether displeased at the aversion which Lady Cecilia's language manifested towards her husband. Alas! We have no power over volition, said she, and that doctrine is a severe one which enjoins us to kiss the hand that strikes us. True, observed Reginald, I know not how it is, but I feel that I am at this moment unaccountably deficient in argument to meet your objections, and yet he paused, for he felt embarrassed, but he knew not why. Oh, you can appreciate the difficulty of enjoining a love towards one who merits hatred, exclaimed Cecilia, now skilfully availing herself of the crisis to which she had so artfully conducted the conversation. You say that you are deficient in reasoning to enforce the alleged necessity of maintaining, cherishing, and nourishing respect and veneration for a husband who has forfeited all claims to such feelings on the part of his injured wife. At all events, do not tell me that I am a criminal in ceasing to love one who oppresses me. Do not say that I offend heaven by ceasing to kiss the hand that rudely repulses all my overtures of affection. Oh, tell me not that. You will make me very, very miserable indeed. Lady Cecilia's bosom was convulsed with sobs as she uttered these words in a rapid and impassioned manner, and as she ceased speaking her head fell upon Reginald's shoulder. "'Compose yourself, compose yourself, Lady Cecilia!' exclaimed the clergyman, alarmed by this evolution of grief, the sincerity of which he could not for one moment suspect. "'Do not give way to sorrow. Remember the lessons of resignation and patience which you have heard from my lips. Remember!' But the lady sobbed as if her heart would break. Her head reclined upon his shoulder. Her forehead touched his face. Her hand was still clasped in his. "'Oh, Reginald, Reginald,' she murmured, "'I cannot love my husband more. "'No, it is impossible.' "'You love another?' ejaculated the rector, "'his whole frame trembling "'with an ineffable feeling of mingled joy and suspense. "'Yes, and now reproach, revile me, leave me, spurn me, "'treat me with contempt,' continued Cecilia. "'Do all this if you will, "'but never, never can you prevent me from idolizing.' adoring you. Cecilia, cried Reginald Tracy, starting from his seat, you know not what you're saying. 
"'Alas, I know but too well the feelings which my words express,' returned the lady, clasping her hands together and sobbing violently. "'Hear me for a few minutes, and then leave me to the misery of my fate, a hopeless love and a breaking heart.' "'Speak, then, and unburden your mind to me without reserve,' said Reginald, resuming his seat upon the sofa, and inviting a confidence, the thought of which produced in his mind emotions of bliss and burning joy, the power of which was irresistible. "'Yes, I will speak, even though I render myself contemptible in your sight,' continued Cecilia, wiping her eyes and affecting to resume that calmness which she had never lost, more than the impassioned actress on the stage, when acting out some melodramatic part. "'For months and months past I have cherished for you a feeling, the true nature of which has only revealed itself to me within the last few days. In the first instance I admired your character and your talents. I respected you, and respect and admiration soon ripened into another feeling. You do not know the heart of a woman, but it is ever moved by a contemplation of the sublime characteristics of remarkable men like you. I met you in society, and I almost worshipped the ground on which you trod. I listened to your conversation. Not a word was lost to me. During long and sleepless nights your image was ever present in my mind. You became an idol that I adored. At length you yourself, one evening, innocently and unconsciously, fanned the flame that was engendered in my heart. You told me that I looked well. That passing compliment rendered me your devoted slave. I thought that no human happiness could be greater than that of pleasing you. I resolved to attend your chapel from that period. I obtained the pew that was nearest to the pulpit, and when you preached I was electrified. Oh, you saw how I was overcome. Your attention to me on that occasion threw additional chains around me. Then you called me on the day before yesterday, and you spoke so kindly that I was every moment on the point of falling at your feet and exclaiming, Forgive me, for I know now that I love you. You proffered me your friendship. How joyously I accepted that sacred gift and that friendship. Oh, let me not forfeit it now, for the love which my heart cherishes for you shall be as pure and taintless as that friendship with which you have blessed me. Reginald had listened to this strange confession with the most profound attention, yes, and with the deepest interest. A young and beautiful woman had avowed her love for him. His hand still thrilled with the pressure of hers. His cheek was still warm and flushed with the contact of her white and polished forehead. The room was enveloped in obscurity and silence. She had insinuated herself in an incredibly short space of time into his heart by flattering his vanity and exciting those desires which had hitherto slumbered so profoundly in his breast, but which were now ready to burst forth with the violence of the long pent-up volcano. He trembled. He hesitated. At one moment he was inclined to rush from the house as if from the presence of the tempter, and then he remembered that the love which she had avowed was as pure as his friendship. Nevertheless, the struggle in his mind was terrific. Cecilia understood it all. "'You hate me! You despise me!' she suddenly exclaimed, covering her face with her hands. "'Oh, do not crush me with your contempt! Do not abandon me to the conviction of your abhorrence! Reginald, take pity upon me! Forgive me for loving you! Forgive me! On my knees I implore you!' She threw herself before him. She took his hand and pressed it to her lips. She covered it with kisses. Cecilia, murmured the rector, making a faint effort to withdraw his hand. No, no, you shall not leave me thus, she exclaimed with apparent wildness. I should die if you went away without telling me that you forgive me. No, you must not leave me thus. Rise, Cecilia, rise in the name of heaven, rise, exclaimed Reginald, alarmed lest they should be discovered in that equivocal position. Rise, and I will forgive you. I will do all that you desire. I will not leave you until you are composed, and you will return to see me again. You will not withdraw your friendship. 
demanded Cecilia in a soft and melting tone. No, never, never, cried Reginald enthusiastically, as if he suddenly abandoned himself to the torrent of passion which now swept through his soul. Oh, thank you, thank you for that assurance, exclaimed Cecilia, and as if yielding to an unconquerable burst of feeling, she threw herself into his arms. You shall be as a brother to me, and our friendship, our love, shall be eternal. Her rich red mouth was pressed upon the rector's lips. Her arms were wound around him, and for a moment he yielded to the intoxicating delight of that pleasure so new to him. But ere he was entirely culpable, his guardian angel struck his soul with a sudden remorse, and disengaging himself from the siren's arms, he imprinted one long, burning, delicious kiss upon her lips, then murmuring, "'Tomorrow, tomorrow, dearest Cecilia, I will see thee again,' and rushed from the room. "'He is mine!' exclaimed the lady, as the door closed behind him. "'Irrevocably mine!' End of section 64section 65 of the mysteries of london volume 1 part 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dave wills the fall reginald tracy returned to his own abode his breast agitated with a variety of conflicting feelings he pushed his old housekeeper who announced to him that dinner was ready rudely aside and hurried up to his own chamber there he threw himself upon his knees and endeavoured to pray to be released from temptation, for he now comprehended all the dangers which beset him, although he suspected not the perfidy and artifice of the tempter. But not a word of supplication could he utter from the mouth which still burned with the thrilling kisses of the beautiful Cecilia. He rose from his knees and paced the room wildly at one moment vowing never to see that siren more, at another longing to rush back to her arms. The animal passions of that man were strong by nature and threatened to be insatiable whenever let loose, but they had slumbered from his birth beneath the lethargic influences of high principle and asceticism, for moreover they had never been tempted until the present time and now that temptation came so suddenly and in so sweet a guise came with such irresistible blandishments, came, in a word, so accompanied with all that could flatter his vanity and minister unto his pride that he knew not how to resist its influence. And at one moment that man of unblemished character and lofty principle fell upon his knees, grovelling, as it were, at the footstool of him who he served, anxious, yearning to pray for courage to escape from the peril that awaited him and yet unable to breathe a syllable of prayer. Then he walked in a wild and excited manner, up and down, murmuring the name of Cecilia, pondering upon her charms, plunging into voluptuous reveries and dreams of vaguely comprehended bliss, until his desires became of that fiery, hot and unruly nature which triumphed over all other considerations. It was an interesting and yet an awful spectacle to behold that man who could look back over a life of spotless and unblemished purity, now engaged in a terrific warfare with the demons of passion that were raging to cast off their chains, and were struggling furiously for dominion over the proud being who had hitherto held them in silence and in bondage. But those demons had acquired strength during their long repose, and now that the day of rebellion had arrived, they maintained an avenging and desperate conflict with him who had long been their master. They were like a people goaded to desperation by the atrocities of a bloodthirsty tyrant. They fought a battle in which there was to be no quarter, but wherein one side or the other must succumb. Hour after hour passed, and still he sustained the conflict with the new feelings which had been excited within him, and which were rapidly crushing all the better sentiments of his soul. At length he retired to bed, a prey to a mental uneasiness which amounted to a torture. His sleep was agitated and filled with visions by no means calculated to calm the fever of his blood. 
he awoke in the morning excited, unsettled, and with a desperate longing after pleasures which were as yet vague and undefined to him. But still a sense of the awful danger which menaced him stole into his mind from time to time, and he shuddered as if he were about to commit a crime. He left the table where the morning's meal was untasted and repaired to his study, but his books had no longer any charm for him. He could not settle his mind to read or write. He went out and rambled in all directions, reckless whither he went, but anxious to throw off the spell which had fallen upon him. Vain was this attempt. The air was piercing and cold, but his brow was burning. He felt that his cheeks were flushed, and his eyes seemed to shoot forth fire. "'My God, what is the matter with me?' he exclaimed in his anguish as he entered Hyde Park, the comparative loneliness of which at that season he thought calculated to soothe his troubled thoughts. "'I have tried to pray, and last night, for the first time in my life, I sought my pillow, unable to implore the blessings of my Maker. Oh, what spell has overtaken me? What influence is upon me? Cecilia, Cecilia, is it indeed thou that has thus changed me? He went on, now musing upon all that had passed within the few preceding days, now breaking forth into wild and passionate exclamations. He left the park and walked rapidly through the streets of the West End. No, he said within himself, I will never see her more. I will conquer these horrible feelings. I will triumph over the mad desires, the fiery cravings which have converted the heaven of my heart into a raging hell. Oh, why is she so beautiful? Why did she say that she loved me? Was it to disturb me in my peaceful career, to wean me away from my God? No, no. She yielded to an impulse which she could not control. She loves me. She loves me. She loves me. There was a species of insanity in his manner, as he thus addressed himself, not speaking with the lips, but with the heart, unheard by those who passed him by, but with a voice which vibrated like thunder in his own ears. Yes, she loves me, he continued. But I must fly from her, I must avoid her, as if she were a venomous serpent. I dare not trust myself again in her presence, and not for worlds, not for worlds, would I be with her alone once more. No, I must forget her, I must tear her image from my heart, I must trample it underfoot. He paused as he spoke, he stood still, for he was exhausted. But how was it that the demon of mischief had, with an undercurrent of irresistible influence, carried him on, in spite of the forceful flow of the above reflections, to the very goal of destruction? He was in Tavistock Square. He was at the door of Lady Cecilia Harborough's house. And now, for one minute, a terrific conflict again raged within him. It seemed as if he collected all his remaining courage to struggle with the demons in his heart. But he was weak with the protracted contest, and they were more powerful than ever. I will see her once more, he said, yielding to the influence of his passions. I will tell her that I stand upon an abyss. I will implore her to have mercy upon me and permit me to retreat ere yet it be too late. His good angel held him faintly back. But his passions goaded him on. He obeyed the latter impulse. He rushed up the steps and knocked at the door. Even now I might retreat, he said to himself. There is still time. I will, I will. He turned and was already halfway down the steps when the door was opened. His good resolutions vanished, and he entered the house. In a few moments more he was in the presence of Lady Cecilia. Lady Cecilia looking more bewitching, more captivating than ever. She had expected him, and had resolved that this visit on his part should crown her triumph. It was in a small parlour adjoining her own boudoir that she received him. The luxurious sofa was placed near the cheerful fire. The heavy curtains were drawn over the windows in such a manner as to darken the room. Cecilia was attired in a black silk dress, that she had purposely chosen to enhance the transparent brilliancy of her complexion, and to display the dazzling whiteness of a bust, which, though of small proportions, was of perfect contour. 
she was reclining languidly upon the cushions which were piled at one end of the sofa, and her little feet peeped from beneath the skirts of her dress. She did not rise when Reginald entered the room, but invited him to take a seat near her upon the sofa. So bewitchingly beautiful did she appear, as the strong glare of the fire played upon her countenance amidst the semi-obscurity of the room that he could not resist the signal. He accordingly sat down by her side. "'Your visit to-day,' said Cecilia, "'proves to me that you have forgiven the indiscreet confession into which I was yesterday led in a moment of weakness. "'I am come as a friend, as a true and sincere friend,' returned Reginald, with considerable emphasis upon the last word. "'But I know not whether my occupations, my duties, in a word, will permit me to visit you again for some time.' "'Oh, do not deprive me of the pleasure of your society from time to time,' interrupted Cecilia, divining all that was passing in the rector's soul, and well aware by the tremulous tone in which he spoke that his good resolutions were but unequal opponents to the fury of his newly awakened pleasures. "'Listen, Lady Cecilia,' answered Reginald, "'and I will tell you frankly the real motives which must compel me to forego the pleasure of your society in future.' "'I tremble for myself.' "'You tremble for yourself?' repeated Cecilia, with ill-concealed joy. "'Do you think me, then, so very formidable?' "'Formidable? Oh, no!' ejaculated Reginald, darting an impassioned glance upon his ravishing companion. "'But I consider that you are very beautiful, too beautiful for me, too beautiful for me thus to seek your presence with impunity.' "'Then would you sever that bond of friendship which you yourself propose so generously, so kindly?' asked Lady Cecilia, placing her hand upon that of the rector, and approaching her countenance towards his, as if to read the answer in his eyes. "'It must be so, it must be so for my peace of mind, Cecilia,' cried Reginald, thrilled by that electric touch, and receiving into his own soul no small portion of that same voluptuousness which animated the fair patrician at that moment. "'It must be so. Oh, cruel resolve!' said Cecilia, pressing his hand between both of hers. "'But let me not advance my selfish feelings as a barrier to your interest. Oh, no, Reginald, I would sacrifice everything to give you pleasure. You shall go. You shall leave me, but you will sometimes think of me. You will occasionally devote a thought to her who has dared to love you. Dare to love me? exclaimed the rector. And what if I... But, but no, it is madness. Speak. Tell me what you are about to say, murmured Cecilia in a melting tone. I was on the point of asking you what you would think, um, what opinion you would form of me, if I were to confess I also dared to love you. I should reply that such happiness never could descend upon me, said Cecilia. And yet it is true, it is true. I cannot conceal it from myself, exclaimed Reginald, giving way to the influence of his emotions. It is true that I love you. Oh, I am indeed so blessed, faltered Cecilia. Tell me once more that you love me. Love you, cried the rector, unable to wrestle longer with his mad desire. I worship, I adore you, I will die for you. He caught her in his arms and covered her with burning and impassioned kisses. Oh, Reginald, and hast thou at length fallen? Have a few short days suffice to undo and render as naught the purity of the chastity of years? Where was thy guardian angel in that hour? Whither had fled that proud virtue which raised thee so high above thy fellow men, and which gave to thine eloquence the galvanic effect of the most sublime truth? Look back! Look back with bitterness and sorrow upon the brilliant career through which thou hast run up to this hour, and curse the madness that prompted thee to darken so bright a destiny. For thou hast plucked thine own crown of integrity from thy brow, and hast trampled it underfoot. Henceforth in thine own heart wilt thou know thyself as an hypocrite and a deceiver. It was half past eleven o'clock when Reginald Tracy issued from the abode of Lady Cecilia Harborough. The night was dark, 
but from time to time the moon shone for a short interval as the clouds were swept away from its face. Reginald paused for a moment upon the steps of the door and gazed upwards. The tempestuous aspect of the heavens alarmed him, and a superstitious dread crept like a death shudder over his entire frame, for it seemed to him as if the mansion of the Almighty had put on its sable garb in mourning for a soul that was lost unto the blessings of eternity. Deeply imbued as he was with a sense of the grand truths of the gospel, this sudden and awful idea speedily assumed so dread a shape in his mind that he felt alarmed, as if a tremendous gulf were about to open beneath his feet. He hurried on, hoping to outstrip his thoughts. But that idea pursued him, haunted him, every moment increasing in terrific solemnity, until it wore the appearance of a mighty truth instead of a phantom of the imagination. Again he looked upwards, and the dense, sombre clouds which rolled rapidly like huge black billows over each other imparted fresh terrors to his guilty soul. Then his feverish and excited imagination began to invest those clouds with fantastic shapes, and he traced in the midst of the heavens a mighty black hand, the forefinger of which pointed menacingly downward. The more he gazed, the more palpable to his mind that apparition became. Half sinking with terror, oppressed with an outstanding, a crushing consciousness of his adulterous guilt, the wretched man went wildly on, reckless of the way which he pursued, and every minute casting horror-stricken glances up to the colossal black hand which seemed suspended over his head. Suddenly a deafening peal of thunder burst above him. He looked frantically up. The hand appeared to wave in a convulsive manner. Then the clouds parted, rolling pell-mell over each other, and the terrifying sign was broken into a hundred moving masses. Never did erring mortal so acutely feel his guilt as Reginald Tracy on this fearful night. The storm burst forth, and he ran madly on, without aim, a prey to the most appalling reflections. It was not of this world that he now thought. It was not on its reproaches, its blame, or its punishment that his mental looks were fixed, but it was of eternity that he was afraid. He trembled when he thought of that Maker, whose praise he had so lately sung with pride and hope and joy, and whose name he dared not now invoke. Oh, his punishment had already begun. Weak, wearied, subdued, drenched with the rain that had accompanied the storm, and in a state of mind bordering upon madness and despair, the wretched man reached his home at four o'clock in the morning. But whither had he wandered, and which way had he taken? Whether he had continued running on, or had rested once or often during that terrific night, he never remembered. He retired to bed and slept during several hours. When he awoke, the sun was shining gloriously through his casement, but the horrors and the congenial reflections of darkness had left too fearful an impression upon his mind to be readily effaced, for he was not so inured to vice as to treat with levity the events of the last night, events which to his superstitious imagination had assumed the aspect of celestial warning and divine menace. End of section 65